Welcome to Clarksdale. Located on the traditional lands of the Choctaw and Quapaw Nations, on the banks of the great father of waters, the mighty Mississippi. Welcome to a place known as the crossroads of the Mississippi Delta, where so much history and culture walk hand in hand. The story goes that famed blues musician Robert Johnson sold his soul at the point where Highway 61 and 49 meet to become the legendary blues musician we remember today. And whether myth or history, or a little bit of both, Clarksdale's place in history and what it represents today is truly unique. It's the crossroads for the story of American music, where so many great musicians passed through, like W.C. Handy, Muddy Waters, Son Thomas, John Lee Hooker, Sam Cooke, Ike Turner, and countless others like Elvis Presley and Conway Twitty on their road to fame and glory. The story is still being told today through the Delta Blues Museum, Clarksdale Tourism, and the various venues and juke joints in our area that have banded together to offer live music every night of the week, every day of the year. It's the crossroads for the story of American theater and literature, where famous playwright Tennessee Williams spent foundational years and turned the people and places he saw as a child into some of his most recognized characters and plays. It's the crossroads for the story of American history and the fight for social justice and the American dream available to all, where everyday struggles strengthened everyday people like Aaron Henry and Vera Piggy to organize and stand up for dignity, respect, and equal rights in the great American civil rights movement. The mighty Mississippi River flows nearby, and the long horizon can prove a unique experience to first-time visitors, a land so wide and level that, as Tennessee Williams described it, the seasons could walk across it for a breast. Each year, the community of Clarksdale hosts visitors from around the world who come to our area to experience the good food, great music, and rich history. It's a can't-miss cultural spot for those wanting to explore the story of America. There's an event or festival almost every month of the year, and a community of Delta Ambassadors excited to welcome you here to experience Clarksdale, the crossroads of the Mississippi Delta. My name is Val Mitch Towner, and as president of Oklahoma Community College, I welcome you to the 29th annual Mississippi Delta Tennessee Williams Festival in Clarksdale, Mississippi. Oklahoma Community College has been a key sponsor of this festival since 1993 with support from the Mississippi Arts Commission, the Mississippi Humanities Council, Visit Mississippi, and the Oklahoma County Tourism Commission, Visit Clarksdale. We also depend a great deal on community leaders, volunteers, and supporters just like you to make this festival happen. Over the years, our festival has been honored with documentaries by the BBC and European Public Television, a stamp unveiling by the United States Postal Service, a Mississippi Humanities Council Partner Award, and in 2019, a Mississippi Writers Trail marker honoring Tennessee Williams that was placed at our very own Couture Mansion. It's been a wonderful journey with so many wonderful people involved. In fact, the 2021 Mississippi Delta Tennessee Williams Festival is dedicated to the longtime supporter and festival participant, the late Dr. Ralph Voss. For years, Dr. Voss served the festival in a variety of roles, including academic advisor, panelist, and scholar in 2011 as a keynote speaker for the Williams Centennial Celebration in Clarksdale on March 26. We were so sad to hear of his passing in July of 2021, and we pay a special tribute to his memory with this festival. In our ongoing commitment to both community safety and community access, we have a hybrid plan in place to accommodate these challenging times. 
We are offering an in-person festival that will be held outside the Portrayal Mansion. We request that folks try to socially distance and wear masks when in close contact with others. And at the same time, we'll be offering a fully produced professional online stream in hopes of accommodating as many people as safely as possible. This year's festival includes presentations from scholars from around the country, live performances, a screening of the 1951 Academy Award winning film, A Streetcar Named Desire, starring Marlon Brando and Vivian Lee, and a picnic on the Grand Lawn of the Criteria Mansion, as well as the ever popular student drama competition, which will be fully virtual this year. Porch plays and an after party for in-person guests at the world-famous Uncle Henry's Place on beautiful Moon Lake in Coahoma County. You can find us online on our YouTube streaming platform, and you can visit our website for updates at deltawilliamsfestival.com. We all know that this has been another challenging year, but with love and support from so many people and our unique partnership with the University of Toledo, we intend to bring you another wonderful literary evening. So welcome and enjoy. Hello and welcome to the Mississippi Delta Tennessee Williams Festival. Now I know this online experience is different than what we hoped. We had some equipment issues early on in the festival. But our commitment was to bring as high quality programming for those of you who are visiting us from the safety of your own homes. So over the past few days we've shot everything that's happened here in Clarksdale so you can participate where you are now. Now you'll be able to see uh, below the YouTube link where there are chapters. You can hit on those chapters and go right to the program in the same way if you had a schedule and were attending here at the Couture Mage. Again, we can't wait to visit uh, all together again here at next year's 30th annual Mississippi Delta Tennessee Williams Festival. And we hope that you'll visit Clarksdale soon and enjoy this year's festival. Stay safe, be well, and we hope to see you soon. Good evening, my name is Dr. Matt Foss and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Clarksdale, Mississippi and this year's Mississippi Delta Tennessee Williams Festival. Now many of you at home were probably planning on tuning into the stream at four o'clock and we sincerely apologize. Like most things over the past two years, things have not gone accordingly uh, to plan. We ran into some equipment problems, so we are here uh, at the beautiful Couture Mansion shooting this like a movie, and we'll be editing it about 15 minutes or so before you are getting there at home. This year's plan was to create a hybrid festival, to create as high quality of an in-person event and high quality of a stream as possible, while making sure that everyone could be safe. It is our hope uh, that wherever you are, whether you're here socially distanced, wearing masks, enjoying the outdoor, outdoors on the wonderful grounds of the mansion, or in the safety of your own homes, uh, you are enjoying the incredible scholars, artists, uh, discussions, and presentations that will be happening over the next two and a half days. It's our sincerest hope that you will come and visit Clarksdale as soon as possible, particularly as things come back to normal. There's no place like it. The Mississippi Delta uh, Tennessee Williams Festival celebrates the culture and history and art of this region using the plays of Tennessee Williams as a lens to look at this wonderful, complicated American place. There's no place like it where the laboratory of American ideas, creativity, history, and the best uh, and most accountable parts of ourselves come together in a crossroads. We are so grateful that you're here. You've heard some wonderful words from the president of Coahoma Community College, Dr. Talmadge, and we have a barbershop quartet led by the musical direction of Dr. Kelvin Towers uh, that are, is going to sing for us before we get into this year's program. Gentlemen. Good evening, everyone. We are the Gahoma Community College Barbershop Quartet. We are going to bring to you two selections, and we hope that you enjoy them. Oh, let the church roll on, my Lord. Let the church roll on, my Lord. Let 
the church roll on, my Lord, and let the church roll on, my Lord, 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 and let the church roll on, my Lord, that's a sister in the church, my Lord, and her skirt's too short, my Lord, tell me what you're gonna do. Take the scissors, clip the hair, and, and let the church roll on, my Lord. 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 That's a deacon in the church, my Lord. And he drinks too much, my Lord. Tell me what you're gonna do. Take the bottle, drink it up, and, and let, let the church, church roll on, my Lord. Let the 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 church roll on, my Lord. There's a preacher in the church, my Lord. And he cuts too much, my Lord. Well, tell me what you're gonna do. Up to you guys. <laughs> Take the Bible, kick him out, and, and let the church roll on, my Lord. 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 And let the church roll on, my Lord. Oh, good news! Good news, chariots are coming. Good news! Good news, chariots are coming. Good news! Good news, chariots are coming, and I don't want it to leave me behind. Good news, good news, chariots are coming, good news, good news, chariots are coming, good news, good news, chariots are coming, and I don't want it to leave me behind. There's a long white robe in the heavens, I know. There's a long white robe in the heavens, I know, and I know, and I know, and I know, I know, and I don't want it to leave me behind. Good news, good news, chariots are coming, good news, good news, chariots are coming, good news, good news, chariots are coming, and I don't want it to leave me behind. There's a starry crown in the heavens, I know. There's a starry crown in the heavens, I know. And I know, and I know, and I know, I know. And I don't want it to leave me behind. Good news, good news, chariots are coming. Good news, good news, chariots are coming. Good news, good news, chariots are coming. And I don't want it to leave me behind. Good news, good news, chariots are coming. So glad, so glad, chariots are coming. Good news, good news, chariots are coming, and I don't want it to leave me behind. And I don't want it to leave me behind. And I don't want it to leave me behind. Thank you, Barbershop Quartet. And again, it's our pleasure to welcome you to Clarksdale. That gives uh, such a rich understanding of the atmosphere of Tennessee Williams' plays, particularly a streetcar named Desire. <laughs> trace the visionary company of love its voice an instant in the wind i know not whither hurled but not for long to hold each desperate choice a streetcar named desire scene one the exterior of a two-story building on a street in new orleans which is named elysian fields and runs between the l and tracks and the roof. The section is poor, but unlike corresponding sections in other American cities, it has a rafish charm. The houses are mostly white frame, 
weathered gray, with a rickety outside stairs and galleries and quaintly ornamented gables. It is first dark of an evening early in May. The sky that shows around the dim white building is a peculiarly tender blue, almost a turquoise, which invests the scene with a kind of lyricism and gracefully attenuates the atmosphere of decay. You can almost feel the warm breath of the brown river beyond the river warehouses with their faint redolences of bananas and coffee. A corresponding air is evoked by the music of Negro entertainers at a bar room around the corner. In this part of New Orleans, you are practically always just around the corner or a few doors down the street from a tinny piano being played with the infatuated fluency of brown fingers. This blue piano expresses the spirit of the life which goes on here. Blanche comes around the corner carrying a valet. She looks at a slip of paper and then at the building, then again at the slip. And that's where we start our festival, with the opening of Streetcar Named Desire. She's carrying a small suitcase in one hand. Her appearance is incongruous to the setting. She looks as if uh, she were arriving at a summer tea or cocktail party in the Garden District. She's about five years older than Sella. What's the matter, honey? Uh, are you lost? They, they told me to take a streetcar named Desire and then transfer to one called Cemeteries, ride six blocks, and get off at Elysian Fields. And that's where you are now. And we are glad that you are joining us here for the Tennessee Williams Mississippi Delta Festival. Throughout the weekend, we have any no, uh, a number of humanitarian, scholarly, and artistic programming we're excited for you to take a part of. Now, you've seen a lot of Clarksdale in the footage we've shared. It's a community that shares more with the fict fictionalized town of Laurel, Mississippi, that Blanche and Stella called their hometown in the play. But throughout the weekend, we'll be using this text, Streetcar Named Desire, as a bridgehead or a lens to look at the culture and history and people of the Mississippi Delta. The Delta stretches, uh, the stretch of river and earth that extends from here all the way to New Orleans, carrying the shared stories, experiences, and histories of a people till they all come together mixing and colliding and sometimes making something new along the way. Now there's a lot of Clarksdale that resembles the neighborhood Williams describes in Streetcar Named Desire, and there's even more connectivity uh, you'll discover as Blanche and Stella talk about their childhood home and lives before they find themselves reunited in New Orleans together. To help us learn more about these connections and the important car context surrounding Clarksdale, Tennessee Williams in this famous play, we'll be right back with the director of the Tennessee Williams Rectory Museum and Williams Scholar and documentarian Karen Kohlhaas. Welcome back. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be speaking loudly so that you can hear me in, in the back and showing you uh, some images on this monitor over here. And I, I wanted to talk about William's uh, Clarksdale roots and how Clarksdale is used a lot in uh, A Streetcar Named Desire. So as uh, a lot of you know, uh, Williams came here as a child. Um, this is about the age that he was uh, when the family came, that was 1917. His grandfather, Reverend Walter E. Dakin, uh, was the rector at St. George's Episcopal Church. And when they first moved here, uh, Tom Williams, little Tom, before he was Tennessee, um, spent first grade here in Clarksdale, but sometime during that year, he became very, very ill with a disease called diphtheria. And uh, according to his mother, he almost died, and she spent nine days nursing him back to health. Shortly after that, the family moved to St. Louis, and it was the first time he ever lived in the same home with his own father. Uh, his father was a traveling salesman. Uh, he was promoted to a desk job in St. Louis, Missouri for the International Shoe Company. So he moved his wife and his young son to St. Louis, and uh, Tennessee's older sister, Rose, stayed behind in Clarksdale here with the Dakins for about a year. 
Um, and then after a couple of years, partly because he was having a difficult adjustment to St. Louis, uh, when he was about this age, about nine years old, he came back down to Clarksdale to live by himself with his grandparents, meaning away from his parents, um, in the rectory that is on Sharkey, where the Tennessee Williams Rectory Museum is now. And he spent all of uh, fourth grade here and went to Oakhurst School. This building, unfortunately, is no longer there. But he went to fourth grade in this building. And that year he was healthier. He got to know the people in the community a lot more than he was when he was younger and was, was very ill. And those stories uh, started to spark his imagination. These are Mr. and Mrs. Dakin. This is about um, how they looked when they arrived here in Clarksdale in 1917. This is St. George's Episcopal Church. Uh, Mr. Dakin was the rector there for 14 years. It was his longest uh, time serving at a church. And then the Dakins retired. Um, the community here loved them so much that they actually tried to give them a house and try to get them to stay in Clarksdale. But the depression had started and the Dakins had a rental uh, investment property in Memphis, Tennessee. So they moved up there to live in that house because they were having trouble uh, renting the house out. So they did not stay in Clarksdale. This is the rectory next door to the church. This is the house that they lived in and you can visit the rectory uh, museum on the upper floor of this building uh, this weekend. You can check the schedule. And um, after that year in Clarksdale, Williams visited um, until he about, was about ready to start college. He would visit the Dakins every summer. So he not only picked up on people and places and stories in that year that he was in fourth grade, he continued to visit and the Dakins were beloved members of the community. So he got to know basically the congregation of St. George's Church um, very well as he grew up. Um, he wrote The Glass Menagerie, I'm jumping to 1945, he wrote The Glass Menagerie after several failures and after he had been writing for 20 years because he started when he was about 12 years old and The Glass Menagerie, he was in his early 30s when The Glass Menagerie changed American theater permanently. Um, he, he, there was a wonderful quotation by Arthur Miller. The glass menagerie in one stroke lifted lyricism to its highest level in our theater's history. And seemingly overnight, but really after the product of about 20 years writing, Williams became the most celebrated playwright in America. Um, he followed that up with A Streetcar Named Desire and he wrote an essay called The Catastrophe of Success, which describes what he went through at, from going from obscurity to incredible celebrity. And I'm gonna read just a little bit from it to you. The sort of life that I had had previous to this popular success was one that required endurance a life of clawing and scratching along a, sh a sheer surface and holding on tight with raw fingers to every inch of rock higher than the one caught hold of before. But it was a good life because it was the sort of life for which the human organism is created. I was not aware of how much vital energy had gone into this struggle until the struggle was removed. I was out on a level plateau with my arms still thrashing and my lungs still grabbing at air that no longer resisted. This was security at last. I got so sick of hearing people say I loved your play that I could not say thank you anymore. I choked on the words and turned rudely away from the usually sincere person. I no longer felt any pride in the play itself but began to dislike it probably because I felt too lifeless inside to ever create another. I was walking around dead in my shoes, and I knew it, but there were no friends I knew or trusted sufficiently at that time to take them aside and tell them what was the matter. 
And after that, he talks about um, having an eye operation. He had chronic um, cataracts and issues with his eyes. And um, so he, he describes that. And then he says, when the gauze mask was removed, I found myself in a readjusted world. I checked out of the handsome suite at the first class hotel, packed my papers and a few incidental belongings and left for Mexico an elemental country where you can quickly forget the false dignities and conceits imposed by success, a country where vagrants innocent as children curl up to sleep on the pavements, and human voices, especially when their language is not familiar to the ear, are soft as birds. My public self, that artifice of mirrors, did not exist here, and so my natural being was resumed. I settled for a while at Chapala to work on a play called The Poker Night, which later became A Streetcar Named Desire. So he went, he went back to a, play, a place of obscurity so that he could once again find his creativity. And this is a photograph from around that time of, of Chapala in Mexico. So he finished the play and, and because of his success with A Streetcar Named Desire, he could pretty much name his director. And he had seen Kazan's production of Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman. And he knew that that's who had to direct his play, direct Streetcar. And he approached Kazan, or his, uh, actually his producer approached Kazan, his producer and his agent uh, approached Kazan. And Kazan initially said no. Uh, which would have changed theater history. And uh, he wrote Kazan just a very appealing letter saying, I don't mean to pressure you. I just want to explain to you what I see in the play and where I'm coming from. And he wrote a, just a beautiful analysis of the play and the humanity of the characters. And he ended that letter uh, with finding a director aside from yourself who can bring this play to life exactly as if it were happening in life is going to be a problem, but that is the kind of direction it has to have. So Kazan said yes uh, after that letter. And the production, uh, no one had ever seen anything like it. And I got to interview for my documentary on Williams, this lady, Roberta Hodes, who I believe is still living in New York. I haven't talked to her for a while. She was Kazan's script uh, supervisor on, on the waterfront and on Baby Doll. And before she started working with Kazan, because this is about eight or nine years before Baby Doll, uh, she saw the original production of A Streetcar Named Desire. And she said that when Brando walked on the stage, the audience gasped. They had never seen a man move like that on the stage. He was like an animal, he was like a cat. And the audience just could, could not believe it. And then the play itself was so in, w intense. She said it was just the most unforgettable thing that she'd ever seen in her life. And Jessica Tandy played Blanche. And that's, that's one of my favorite photographs from that production. And here is the original cast uh, bowing on opening night. And this man, who started his life in this house, John Couture Smith, also saw that production. He called up Mr. Dakin, who had baptized him and who had performed his parents' wedding, and asked if he could get him a ticket to streetcar. And through Tennessee's agent, Mr. Dakin arranged it. You, you could not get a ticket to the play. So that was basically the only way, is to go through the grandfather. And he said, when I interviewed him, that when he saw it, he could barely crawl out of the theater. He just, it just devastated him. And he wasn't even talking about the fact that his mother and his aunt were the namesakes of two of the main characters. He was talking about the play itself. He just, he just was devastated by it. And this is, this is Jack Smith um, in front of this house about, 80 or 90 years ago, 90 years ago, about. 
And here is Tennessee Williams on the set of Streetcar. So Streetcar obviously is set in New Orleans, which became a second home for Williams. But all of the references to Blanche and Stella's upbringing are from here. He calls the town Laurel, and there is a Laurel, Mississippi, but it's not in the Delta. I think he just liked the name. Um, he's got lots of local references, as you'll, as you'll see, which identify the town as Clarksdale. And uh, this is an exchange between Eunice, the neighbor, and Blanche when she arrives. You're from, you're from Mississippi, huh? Yes. So who was Blanche? John Clark is the founder of Clarksdale. And he came up uh, to Clarksdale in the 1830s. He had um, the family, the Clark family, had gone from England to Nova Scotia to Philadelphia. And his father was an architect. And he won a bid to uh, uh, either build or rebuild, Jane, you would know, the US Post Office in, um, in New Orleans and took John down with him. John Clark was a, a teenager. Uh, they both got yellow fever. The father died of the yellow fever. And so John Clark was a teenager, an English teenager, wandering around New Orleans for a while. And he fell in with some men who were, had a lumber business. And he would work the river. And he had the advantage of being immune to the yellow fever because he survived it. And he would come up to Clarksdale, uh, or to the Delta area. They would cut the timber and, and bring the logs down to New Orleans. And he, made, he built up a lot of money doing that. Um, he, he, at a certain point, um, the Native Americans in this area, and, and a lot of northern Mississippi actually, were forced out on the Trail of Tears marches to Oklahoma. And then the land became available. And he bought a parcel of land, which is downtown Clarksdale, and he built a home on this property, which has been moved over there, but the original home was on this property. He bought slaves, and he planted cotton. And his family were, uh, grew up here. And about the time of the Civil War, his eldest daughter, Blanche, was born. And Blanche was the only daughter. There were several Clark sons, but she was the only daughter. And this is Blanche uh, later on. This is the Blanche that Tennessee Williams would have met. She was older, okay? And sort of the, the scoop of my documentary is that it was not this Blanche who was uh, Blanche Dubois in Streetcar was named after. Um, the, it was, one second, her daughter. Her daughter, Blanche. Um, there's a, a misunderstanding that this Blanche's name was really Anne, and, and that is not, not true. Her name was Blanche. So uh, the elder Blanche married John, uh, John Wesley Coutre. They had a house over on uh, East 2nd Street, where the city auditorium is now. And then in 1915, 1916 or so, they built this house which was the showplace of the town. Um, here are the Coutreres um, on a trip to Europe. I don't know who the man in the, in the hat is, in the, in the stovepipe hat, but the, the four over here are J.W. and Blanche, the elder, and then their two children, two of their four children, John Coutreres and Blanche Coutreres. And it was this Blanche um, she was the only member of the family who attended St. George's Episcopal Church. For some reason, all the Coutreres went to different churches. Uh, there she is in uh, Mr. Dakin's parish register. And her wedding, which took place right at this house, was performed, the ceremony was performed by Mr. Dakin. And there is his notation of the wedding in his, in his parish register. Stella, here's Blanche and Stella running through the streets of New Orleans uh, in a still from the movie. Stella was Blanche's sister-in-law. 
She was married to Blanche's brother John. Um, the family stories say that they were headed for a divorce probably and around that time John drowned in Moon Lake and that drowning is mentioned in the Glass Menagerie. Um, and Williams appears to have been very influenced by the Couture family. There are little stories and motifs just all over uh, the Delta plays and the short plays and short stories um, that, that if you know about the family, you kind of go, oh, that sounds a lot like John, okay? Um, but these are the plays where he mentions the family by name. In Spring Storm, which is a very early Williams play uh, that he wrote in college, the florist who delivers a big bouquet of roses is called Coutreres. So he used the name as the florists. In the Glass Menagerie, right after Amanda mentions uh, one of her suitors drowning in Moon Lake, uh, she says there were the Coutreres brothers, Wesley and Bates. And um, in, in obviously in A Streetcar Named Desire, we have Blanche and Stella. And then in Orpheus Descending, there, the Couture family comes back, and in that play, there are David Couture and Carol Couture. Uh, so Belle Reeve is the name of the family home in A Streetcar Named Desire, where Blanche and Stella grew up. And this house was called Belvoir uh, by the Couture family. So it's beautiful dream or beautiful view. And this is, this is actually, this is a house uh, in Natchez, but this is the type of house that they describe in A Streetcar Named Desire. They describe as sort of a typical plantation house with, with lots of columns, and Stanley says to Stella, I tore you down off of those columns, and that, you know, that's what you wanted. I'm totally paraphrasing, but he, that's what he says, something like that. And, um, but in reality, this house looked nothing like that. It was an anomaly in the Delta. There's, there, there's nothing looks like this. It was very unique. It's, it's basically an Italian Renaissance mansion. And my guess is that Williams just didn't want to explain all that in the play. So he, he made it a, you know, more, something that we are more used to imagining when we think of you know, a plantation house. And here's the house today. And then another feature that, that lets us know that all of these plays are set in Clarksdale or refer heavily to Clarksdale in the case of Streetcar and Glass Menagerie is the presence of Moon Lake. Moon Lake is about 20 minutes north of here. And it is a moon shaped, it's like a crescent moon shaped oxbow lake, which means that it was a bend in the Mississippi River at one point that got cut off and turned into a lake. And in Streetcar, Blanche painfully tells the story to Mitch, who she hopes to marry, of being married at a very young age to a very poetic young man and, and loving him very, very much, but walking in on him and another man. And afterwards, the three of us drove out to Moon Lake Casino, very drunk and laughing all the way. And they danced. They danced at Moon Lake Casino. And if you have ever been to Uncle Henry's, you would, uh, when the dance floor was still there, they've taken it out, sadly. But um, it was very small. And I gave a talk um, about this at a, at a university. And a theater student came up to me afterwards. And I'd shown a picture of the dance floor. And she said, I'm, I'm working on that speech, and I was imagining a casino. I was imagining like what we think of as a casino, like a huge place. And now I'm realizing that that moment where she confronted her husband was very public. Everyone would have seen it because it's such a small place. And, and I said, yeah, it's, it's tiny. There's a quote attributed to Tennessee Williams that goes, home is where you hang your childhood. And Mississippi, to me, is the beauty spot so. of creation. The spot Williams might be referring to is the Delta in general, and Clarksdale in particular. 
It is a place with a people and a history that permeate so much of the playwright's work. The names in the cemetery read almost like the list of characters in a playbill, and the porches and homes and buildings look like his stage descriptions come to life as you drive the streets of Clarksdale. And there may be no place that William so frequents in his plays than Moon Lake Casino. If you head north out of town, and we recommend the scenic route, taking Friars Point Road to Mississippi Highway Number 1 that runs along the river, and look to turn right when you see a cypress-lined shore of a lake, where you'll find yourself on Moon Lake Road, running along the southern edge of an old oxbow lake, and drive east and then a little north till you see a white building with a green historical marker out front. It might have a sign that says Uncle Henry's now, but step out and you can almost hear the dance bands and raucous laughter that live in the memories and descriptions of Amanda Wingfield in Glass Menagerie. You might feel the dangerous and forbidden allure of the place for Alma in Summer and Smoke or the nostalgia for the wine garden Lady Torrance dreams of in Orpheus Descending. Go inside, and you might picture the dance floor where a young Blanche Dubois outs the secret of her husband before he races out to take his life on the shores of the eponymous Moon Lake in a streetcar named Desire. Uncle Henry's is a place you can still visit today, The whole region is a rich experience for any wanting to learn more about the worlds Tennessee Williams created in his plays. You can visit his childhood home at the Tennessee Williams Rectory Museum, or tour the mansion of John Wesley and Blanche Coutrere, a home they called Belvoir, but a name not too far removed from the Blanche and Stella Dubois lost Belle Reeve in Streetcar Named Desire. Like most of Clarksdale, any trip to the area gives a feeling of how fertile a place the Delta was for Williams, providing the setting for some of the greatest plays of the American theater. And visitors and artists and those seeking the same kind of magic and depth of experience find something similar. It is a place where the old and the new collide, giving birth to uniquely American music, theater, and history, all stories you can experience when you come to the Mississippi Delta and visit Clarksdale. Welcome back everyone to Clarksdale and the Mississippi Delta Tennessee Williams Festival. Now this morning we are very excited to introduce our keynote address today, Dr. Kenneth Polich. Kenneth Holditch is a longtime favorite of the festival. He's one of the original uh, founders, part of a team that made this festival happen 29 years ago. He lives in New Orleans and his expertise is on Southern literature and the life and work of Tennessee Williams. He's the editor of Tennessee Williams Journal and the co-editor, along with Melvin Sal, of the Library of America edition of Williams Writing. Holditch collaborated with Richard Freeman Levitt on Tennessee Williams in the South as well as the book, The World of Tennessee Williams. Like I said, Holditch was one of the three initial consultants who helped Homa Community College establish the Mississippi Delta Tennessee Williams Festival in Clarksdale in 1992, and he's been greatly involved ever since. Holditch created the Tennessee Williams Literary Walking Tours tours in New Orleans, and he knew the playwright personally. He was also instrumental in helping found the Tennessee Williams Festival in New Orleans and the Tennessee Williams Tribute Festival in Columbus. Dr. Holditch was born in Mississippi, but has made his home in the Crescent City for his professional life. He is a favorite, and we are so grateful uh, for you enjoying his comments and insights on the work of Tennessee Williams and Streetcar Named Desire. We start recording. All right. Now I, I have- start. I'll, yeah, I'll count you in, uh, Dr. Holditch, and you'll be ready to go. So I'm going to do a three, two, and then you just hear a silent one in your head. I won't say one, so I'll go three, two, there'll be a silent one, and you'll start when you're ready. All right. Great. Thanks so much again for doing this, and, and your keynote address is such a highlight, and we're so grateful for it. All right, here we go. Three, two. 
I have spoken so many times about streetcar named desire that I, I'm sure I'm going to be repeating myself in some areas. So you'll have to forgive me for that. I was thinking this morning as I was thinking about uh, some extra added details that of, of good productions of streetcar that I have seen. Unfortunately, I did not see the original. Uh, wasn't quite old enough for that. Uh, with Jessica Tandy and Marlon Brando, but I did get to be uh, good friends with with Kim Hunter, who played Stella in the original, and who uh, was also in the movie, and she was uh, a remarkable and wonderful woman, and I learned a great deal from visiting with her. Uh, there have been, I, I recall, two productions of Streetcar in Clarksdale, one with Irma DeRico's company that she brought down from, from uh, New York. And it was performed in one of those old theaters in, in uh, Clarksdale that I think has since been condemned probably. It was in very bad shape, but uh, it, was, uh, it was a very good production. The best production of Streetcar I ever saw um, was First of all, at the University of North Carolina, Michael Wilson was, was a, a artistic director there. He graduated there. And it, it starred Annalee Jeffries, who is, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest, the greatest Blanche Dubois who ever lived. I saw that production five times. First of all, at the University of North Carolina, when I saw it the first time, I was so overcome that I had to go out into the woods near that theater and recover before I could go back to the party. And I certainly didn't want to miss the party, of course, but I, I did get back in time uh, to, to, for the party and to tell Anna Lee how wonderful she was. Then Michael went on to be artistic director at, at the Alley Theater in Houston, and he staged it there and Annalee performed it there as well and was just equally good. And then Michael went uh, to uh, the Hartford stage in Hartford, Connecticut as artistic director. And Annalee once again performed it. And I cannot tell you how wonderful she was. I've seen her in other productions. She was always a great, great actress. Those are pleasant memories I just, had to share with you. Um, a streetcar named Desire, I'm speaking to you, of course, from New Orleans, but speaking to you as it were in Clarksdale. And these are the two places that are connected by a streetcar named Desire. I think a streetcar named Desire, and I, I'm going to go out on a limb with this and, because nobody can, nobody can, can attacked me for saying this at this point, but I think Streetcar Named Desire is probably America's great drama, greatest single drama. We're always talking about the great American novel. I think this is the great American drama and the great American tragedy, as it were. Aristotle def defines a tragedy uh, as of necessity, the the protagonist uh, is a strong, important figure who brings his or her own doom down upon himself or herself. And that's what happens to, to Blanche. Uh, Blanche is a very weak woman in many ways, but she's also very strong. She's in, she endures and she's the classical, uh, Southern tragedian, if you will. And uh, her fault is, as I see it, and this is my interpretation, she says, there is only one unforgivable sin, she says, and that is deliberate kindness, uh, deliberate kindness, deliver deliberate cruelty to other people as a, a sin of which I've never been guilty, she says. Well, of course she has been because 
she admits later that she has that when she discovered that her her young husband back in in uh, Mississippi at Moon Lake, she confronts him with the fact she's discovered that he is he is gay, and she says, "You disgust me." And then he goes out on the banks of of uh, of Moon Lake and commits suicide. So she brings this down upon herself. This makes her, I think, the classic uh, tragic heroine. The Delta and New Orleans, as I say, are brought together in this in this uh, drama. Uh, it was Tennessee's good luck to be born in Mississippi. I mean, if, if you want to be a writer, where else would it be better to be born uh, since New Mississippi seems to have produced more good writers than any other state I can think of, except for Massachusetts. I'll have to give them, them that. But when you think of all the great writers who've come from Mississippi, and I won't, I won't uh, list them, but uh, why, I don't know. There are several different reasons for for the fact that Mississippi has been so fecund in producing great writers, but I don't uh, intend to get into that discussion at this point. Then when he was uh, in his early adult years, Tennessee came to New Orleans and that was quite by accident. He chose to come here uh, not so much accident, I guess, but he, he could have gone to some other place like uh, Philadelphia or, or Dubuque, Iowa. And instead he came to New Orleans looking for a job. And with the WPA writers uh, program, it was during the Roosevelt administration and Roosevelt had set up the WPA Work Projects, Work Progress uh, Administration. And there was a branch of it for artists and a branch of it for writers. And Tennessee wanted to get a job, came to New Orleans and discovered that, that the, the two volumes that were being written here were already finished and completed. And consequently, uh, he, he couldn't get a, a job here, but he, and he didn't stay a long time that first time, but he came back for the rest of his life. He was in and out of here. Uh, he said that New Orleans was, uh, if I can be said to have a home, it's the old French Quarter, he said, where I wrote uh, more than half of my best work. And it was, he also said his, spiritual home. Uh, he drew his, he drew 90% of his material from the Mississippi Delta uh, and from New Orleans. These two were the sources of his, uh, of his great work and of some of his lesser work as, as well. Um, a streetcar along with uh, Glass Menagerie those two are so important in the history of American drama because uh, he changed the whole direction of playwriting in the United States. Um, up until that time in the 30s and 40s, uh, the New Orleans, I mean, the American drama was primarily dominated by social protest writing, proletariat uh, playwrights, Clifford Odets and Elmer Rice. Elmer Rice's street scene is a prime example of that. And Tennessee had indulged in that kind of, uh, of protest play. When he was in college, one of their assignments was to write what was called a newspaper play. And that was to find a story in the newspaper that involved social protest and write about it. Tennessee 
uh, read about a, a, a prison riot elsewhere in the United States where uh, the prisoners had been punished uh, in a hot box uh, and had and several of them had had actually suffocated because of the heat they were subjected to. And he wrote the play called Not About Nightingales, which is a social protest. It was not produced in his lifetime. Uh, the, the, red, the Redgraves, uh, uh, Corin Redgrave and Vanessa Redgrave uh, found, uh, read the play and decided it should be produced. And it was first produced uh, at the Alley Theater in, uh, uh, in Houston and then went on to Broadway. And it's quite a remarkable play because even though Tennessee started writing in that protest form, he soon got beyond that. It, it, the title of the play is not about nightingales, but indeed it was about nightingales. What's the significance of nightingales? Uh, let me, as a footnote, add here that the nightingale represented for Tennessee the ideal world. And that was what Keats says in his Ode to a Nightingale. Uh, he talks about the nightingale as being representing the ideal world, the spiritual world, as opposed to the gross physical world in which we mostly dwell. And Keats writes, away, away, for I will fly with thee uh, away to this, to this other world. Uh, and the protagonist in Not About Nightingale refers to Keats's poem, Ode to a Nightingale, specifically. And Ode to a Nightingale is one of the, the most magnificent documents of that split between the real and the ideal world. Now that, that kind of dichotomy occurs in literature everywhere, not just in the South and not just in New Orleans, but, uh, but wherever. And Tennessee was certainly not the only one to, to, uh, to write about that. It was, we find it over and over again. And Tennessee was able to introduce that dichotomy into American drama at that time. And so he broke away from that strictly proletariat uh, political novel, a political type of drama that was being written at the time. And he introduced this dichotomy into uh, American drama. American drama was young at the time, because in the 19th century, there's hardly any native American drama of any note. It was only in the 20s, 1920s, that there began to be a good bit of significant drama. And then Clifford Odets and, and Elmer Rice and others, and, and then Tennessee adapted it. So what Tennessee brought to this was not just the struggle between the real and the ideal, but also poetry, because the language of those proletariat plays is very conversational and, uh, and very political. And Tennessee writes much more uh, floridly and beautifully, lyrically. I mean, it's as though he's writing a poem almost. Uh, it sounds like, uh, prose. It sounds like the way people talk, but it's very poetic, very lyrical. Uh, as you know, Tennessee is, is immensely quotable. I used to have an argument with one of my colleagues at the University of New Orleans, uh, who always said that uh, Tennessee's, she didn't like Tennessee Williams. She was she was from uh, Wisconsin and she thought that, uh, she said uh, that uh, several other American playwrights were better than he 
better than Tennessee. And I would often tell her to quote a line from, from those poets. And I mean, from those playwrights. And she found it hard, herself hard pressed to do that. Whereas with Tennessee, there are people all over this country quoting Tennessee Williams and they don't know who they're quoting. For example, I, more the most obvious one, I have always depended on the kindness of strangers. But his poetry is in every aspect of the play, even in the stage directions. For example, in, uh, in The Glass Menagerie, he says about Amanda, uh, the, the woman in the play, the mother living in, in uh, Blue Mat, living in, in uh, St. Louis, but remembering her childhood in Blue Mountain, Mississippi, which is one of Tennessee's names for Clarksdale. And uh, she, she is talking about how wonderful her childhood was. Often the dichotomy between the real and the ideal in Tennessee comes with the, the ideal was childhood. The real was what we face in our adult life, which is often much less pleasant than childhood or at least childhood as we remember it. Tennessee said once, uh, uh, home is where you hang your, your uh, childhood. And I, he, of course, for him, uh, Clarksdale was, was home. That was where he had hung his, his uh, childhood. But even in describing in, in the, um, stage directions in describing uh, Amanda Wingfield, he says, she is not paranoid, but her life is paranoia. I always told my students when I was teaching the Tennessee Williams Seminar, which was my favorite uh, course when I was in, still before I retired from from the University of New Orleans, uh, that they must always read the, the stage directions because they are often just as poetic and sometimes even more so than the language of the, of the characters. But all of that is what makes Tennessee's drama different. And it's his break with those plays that went before that make um, Glass Menagerie and Streetcar so significant. Streetcar even more, I think, than The Glass Menagerie. The Glass Menagerie is probably performed more now, I think because it's considered appropriate for schools, they, they perform that, whereas uh, a, a, a a junior high school production of Streetcar Named Desire would hardly be appropriate, one would assume. <laughs> uh, the early versions of Streetcar, I wanted to mention briefly, Dan Isaacs, who was one of the scholars that I brought to Clarksdale for one of the early Tennessee Williams festivals there, Dan had discovered uh, several early versions of Streetcar and he produced, put together an early, early scenes that had since been abandoned by Tennessee. And I want to say that I know these have frequently been performed in various places around the country. I just wanted to say, to put my, in my two cents worth and say, that I think it's a mistake to perform uh, early drafts of uh, work by writers, be they novelists or short story writers or playwrights, because what they have abandoned, what writers call foul papers, which are the early versions of this, uh, those are not the works that they want us to see. 
and we deserve, they deserve from us that we pay attention to the finished product and not to some earlier uh, version that they have, that they've abandoned. The characters of the play uh, are remarkable. Tennessee has, has added to, uh, to American literature a whole bevy of characters who are memorable. Blanche, Stella, Stanley. Uh, his, his specialty in playwrights, playwriting about characters, I would say is with the female character. Uh, he, he had a special feeling for, I think because of his, the fact that he was brought up in a household with his mother and his grandmother in Clarksdale when they lived in the rectory there. And that the women shaped his character to such an extent. And he was in rebellion against his father uh, who got something of a bum, bum rap, but nevertheless, uh, we have to acknowledge that CC, Cornelius Coffin Williams, Tennessee's father, uh, was a heavy drinker, a gambler, a womanizer. And uh, so Tennessee's penchant for writing about female characters may come from there. He says himself that, that, uh, that he had two elements in his, his character, the feminine and the masculine, and that uh, he thought the feminine had come forth in his writing. I think that's probably true of almost all writers, that one or the other of those elements, and I think all human beings have parts of those elements, of, of the part, uh, parts of those, or some of those elements in their character makeup. Um, Blanche is certainly probably, probably his best known character. Uh, the question comes up at this point, and I'm simply moving from one point to another as I go along. I hope not too rambling a, a narrative, but Blanche uh, is often uh, credited with having been based on several different people. Tennessee said that some of his, his one of his, his uh, father's sisters contributed to the character of Blanche. And I think that that's certainly true. Uh, there are certainly other women he would have met in, in the French Quarter in New Orleans. He certainly would have met, met various versions of Blanche, though I don't think anybody quite so wonderfully dramatic and poetic in real life as that character is. Um, there are various women who have claimed to be the models for Blanche through the years. And there was a woman uh, living somewhere, I forget where, somewhere in Mississippi, I think, who wrote a novel which she published herself, self-publication. And she claimed that she knew who Blanche was, who the model for Blanche was. And uh, she called me once and said, uh, do you know who the model for Blanche is? And I said, well, I know several people who contributed to it. She said, oh no, the woman who that Tennessee was writing about lived in Laurel, Mississippi in real life. And that simply is not true. I mean, first of all, Tennessee didn't live in Laurel. Uh, he may have visited Laurel on occasion. Uh, Blanche is in the, in the play, she says, 
She's from Laurel. Uh, but why does he choose Laurel? Laurel is not in the Delta. And, and Blanche is clearly from the Delta. Moon Lake is in the play. But Laurel simply was a name that appealed to Tennessee for obvious reasons. The Laurel wreath is the traditional wreath, the poet. Uh, the Laurel uh, is associated with all sorts of literary elements throughout uh, written history. And I think that accounts for, for his choosing that. So we don't need to know who the model for Blanche was. That would be interesting, I think, to meet a real Blanche Dubois. If you will, I've met several ladies uh, through my life who had certain traits of Blanche, as I've said. Then there's Stanley. Stanley was influenced to some degree by, by Tennessee's uh, companion, Pancho Rodriguez. And Tennessee and Pancho lived together in New Orleans for a while. Pancho had been a flamenco dancer with his twin brother. I met his twin brother late in life. I actually, actually met Pancho too much earlier. It was long after he and Tennessee were, had gone their separate ways. Pancho was working at a men's clothing store uh, on Canal Street in New Orleans. And, and I went there with, with uh, Virginia Spencer Carr, who was a friend of Tennessee's and had meant to write a biography of Tennessee and unfortunately didn't get around to it. But she, she took me to, to meet Pancho Rodriguez. And I don't know that, I don't know that Pancho even knew that Stanley was to some degree based on him. Now, a lot of people, one of part of the allegory of Tennessee's play, and it's often pointed out is that Stanley represents the modern uh, industrial world as opposed to the, the romantic uh, world of the history of, of the South, particularly the Deep South. And of course, after the Civil War, there was very little manufacturing going on to, in any major way in the South. And that, that was, came later. And uh, so uh, Stanley represents that modern industrial world and, and what it's done to, to the South. If we, we don't have to consider the play as an allegory, but if we do, Blanche is allegorical of the South. Uh, and what Amanda talks about in, in uh, Glass Menagerie is gone, gone, all vestiges of gracious living, she says. And that whole concept of gone with the wind that's so much a part of, of Southern history. And that wonderful uh, old folk song that Joan Baez, among others, sang, the night they drove old Dixie down. Uh, they, the, the, the loss of, which has a line, why did they have to take the very best? Uh, they could have gotten rid of the worst, but kept the very best. And uh, that is in a sense what, what Stanley represents in the play is that industrial north. Now people say, but this is taking place in the South. Ah, yes, but if you, re if you read the play carefully or, or if you watch it and observe it carefully, Stanley says, up where I come from, one line. So Stanley has come to New Orleans after the Second World War. And that's the reason we find him there. So he does represent the North. And he is, of course, uh, 
the force of violence, uh, which he, he is, he represents the brute world, according to, to Blanche. Uh, the symbolism associated with this allegory is very important. Uh, I mentioned earlier that Tennessee was, was fortunate that having been born in the Delta or having been born in, well, in the hill country actually of Mississippi, but he spent his formative years in the Delta and then having come to New Orleans, which was, those two were in a sense, the most uh, symbolic places. I mean, the, the, they, they produced symbols for us. Moon Lake, uh, who could have thought of such a, a place if Tennessee had not written about it, though it is still there. I mean, it's a real place, Moon Lake. Some people read the play, I know, and assume that, it, that Moon Lake does not exist, but it actually does. And then uh, the flatness uh, of the Delta is a very important symbol. Uh, Tennessee, in one of his poems, says, speaks of the Delta as so, so, uh, so wide and so flat that, that, in, that the four seasons could ride across it, could ride across the Delta for a, a breast. Uh, and it's, it's a very striking image there and symbol. And of course, in New Orleans, we have uh, the streetcar. People are, are surprised to discover, some people are who don't know the city when they discover that there was a streetcar named Desire here. They've reinstated it now. They would never have reinstated it had it not been for Tennessee because Tennessee put it on the, the literary map of, of the world, if you will. And then there is the, the cathedral. Uh, Tennessee, uh, Blanche says at the end of, of Streetcar when they're ready to take her away to, to the mental institution, uh, she asked Eunice from upstairs on Elysian Fields, uh, th those grapes, uh, are they washed? And Eunice has brought the grapes in and Eunice says they're from the French market, honey. And Blanche says that doesn't mean they're washed. Those cathedral bells, they're the only clean things in the quarter. A very wonderful symbol. And it fits beautifully into the, into the play. And when Tennessee, after Tennessee died, we had a memorial service for him in the cathedral uh, in New Orleans. And, and it was in the St. Louis Cathedral. Tennessee used to love to go into St. Louis Cathedral um, and just sit there at off hours, not when mass was going on. He had been, uh, he was reared of course in the Episcopal Church in Mississippi. Um, he, he was, baptized when he was in the mental ward of Barnes Memorial Hospital in St. Louis. His brother Dakin had him baptized into the Roman Catholic Church in Tennessee, always said it didn't take. As he said, we were much higher uh, Episcopal Church than the Roman Catholic Church ever was. A little joke on Tennessee's, Tennessee's part to which uh, a fellow a Southern Episcopalian to Lula Bankhead, when she heard Tennessee make that remark on one occasion said, yes, Tennessee, you and I are the only consistently high Episcopalians that I've never known, that I've ever known. Uh, a wonderful, a wonderful little poem. Then we come to Stella, the third character. Blanche, and then Stanley, and then Stella, the sister, Stella for star. 
she would seem to represent the ideal because her name is means star and she does represent the ideal uh, however she i think is as villainous as anybody in the play uh, even even as villainous in some senses as Stanley, because at the end of the play, she uh, uh, in in the movie, she agrees to to continue to live with Stanley, and she says uh, her comment is uh, she's just had the baby, his baby, and she says uh, that. She allows her sister to be taken out and uh, and and taken to the mental institution because uh, and the sister has been raped by Stanley and they take her to the mental institution because they won't accept the fact that she has been raped and she says Stella says. Uh, she can't go on living with Stanley if she believes that's true. And I think what she does is she makes a the, the commitment to just stay working, stay living with Stanley, uh, even though she knows, she must know in her heart uh, what he has done. Uh, I think that in terms of just briefly, in terms of, of uh, the play as it relates to American literature, there are three major movements in American literature in the, in the 20th and in the 19th and 20th century. There is, uh, a romanticism and realism and naturalism. And romanticism, we've already talked about the real and the ideal. Uh, the romanticism is the uh, romanticism is that acceptance of the the real versus the ideal. Uh, realism is the belief that uh, that you write about the world, uh, write about the world uh, as it is, uh, avoiding that ideal, uh, that notion that there is an ideal world beyond. And then naturalism, which goes a step beyond realism because naturalism argues that it, it was very much influenced by, by uh, uh, Darwin's theory of evolution and the belief that human beings are are shaped by nature, by by their environment and their heredity, and that's what makes people behave in a certain way. It removes God from the issue, and Tennessee was always, uh, despite his his lifestyle, was always he never. He never abandoned the faith of his fathers, as he's careful to point out on several occasions. And so naturalism, uh, and naturalism, the procreation of the race is the primary object of human existence, as opposed to, to romanticism and realism. And that's what happens in the play, Blanche, is the archetypal romantic living so much in the romantic world that she simply is is not able to function very well in the realistic world and at the end of the play naturalism has come to the force because stella has had her baby and uh and there's a wonderful scene uh in the play 
which says that when when uh, Stella realizes that she's she's going into labor, there's this is sort of she seems to lose contact with reality, and that's what uh, moves her into that acknowledgement and and Blanche realizes that the baby, the significance of the baby, she realizes that the baby uh, is, is what's happened, is what's, what their life has moved towards. And that even though she doesn't approve of Stanley and Stella's relationship, that the baby in a sense justifies it. She doesn't say this, she perhaps doesn't even think it, but it is part of the acknowledgement of the play. And uh, so I think we see Tennessee moving in the play, is what I'm trying to say, from romanticism to realism and then to naturalism at the end of the play. Uh, and thus he, that gives it further credence as one of the major documents of American literature. Uh, is it the great American drama? I go back to that question. I like to think it is. I'll leave that to your own discretion. You may not wish to agree with me in that. I certainly have been accused of being uh, rather chauvinistic when it comes to Mrs. Most of my life now in New Orleans, but I've always felt as much as I love this city that I'm sort of down here on a visit and that I really, uh, as Faulkner said in one of his poems, uh, that it, it, the hills of home are drawing him. The hills of North Mississippi where I grew up as opposed to, to the, uh, the Delta. Uh, It is very important, I think, that we we simply re, when we t we take all of these elements of the play and we we uh, enjoy the play. I don't think it's important that we realize that this is an outgrowth of the of uh, romanticism and realism and, and nat naturalism. I don't think we have to realize that at all. My notion about drama is that it's a, it, it should be a great experience. Uh, we've seen the American theater undergo a, a period of somewhat stagnation at this point because of the, of the, the COVID and also the, how expensive it is to produce uh, dramas. Consequently, it seems that most of the plays uh, on Broadway now, or even off Broadway often, are Disney dramas uh, rather than the tragedies and comedies of the old days. Tennessee's plays, of course, are still being performed. Uh, and that's as it should be, uh, but not 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 in recent uh, in recent times on on Broadway so much as as in off Broadway houses and in other parts of the of the country. But he certainly changed the direction of of American literature and American drama. When I first started teaching Tennessee Williams. I had to fight to get the the uh, Tennessee Williams seminar at the University of New Orleans. There were people on the faculty who really English faculty who really felt that he did did not deserve a place in the literature curriculum of the university. That he belonged in the in the drama school. Um, where they studied the way the play is 
is made and the the physical elements of the play as opposed to the beauty of the language. Uh, I think it's very important that we realize that that what's most important about our appreciation of the play, and that's why I urge people to read the plays. Uh, and I don't urge people to read a, a lot of writers' plays, but some of them, obviously. Shakespeare, we have that great tradition of poetic drama. And Tennessee continues that great tradition of poetic drama. And so we have to, we have to follow that. We have to immerse ourselves in the play. And I think that's what Tennessee demands of us. And I think that's what he deserves. This is a man who gave his entire life, his entire adult life to literature when it came to his work. He got up in the mornings, often at five o'clock and wrote until noon or early afternoon before he went around whatever and went around performing whatever other elements of life uh, he had to contend with. But that work had to be done. And he constantly re revised and he produced more than 70 plays in the course of his lifetime. And they keep coming across bits and pieces of plays that he started to write. There's a wonderful story about Gore Vidal visiting with him on one occasion. And he said when he got up in the morning, he went down to Tennessee's study and found Tennessee writing. It was early in the morning. And he said, what are you working on? And Tennessee said, now this was in the 60s. And Tennessee said, I'm revising Streetcar. And this was after Streetcar had already become a major success. So he never, he never felt he was completely through. Uh, some uh, French poet, his name I forget at, the point, at this point, uh, once remarked that a poem is never finished, it's only abandoned. And I think that's the way Tennessee felt about his drama, though he was a very careful workman. One of the advantages Tennessee had with, with uh, Streetcar, as well as several of his other plays, was that he had great direction. And he worked very closely with Elia Kazan, uh, who, who directed both the stage production, original production of Streetcar, as well as the original production of, uh, as, well, as well as the movie, of streetcar and uh, without that direction, the play is never finished. Uh, Tennessee said that when people told him, and I'm guilty of, of this sort of thought and I've just demonstrated it when I said how important it was to read the plays, Tennessee was approached several times by people who told him that they preferred reading to his reading his plays to seeing them perform. And he said, but they don't exist until they've been performed. Because as, gl as glorious and marvelous as the language of streetcar is, the ultimate achievement that he manages to accomplish is for us to see the play on stage. And that's the great effect of it. Aristotle said that, that we, that the purpose of tragedy is to arouse pity and fear in us and to purge us of those emotions. And I think if you've ever seen a great production of one of Tennessee's tragedies, that you know what that means. So I urge you uh, to go and see a production of the play uh, and they're still available around the country. Uh, they won't all be of prime uh, 
They won't all be of prime uh, value. They won't all be perfect by any means. Perhaps no single production ever was, and maybe none will ever be quite as good as that original production with uh, Marlon Brando and and uh, Jessica Tandy uh, in New York in the, in the late 1940s. That must have been a grand evening. I would love to have been there. I would be only one of his major plays that I got to see in its original production was Night of the Iguana. And I saw its opening in Chicago and that's remained my favorite of his plays. But I have to admit, Streetcar is probably his most significant contribution to American literature. And to, to talk about it and to hear about it in the place where, which so much influenced it, the Mississippi Delta, particularly Clarksdale, where you can go to visit the museum and his house and uh, in, in the house the the where the the Dakins, his his grandparents lived, uh, right next to the to the Episcopal Church, and where you can go and hear people talk about these plays, uh, and go to Moon Lake, and and see where Blanche's uh, husband committed suicide on the banks of the Moon Lake. And, and to, to visit the Coutrere mansion, which is uh, the Coutrere family, Tennessee is, as a child traveled around Clarksdale with his grandfather going into the homes of the planters. And he talks about how it, the ceilings of those, those houses to him always seemed so high. And of course, if you go to the to the to the uh, rectory next to the Episcopal Church, you can see what a low ceiling house that is. But I think that the Cutre Mansion certainly had a, a wonderful influence on him. We're so fortunate to have that preserved, and Jen to be. Jen Weller to be uh, running it for us. And they, it came dangerously close to being uh, taken away and not acknowledged. And now, of course, there is a plaque in front of it indicating its, its literary significance, its dramatic significance, its historic significance. But when you're in Clarksdale and when you're in the French Quarter, you can you can feel the presence of Tennessee. I think I'm convinced that his ghost still walks the streets of the French Quarter, and certainly his presence is felt here by those of us who who are fortunate enough to know his work, and especially for those of not those of us fortunate enough to have been born in the same state he was, and to have moved to his spiritual home, which has been my fate. Thank you very much. I was expecting a train to appear out of nowhere, like in that monkey song, but no luck. If Jesus walked along these roads, he carry a six string like a gunslinger, moaning about how his woman done did him wrong, but Robert Johnson did that. Then Eric Clapton came along and co op the sound, if not the feeling of the blues. It reminds me of a story I read once. After a show, Jimmy played like he was possessed by an otherworldly force, finished his gig walked over to Eric and nonchalantly asked him to tune his guitar. <laughs> Before I die, we'll learn to play guitar. I don't know if I'll ever be as good as Jimmy, 
or even air. But if Robert Johnson smiles on me, it's cool. Welcome everyone to this morning's Poetry of Place presentation featuring the work of Dr. Ann Fisher Worth from Old Miss. Uh, this work is a blended humanities performance artistic event that's supported by grant funds from Mississippi Arts Council and Mississippi Humanities, uh, where we're going to be using poetry written uh, by and about the Mississippi Delta, in uh, addition to our discussion of Streetcar Named Desire, to provide a lens on the history, culture, and people of the region. Dr. Ann Fisher Worth will be guiding us through this tour of uh, Delta Poetry and Poetry of Place. Dr. Fisher Worth has published six books of poetry, most recently The Bones of Winter Birds, Mississippi in collaboration with Ma Shiva Clay. Uh, and and uh, Fish Fisher Worth teaches poetry, workshops, and seminars, 20th century American literature, and a wide range of courses in environmental and literature at the University of Mississippi, and also directs the environmental studies minor there. A senior fellow and board member of the Black Earth Institute, she was a 200, uh, 2017 Ann Spencer Poet in Residence at Randolph College in Virginia. <coughs> she has held a senior Fulbright at the University of Freiburg in Switzerland and the Fulbright Distinguished Chair of American Studies in Uppsala, Sw Sw uh, Sweden. She has received numerous awards for her work, which appears in journals online and in anthologies. Uh, she and her husband, Peter Worth, have taught at the University of Mississippi for 30 years. You can find more at her website, annfisherworth.com. And welcome so much to Clark Stokes. We're so grateful to have you here. Four books of poetry, and their titles I think are really good. The 
first one is, oh, you robot saints. <laughs> Sometimes we're all living in a foreign country, the spokes of Venus, and little murders everywhere. That is a great title. <laughs> um, and that was a finalist for the Kate Tufts Poetry Prize. Her poems appear all over the place. She's had many awards, including an award from the Mississippi Arts Commission. And as I said, her poem is Postscript from Mississippi, which will be performed now. When you asked if it rained bees or poison, you were asking the wrong question again. You still didn't understand the difference between hurricanes and flooding, thus between gods and humans, between your slum lordy digs and the shacks I pass that cling to old boards that huddle around each family, the yards marking the care of home. Everywhere I go, something is falling on someone, and I watch like an autumn tourist tripping through the Berkshires. It's okay, keep going. Um, the Berkshires. Um, I, I reach to catch a leaf. I try to straighten a pizza like sapling. The wind wraps around us both like a question mark and leaves me standing, the sole witness on this end. I am telling you about a place of silence. You want it all to be a metaphor. I'm watching a front porch crumble. Still, someone sits there. Well, um, the next one is by me. And my poems in Mississippi don't have titles, so the first line is the title. It's a poem, sort of an homage to the Mississippi River. <clears throat> you may not have these cushions. They are the ones my dying aunt chose for me. You may not have these spoons, though they tarnish in my drawer, or the blankets that I mended. Look at this pretty blue plate with the flowers and the bird. Look at this cast iron skillet. Oh, go ahead, rise up. Smear the boards, soak the house until it bubbles, until it cracks and whoosh with a sigh, and lip, lip, lip. It subsides. Don't you know we'll get away? Don't you know we'll leave by boat? So now I'm going to pivot to the next section of poems. And um, I am going to read them myself. But first, a little bit about introductions. The first one is by our beloved poet, Natasha Trethewey. It's called Miscegenation. Natasha is known to all of you, I'm sure. She was born in Gulfport, Mississippi, to a white father and an African-American mother. And racial identity is absolutely at the center of her work. She's a major American poet, author of five books, domestic work, Belloc's Ophelia, Native Guard, which won the Pulitzer Prize and really totally established her national and international reputation, Thrall, and Monument, Poems New and Selected. And she's also an author of an incredible mem memoir about her mother, uh, Memorial Drive, in which she's finally able to really write about the fact that her mother was murdered by her mother's second husband. She has received countless awards and prizes. She was both Mississippi Poet Laureate and U.S. Poet Laureate. Beginning in 1912, reappointed for a second term as U.S. Poet Laureate. She it was elected to the chancellor of, she's elected as a chancellor to the Academy of American Poets, and she teaches at Northwestern University. So here's a huzzle by Natasha Trathalay. A huzzle is an ancient Persian form, which is written in couplets, and you'll hear two things. First of all, the couplets aren't necessarily all that closely connected to each other, but second, the last word of each couplet is the same, and in this case, it's the word Mississippi. Miscegenation. In 1965, my parents broke two laws in Mississippi. They went to Ohio to marry, returned to Mississippi. They crossed the river into Cincinnati, a city whose name begins with a sound like sin, the sound of wrong, miss, in Mississippi. 
A year later, they moved to Canada, followed a route to Saint as slaves, the train slicing the white blaze of winter, leaving Mississippi. Faulkner's Joe Christmas was born in winter, like Jesus, given his name for the day he was left at the orphanage, his race unknown in Mississippi. My father was reading War and Peace when he gave me my name. I was born near Easter, 1966 in Mississippi. When I turned 33, my father said, it's your Jesus year. You're the same age he was when he died. It was spring, the hills green in Mississippi. I know more than Joe Christmas did. Natasha is a Russian name, though I'm not. It means Christmas child, even in Mississippi. Lay down, how many? And this is one day we were driving back from Clarksdale. This is what we saw. The day lays down the first summer heat as we drive from Clarksdale, has cotton silos, pecan trees, Baptist churches, little swamps with floating trash, maybe an egret, one lane roads leading off into cotton or alfalfa fields and a yellow crop duster gassing up, getting ready to spray poison. Now, the next section of our presentation has four poems. You already know me, and you already know Natasha. So I wanted to say some words about, if I haven't lost my place, Sterling A. Brown. Sterling A. Brown is the author of two of the poems in this section, <coughs> He is a really wonderful figure. Um, he was born on the campus of Howard University in 1901, where his father, a former slave, was a professor. He attended Williams College in Massachusetts on a scholarship and got his MA at Harvard University. He immersed himself in Southern, black Southern folkways. This is one thing that's really important about him. Folkways, lives, and lore. He ended up teaching for 40 years at Howard. And, um, you know, I've been doing some reading about him. One quotation says he devoted his life to the development of an authentic black literature. A scholar named Darwin T. Turner told Ebony Magazine, all trails lead at some point to Sterling Brown, the literary historian who wrote the Bible for the study of African American literature. So his first book was published in 1932, Southern Road. It was successful, but during the Depression, he couldn't get a publisher for a second book, which is, to me, just incredible and horrifying. So he kind of mm, backed away from trying to publish his own work. He became a really important scholar of African American literature, devoted himself to his teaching and to his students, whom he encouraged to have confidence in themselves, find their own voices, as African American <coughs> students. Eventually, uh, and he was really active during the Harlem Renaissance. So eventually, as things began to change for the condition of African American publishing, it became possible for him to start publishing other books. His 1980 collected poems won the Lenore Marshall Poetry Prize for the best book of poetry published that year. In 1984, until his death in 1989, he was Poet Laureate of Washington, D.C. So I'm really excited to introduce four poems, the titles of which are Riverbank Blues, Theories of Time and Space, Vicksburg National Military Park, and Southern <coughs> Road. <coughs> Action. Man, getting his feet set in a sticky mud bank. Man, get this yellow water in his blood. No need for hoping, no need for doing. But his dreams keep him fixed for good. Little muddies, big muddies, Moreau and Osage. Little Mary's, big Mary's, Cedar Creek, 
flood their muddy water round about a man's roots, keep him soaked, strained, get him weak. Lazy sun shining on a little cabin. Lazy moon glistening over river trees. Old river whispering, lapping against the long roots. Plenty of rest and peace and ease. Big new black loam, apple and peach trees. But seem like the river washes us down past the rich farms away from the fat land. Dumps us in some ornery riverbank car. Went down to the river. Sought me down and listened. Heard the Water talking quiet, quiet like a slow. Ain't no need for hurry. Take your time. Take your time. Heard it saying, Baby, here's, here's the, the way, way life goes. That is what it told me as I watched it slowly roll. Something way inside me reared up and say, better be moving, better be traveling. Riverbank will get you if you stay. Towns are sinking deeper, deeper in the riverbank. Taking on the ways of their soaky old man. Taking on his creepy ways. Taking on his evil ways. Let's get way, long way, while you can. Man got his sea too, like the Mississippi. Ain't got so long for a whole lot longer way. Man better move some, better not get rooted. Muddy, Muddy water, water fool you if you stay. somewhere you've never been. Try this. Head south on Mississippi 49, one by one, mile markers ticking off another minute of your life. Follow this to its natural conclusion. Dead end at the coast. The pier at Gulfport, where riggings of shrimp boats are loose stitches sky threatening rain. Cross over the man-made beach. 26 miles of sand dumped on a mangrove swamp. Buried terrain of the past. Bring only what you must carry. Tome of memory. It's random blank pages. On the dock, where you board the boat for Ship Island, someone will take your picture. The photograph, who you were, will be waiting when you return. Just this. When they were my sons, I used to pull the covers up around their ears and tuck them in, smooth their hair, kiss their salty eyelids. Now ginkgo leaves make golden blankets around the tombstone of a boy from Iowa and another I can't read and another Another, 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 as far as I can see, scattered across the hillside. This autumn, 
and every autumn beyond counting. Swing that hammer. Huh. Steady, boy. Swing that hammer. Huh. Steady, boy. Ain't no rush, baby. Long ways to go. Bernard tore his... Huh. Black heart away. Bernard tore his... Huh. Black heart away. Got me life, baby. Gals on Fifth Street, huh? Sun done gone. Gals on Fifth Street, huh? Sun done gone. Wife's in the ward, baby. Babe's not gone. Old man died, huh? Cussing me. Old man died, huh? Cussing me. Old lady rocks, baby. Her misery. Double shackled. Huh. God behind. Double shackled. Huh. God behind. Ball and chain, baby. On my mind. White man tells me. Huh. Damn your soul. White man tells me. Huh. Damn your soul. Got no need, baby, to be told. Chain gang never, huh, let me go. Chain gang never, huh, let me go. Hold off, boy, baby, evermore. Once we drove to the lake, lay on his Chevy to look at the stars. Funny thing was, no stars, but I could feel his heart and hear the peepers singing. Eep, 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 eep. Hours and hours we lay there. He covered me with his coat when I got cold. Once I think I dozed, not dozed, something stranger than dozed. Opened my eyes again. Paper still singing, his heart still thumping. Clouds whipped around, tearing holes in the sky and shining through was the moon. stare at the flowers, 
shake his head, shake his head. He shakes his head all night long. Yazoo, Jackson, Vicksburg. We must have family in almost every city. We spend more time traveling than growing up. I guess that's why I'm still shorter than my old man. He don't like to stay in one place much. He tell me, soon as people get to know your last name, seem like they want to call you by your first. Boy, if someone asks you your name, tell them to call you Mississippi. Not Sippy, or Sip, or Mississippi. How many color folks you know named Mississippi? None, see. Now you can find a whole lot of folks whose name is Canada, just like you can find 53 people in any phone book whose name is Booker T. Washington. Your mother, she was a smart woman, gave you a good name, not one of them abolitionist names. What do you look like with a name like John Brown or William Lloyd Garrison? I don't have no clans. Your mother, she named you after the river because of its beauty and mystery. Just like my mother named me the battle. Because she didn't know where it was. Heidi Marie Farron, Christopher Tucker, Justine Magnuson, and Travis Delgado, uh, and the poets for sharing their work. Um, and if you'd be willing, we'd love to have, uh, with the time we have remaining, uh, a question and answer discussion about either uh, questions of Anne uh, about this work, impressions uh, from <coughs> listening to these words, and the wonderful editing uh, by the Acting Ensemble and Heidi Marie Farron of bringing it all together. So any questions you may have. And I will be repeating the questions just for the stream, so they'll be able to hear. Yeah, I'm to happy to answer questions. First of all, let me just say I thought you did a fantastic job organizing the whole thing. Mm -hmm. The video, the last video of the poem about the moon actually brought tears to my eyes. I'm like, oh my God, that's what the poem was trying to say. You know? Well, let, let's ask that, that question. Maybe that's a good place to start. See, there was a, a visual uh, version of your poem. Mm -hmm. And this is, we were talking outside a little bit about the nature of theater. Um, uh, often when you look at a book of poetry or a play, they're incredibly thin compared to a novel. Mm -hmm. The novel, Gone with the Wind, is <laughs> very uh, thick compared to the screenplay. Uh, and, and plays like poetry uh, asks a lot of the collaborative imaginations of the partners who we don't know who <coughs> ever show up either in the audience or pick it up off the show. So there's a huge risk of being understood or being misunderstood as an artist. And so what was that like for you watching these actors were the words or some of these that you might have taught in class for a long time for them to uh, bring them deep into their imagination? Oh, I thought the performers did a great job. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I really admired their embodiment of the voices and such variety and very moving. Um, I loved the duo that you had going for Riverbed Blues. That was funny and very moving. It reminds me of that part in Mark Twain, you know, where you're by the Mississippi River in Arkansas and everything is just sliding into the mud, you know, and you're like, get me out of here. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and then Southern Roads, which is a poem that I've taught, and I scared the devil out of my students at one point by performing that out loud, you know? And it is a brutal and powerful poem. And I'm just like throwing myself into it, and you're like, oh my god, oh my god, you know? <laughs> <laughs> this white lady doing that, you know? But um, yeah, so what should I talk about? I think it's great when people have such strong visual experiences of poetry and also experiences in voice. The book that I wrote in collaboration with Maud started out really with her photographs, you know? So she would send me my email 
photographs, PDFs of photographs that she'd taken from the Delta over decades. And I started hearing these voices through my head. Um, I had lived in Mississippi for practically 30 years, but I never thought that I had the right to appropriate Mississippi voices, being a northerner, you know, being from Berkeley, California, and all the rest of it. And then all of a sudden I started hearing these voices, and I realized I've been listening to these incredible voices for 30 years. And so they can move through me. I don't need to claim them as mine, but I can put them out there. And her poem, her, her, her photograph started telling stories. It's like, I'm not writing about what's in the photograph. I'm not just describing the photograph, but I'm telling some kind of make-believe story of somebody who's in some way associated with that photograph, you know? So for me, it was an incredibly rich experience because her photographs are so evocative and so beautiful. Um, but there again, you've got poetry of place. Place is just super saturated with language and with history and with people's lives. And also with the lives of other than human beings. You know, the clouds, the moon, the soil, the plants, the microbes. So it's all rich territory. Any questions for Dr. Fisher? I, I have one question, Ann. Uh, it's interesting. We, we all know it, it's almost becoming exhausting to talk about how much the world has changed recently. But our relationship to place, I think, um, has had, had a significant impact. People are in their places for an amount of time that we haven't, uh, maybe ever, without transient or untethered so much of our experiences. Uh, the New York Times this morning had an article about how rent prices are going up because of people are trying to buy houses. This feeling of being untethered, of not having a place, um, maybe symptomatic of how digital our, our world has been. Um, I would speak for my generation, how we have not been able to buy houses because of student loan debt or uh, multiple economic situations uh, or fallouts of disasters that cause us to move around the country in pursuit of gainful employment. That there's a craving of this type of place and maybe a revisiting of what it means to be from somewhere. Um, uh, what does it mean to have space? Because we spend so much time in, in, in our own rooms. Uh, are you noticing any of that in your students, in your own imagination as you respond to writing? Or um, if, if that catalyzes something in, in the, the audience they'd like to share, yeah. it would be wonderful to have that conversation. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I have written so many poems this past couple of years about the, the countries in my front yard. <laughs> <laughs> As she said, too many book on <laughs> you know, Because I spent, I mean, during the lockdown, um, when I was teaching by Zoom, and for a while it was this beautiful spring and early summer weather where I would sit on my front porch. And as Peter knows, I got into really planting flowers and flower pots all along the front walkway. And I would sit there and I just would watch the trees and watch the birds, you know? Um, and that was how I could kind of extend my imagination outward a little bit because I wasn't traveling the world, I wasn't having all these radically new experiences. Um, so that's one thing for sure. But I guess I just want to say this too about the environmental crisis, which is what we don't know we're willing to destroy. And we see that all over the world right now. We see so much destruction, so much carelessness, so much ignorance about the environment. You know, what we do know, conversely, think about your beloved people. You don't want to destroy them, except when you're in a really bad mood, you know? <laughs> you want to cherish them, you want to take care of them, you want to nurture them. And it's the same with the other than human world. If you know it, if you know what it needs, if you know how it grows, if you know how it's something about how it's made. You know, there's so much scientific knowledge coming out all the time about how we are interconnected, we are interdependent. Let me make one book recommendation which has nothing to do with poetry. It's called Entangled Life by a guy with the coolest name ever, Merlin Sheldrake. <laughs> and he is a microbiologist, he's a mycologist. And it's a book about the incredibly entangled world of fungi and mycelia. And if you read nothing else this next year, I would recommend that book, it's really interesting really firm scientific knowledge that also completely
completely engrossed in that, you know? And his whole argument that science is revealing to us is we are literally interdependent and interconnected. And this all comes back to knowing the place, right? So that's what I wanted to say about that. That's wonderful. You know? We probably have time for one more question. Could, could you tell us a little something about uh, this, this program that uh, holds that mixes uh, environmental science yeah. and, and literature? Thank you for asking, yes. The interdisciplinary minor in environmental studies <clears throat> is now about 13 years old. We worked really hard to get it set up because, as you know, Mississippi is not exactly the vanguard of environmental <coughs> education, do you know? But it's a beautiful, thriving program, um, and it involves sciences, natural sciences, social sciences, and humanities. Um, we now have an NEH planning grant to do environmental outreach and literacy in Mississippi. And so we've been working by we, I mean the core investigative group is Jason Hexum and Embology, Jay Watson, our partner professor of Howry Studies, Laura Johnson, who's a psychologist, and me, a PI. Um, and we've been <clears throat> meeting every week to develop curricula for a year-long sequence in environmental studies and to um, create a whole series of internship possibilities as well. And then we have a larger planning group, which is 11 people, and an even larger environmental core faculty, which is about 19 people. So we just offer all kinds of um, you know, courses. There is a mandatory gateway course, Environmental Studies 101, which I teach, which is Humanities and the Environment. And then there's a mandatory biology requirement. Um, but we're trying to really expand that and even become more interdisciplinary in every possible way. And we're just trying to reach out through environmental literacy and education through the schools, through uh, different programs throughout the state, you know. Um, I recently learned that there is a, a, an NEH planning grant, I think it's at Alcorn, and it's about mycology. And I'm like, we gotta get down there and start working with them, you know, because this is exactly what I'm talking about, this kind of interconnection. But um, it's been hugely rewarding to be involved. Um, Meg, can you say a word about the environmental studies program and the way that it has related to your son? Um, uh, where would you like me to begin? Well, like Marshall, you know, uh, we <coughs> met each other and so on at the internship. My, my son has a business called Home Place Pastures, and he came home, and the word that's always used is vertical integration, where he actually raises the animals. And then from there, we have a USDA slaughter facility and then a USDA approved um, processing plant and then a retail shop that sells the finished product. And so for consumers of me, they can see the whole picture. And what uh, Ann Fisher Worth allowed was for Marshall to come and make a presentation about his business to her class and then offer internships for anyone who might be interested. And um, from this process, there were actual students of Sam uh, Fisher Wurst that came and lived on the farm for the summer to understand a, a, a different way of farming as the crop dusters <laughs> and, and all of that. But um, that was a way to further expand this idea of of the environment to come and actually see a business at work with this, which yeah. I deeply appreciate. Yeah, thank you. Yes, yeah, so if you all know people of college age who might be interested in this, please, you know, direct them to, like, they can email me and I can tell them about it, but it's, it's been an incredibly rich and rewarding program. Also, if you don't know what to do this next Monday night at 7 p.m., at Bondurant Auditorium, Janice Ray, who is an incredible um, environmental writer from Georgia, is speaking, and she's speaking on, quote, coming home to the wild. Her first book, Ecology of a Cracker Childhood, do you, you guys, some of you heard of this book? She grew up on a junkyard, literally a junkyard in South Georgia, surrounded by longleaf pine forest. She was born into a deeply evangelical family and um, her father suffered from bipolar illness. So she had a lot to kind of work through and work over, you know? She got her MFA at Montana and then decided to do what's called re-inhabitation, which is where you come back to a place 
and you dedicate yourself to it. And you try to help heal it from all this damage that's been done. So she's become, um, her, her book, Ecology of a, uh, Ecology of a Cracker Childhood, was named Georgia Book of the Year at one point. So every school kid read it, you know? And then she's gone on to do all kinds of stuff with river keepers and seed preservation, preservation of heirloom species. And she's written a bunch more books and so on. So as I say, if you are in Oxford on Monday night and you want to come to a really wonderful speaker, she was at one point our Christian visiting writer for a year, um, come here. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. We are coming up on our lunch break where uh, you are free to go out and enjoy a lot of the great establishments here in Clarksdale. Uh, many of you may have a survey on your seat and it would be incredibly helpful for us if you'd be willing to fill those out. They'll also be available on the website. There'll be a Google form out there where you can fill out uh, what is working and what we can work on for your festival. What is unique about uh, Clarksdale and the Mississippi Delta Tennessee Williams Festival is that it's not just a theater festival, but uses theater as uh, a collaborative and synthesis type of lens to look on this really unique place. We're very fortunate to have uh, our scholars and humanities pr uh, presenters sponsored by Mississippi Humanities, our artists uh, sponsored by Mississippi Arts Council, and all the support by both the state and local uh, uh, tourism organizations visit Mississippi and especially visit Clarkston, who are willing to uh, really invest in what makes this festival so unique. You don't find a Tennessee Williams Festival like this anywhere else in the country because we are in the actual rooms that birthed uh, many of these plays, sometimes members of the families uh, that he was basing these stories on. There's no place like the Delta for such a confluence of the story of what it means to be American, American and we're so lucky to have our experts with us. We'll see you all back at 1 p.m. for a really exciting presentation by the Blue City Cultural Center, and then a panel uh, later this afternoon on the diversity of the, dance, uh, the Delta, uh, talking about uh, immigrant and minority experience here uh, in this region. So we'll see you real soon, and thank you all. Friday afternoon, afternoon programming here at the Mississippi Delta Tennessee Williams Festival. We appreciate your participation and watching and safety of your home. As you can see, we're indoors right now because there's been rain here in Clarksdale off and on today. So we are wearing our masks, being safe indoors, and we hope that you are safe uh, where you find yourself today. We have an exciting presentation coming up, presented by the, Bl the Blue City Cultural Center, Black Pearl of the Delta, featuring the work of Del the Delta's preeminent black authors, writers, and artists, created by, their Mem uh, by the, uh, the Memphis Blue City Cultural Center Ensemble and led by Professor Levi Frazier. Please enjoy. Questions, comments, confrontations. Forty years ago, when we first heard these words, especially confrontations, from world-renowned poet Etheridge Knight at our Beale Street Writers Workshop, we knew our lives as writers would forever be changed. He taught us to take responsibility for our words and not back down. And as William Faulkner, another Mississippi native son, advised us writers, Get it down, take chances. It may be bad, but it's the only way you can do anything good. So in writing or doing good, we open ourselves to the bad, the slings and arrows of outrageous misfortune. Not unlike our festival honoree, who we Memphians proudly call Tennessee Williams, who penned at times unnerving poetry for the stage. 
Even his stage directions are just as engaging as his dialogue. So it is an honor to be here today to give this introductory tribute to Williams and introduce you to two other sons and one daughter of the Mississippi Delta who had an impact on us as writers. Three loud black voices from the Mississippi Delta, Richard Wright, Etheridge Knight, and Indisha May Holland. Maybe after you hear their voices, you'll know why the caged bird sings. Three black voices that still inspire questions, comments, and confrontations. Though the writers themselves have passed on, their voices remain behind to haunt us into paying attention to the least of our brethren and sometimes stepping on toes in the process. Richard Wright, Indisha May Holland, and Etheridge Knight, three black pearls harvested from the dark soil of the Delta. Three black pearls born of pain. But try as we can, we cannot, nor should we, overlook the agony that brought these jewels into existence. For we must acknowledge the pain in order to focus on the pearl. For pain is the prelude to the pearl. In an article entitled, What Makes a Black Pearl Black? by Rima Molina, the author says, natural black pearl is more expensive and mysterious than its classic cousin. And for good reason, although manufacturers can dye pearls black, it takes extremely rare conditions to form pearls that have that dark, eerily iridescent glow, as in the cases of our honorees. Extreme conditions of violence, poverty, sexual abuse, sexism, racism, and religion all contributed to the dark and eerily iridescent glow of our extremely valuable and mysterious black pearls we will cover in our presentation today. I think it only fitting that we start with the writer whose glow lit the path for others to follow, Richard Nathaniel Wright, whose story was told in Levi Fraser's play, A Tribute to Richard Wright, a drama produced in Memphis and eventually in Paris as a part of an international festival on blacks in Europe. Richard Nathaniel Wright, renowned author of Native Son and Black Boy, his most celebrated works, was born on September 4th, 1908 at Rutgers Plantation between the train town of Roxy and the larger river city of Natchez, Mississippi. Both sets of his grandparents were born into slavery. He, however, was the son of Nathan Wright, a sharecropper, and Ella Wilson Wright, a school teacher. For a while, Richard and his brother were brought up by his mother in the strict seven-day Adventist home of his grandmother. That and the ill treatment by white Christians towards blacks may have caused him to renounce religion early in life. When he was six, as noted in his biography, Black Boy, his father deserted the family and left him alone and hungry, which cloaked him with a deep biological bitterness towards his father, who he would not see for the next 25 years. One of the most vividly told stories by Wright in Black Boy centers on him as a child playing with matches. You stop that yelling, you hear? You know your granny's sick. You better be quiet now. You make more noise than any four-year-old I didn't ever seen. What are you doing? None of your business. Ooh, I'm gonna tell. So, mama don't care. Oh, fire. Yellow fire. Grandma, I get to the kitchen. I, I gotta get to grandma. Mama's gonna beat me. She's gonna beat me. I, I done something wrong. Beat me, grandma. Get out. Get out. Gotta hide. We're oh, under the house, grandma. Your hair is. The, the, the curtain's on fire. Richard! Richard, where are you, Richard? The house is on fire! Somebody help me find my child! Somebody! Help me! Help me! Dan, out of the house! Get him! Uh, no! 
Exhaustion would make me drift towards sleep, and then I would scream until I was wide awake again. I was afraid to sleep. Finally, I got well, but for a long time I was chasing. Whenever I remembered that my mother had come close to killing me. After his father's disappearance, poverty was a constant companion for Wright, his mother, and brother. And in 1915, his mother, Ella, put her sons in Settlement House, a Methodist orphanage for a short time. Richard was later enrolled at Howe Institute in Memphis from 1915 to 1916. In 1916, his mother moved with Richard and his younger brother to live with her sister, Maggie, and Maggie's husband, Silas Hoskins, in Elaine, Arkansas. This part of Arkansas was in the Mississippi Delta, where former cotton plantations had been. The Wrights were forced to flee after Silas Hoskins disappeared, reportedly killed by a white man who coveted his successful saloon business. This was one of the many times racism and violence reared its ugly head in Wright's life. For lynchings were an ever-present danger for any black male or female who dared get out of line. And having a successful business for a black man during this time was an example of getting out of line and could, as in the case of his uncle, lead to death. And one morning, while in the woods, I stumbled. Stumbled. Suddenly upon the thing. 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 Stumbled upon it in a grassy clearing guarded by scaly oaks and elms. And the sooty details of the scene rose, thrusting themselves between the world and me. There was a design of white bones. Slumbering forgottenly upon a cushion of ashes. A vacant shoe. A empty tie. A ripped shirt. A lonely hat. pair of trousers, stiff with black blood, and the dry bones stirred, rattled, lifted, 
entering into my flesh. The gin flask passed from mouth to mouth. Cigars and cigarettes glowed. The whore smeared lipstick red upon her lips. And a thousand faces swirled around me, clamoring that my life be burned. And then they had me stripped me. And my skin clung to the bubbling hot tar, falling from me in limp patches. Then my blood was cool. Was cooled. Mercifully, cooled by a baptism of gasoline. And in a blaze of red, I leaped to the sky as pain rose like water, boiling my limbs. Now I am dry bones, my face a stony skull, staring in yellow surprise at the sun. Although quite intelligent, Wright did not attend school consistently until the age of 12, when he was enrolled in a seven-day Adventist school and taught by his Aunt Addie. At 15, he published his first short story, Voodoo of Hell's Half Acres, in a black newspaper. In his last year, in Smith Robertson Junior High School, where he became valedictorian of his class, instead of writing his own speech, Wright was given a speech to read by his principal. Wright, though under a threat of punishment, refused to read that speech, but instead read his own. At 17, he moved to Memphis with his mother, who had had a stroke and brother, and Wright was hired by a white northerner to work in an optical company. Richard, I want to train a Negro boy in the optical trade. I want to help him, guide him. Riddles, peace. I want you both to break Richard in gradually to the workings of the shop. You'll show him how to grind and polish lenses. Yes, sir. Okay, now, I'll be back. Oh. Richard, here, take this broom and see how clean you can get this place. But I was refused to train it, constantly demeaned and even threatened with violence. Richard, uh, uh, Reynolds here tells me that you called me Peas, not Mr. Peas. Oh, why, I, uh... Didn't you call him Peas? If you say you did not rip your gut strings loose, you black granny dodger. You can't call a white man no liar and get away with it. No, no. Well, get out. I I'll leave. I'll leave right now. Humiliated and crestfallen. Wright determined to leave the South, which he did. This made him a part of the great migration to the North, and he and his family settled in Chicago. There he found respect as a writer, a man, and found friends of all, all races. races. I was born by a river in a little tent, but all like that river I've been running ever since. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. I am black. And I have seen black hands, millions and millions of them, out of the millions of bundles of wool and flannel, 
tiny black fingers have reached restlessly and hungrily for life, reached out for the black nipples of the black breasts of the black mothers, and they have held red, green, blue, yellow, orange, white, and purple toys in the childish grips of possession. And chocolate drops and peppermint sticks, lollipops, wine balls, ice cream cones, and sugar cookies and fingers sticky and gummy. And they held balls and bats and gloves and marbles, jackknives and slingshots and spinning tops and the thrill of sport and play. I am black and I have seen black hands, millions and millions of them, and they piled higher and higher, the steel, iron, lumber, wheat, rye, oak, the cotton, the meat, the fruit, the glass, and the stone, until there was too much to be used. And they grabbed guns and slung them on their shoulders and marched and groped in trenches and fought and killed and conquered nations who were customers for the goods black hands had made. And again, black hands stacked goods higher and higher until there was too much to be used. Too much to be used. I am black, and I have seen black hands, millions and millions of them, and the black hands struck desperately out in defense of life, and there was blood, but the enraged bosses decreed that this too was wrong. I am black, and I have seen black hands raised in fists of revolt, side by side with white workers, and someday, and it is only this which sustains me, someday there shall be millions and millions of them on some red day in a burst of fists on a new horizon. Richard Nathaniel Wright had lived in the Mississippi Delta spending time in Mississippi, Tennessee, and Arkansas, with all three making a major impact on him as a person and as a writer. He was the author of over 16 books and over 4,000 haiku. A caged bird from the Delta who continued to sing long after his flight to freedom. I had never read a book written by African-American, <laughs> I didn't know that black people could write books. I didn't know that black folks had done any great things. These were the words of Dr. Indisha Ida Mae Holland, scholar, playwright, and civil rights activist, born dirt poor on August 29th in Greenwood, Mississippi. Cat, as she was called, had obstacles to confront even more devastating than poverty. One she was unaware of until her 11th birthday. She describes it and other experiences in her award-winning play from the Mississippi Delta. I am so kind of excited. <laughs> I'm 11 years old today, and for my birthday present, I'm going to the Walt Hall Picture Show. Later on today, Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence is responsible for me going to the show. I mean, they gonna pay me two dollars for looking after their little grand girl, little Miss Becky Ann. Now, the Lawrences, now, now they, they real nice people. They've been giving me one dollar for looking after little Miss Becky Ann, but because it's my birthday, they're gonna add another dollar. Oh, I'm gonna have me a good time at the picture show with Putin and the rest of my friends. Oh, today I'm gonna grab the bull by his horns. And that means that you reach at crossroads in your life and you either throw the bull or the bull throw you. Miss Lawrence picked me up at nine o'clock. Little Miss Becky Ann is with us. Miss Lawrence now, oh, got a great big house. It's white with big old poles running up and down. The doors is as wide as our whole house. The room is bigger than the playground. The walls is covered with cloth and everywhere there's colored folks holding up things. Some of them so big they almost looks real. <laughs> It's still the most beautifulest house I ever saw. Gal, come on upstairs. 
Mr. Lawrence wants to see you. And Mrs. Lawrence said, and I didn't notice the stairs going up. It, it was that when I came down, that each design, each carving became forever etched in my being. Yes, Miss Lawrence, here I come. I got up on my tiptoes to walk across them shiny floors. I mean, if I put my big wide foot down, board flat, I might mark up the prettiest floor I ever saw. Miss Lawrence, here I is. Miss Lawrence caught my hand and led me into the room. Mr. Lawrence was lying there in the big bed. The covers on the bed, ooh, they look so smooth and silky. I wish Aunt Baby had a bed spread like this. Miss Lawrence pushed me over to the bed. The, the bull threw me. me. A little later, I, I stumbled down the stairs. The widest steps I ever saw. The banister had tiny roses carved into a, a bouquet. In the middle of the polished wooden flowers was a small bud. Reaching the last step in the tomb-like house, I, I paused and, and looked up. The first time I was looking through the eyes of a woman. An old woman. The picture show seemed childish to me. I feel grown up now. Now that I got five dollars. Oh shoot. I'm a woman now. I ain't even gonna play with little Miss Becky no more. So I stood in the backyard, not too far from the car, and I waited for Miss Lawrence to come. And to take me home. Extremely rare conditions, even at 11 years old, to form pearls that have that dark, eerily iridescent glow. Needless to say, Indisha May became a troubled child, a prostitute at 12, and mother at 15. She learned to depend on the kindness of strangers. It was on one such occasion that she sought out a stranger from the civil rights movement who had come to Greenwood. In an attempt to snare, she was snared by the movement and her life was forever changed. Of this experience, she said, I was already conscious of my inferiority and I always remembered my place until the civil rights movement came to the town where I was born and grew up. Impressed with the efficiency and business-like approach of the African-American SNCC members, she volunteered her time to the cause. Her mother opposed her decision to get involved with the young protesters and feared a reprisal from the local white community, and for good reason. In 1965, a fire broke out in her home and killed her mother. Holland maintained that she believed the Klan firebombed her home in retaliation for her work with SNCC. She was 21 at the time of her mother's death. Although manufacturers can dye pearls black, it takes extremely rare conditions to form pearls that have that dark, eerily iridescent glow. As a result of this experience, Holland's glow only grew brighter. She got more involved with the movement. She was arrested 13 times as a result of this involvement. She obtained her GED at the insistence of her SNCC colleagues. She then went to the University of Minnesota, where she helped start the African American Studies Department and the Women Helping Offenders Program. She got her B.A. degree there in African American Studies in 1979. In 1981, she was awarded $1,000 for the National Lorraine Hansberry Award for the second best play in 1981. In 1984, she received her master's degree in American Studies from the University of Minnesota. And 20 years after leaving the Delta, she received her Ph.D in American Studies from the university as well. Upon receiving her degree, also bestowed upon her, was her Swahili name, Indisha, 
which means one who drives herself and others forward. She was given this name by Milana Karinga, founder and father of the International Kwanzaa Celebration. She then taught at State University in Buffalo, New York, Michigan State, and at USC, where she retired in 2003. In her career, she wrote half a dozen plays, her most famous being from the Mississippi Delta. This play chronicled her path from childhood in the Jim Crow South into her successful adulthood. This play garnered her many prizes and awards, including a Pulitzer Prize nomination. Productions at the Goodman Theater in Chicago, the Circle in the Square in New York, and the Young Vic in London, among many other places around the world. This shimmering black pearl was also featured in the PBS documentary, Freedom on My Mind, on October 18th in Greenwood, Mississippi. They will celebrate Dr. Indisha Ida Mae Holland Day, which was declared in 1991 with her return home to receive the key to the city. Upon accepting the key on the steps of City Hall, she remarked that the last time she had been there, she was on her way to jail. At the age of 61, Dr. Holland died of ataxia, the same disease that had ravaged her mother up until her death. Gone but not forgotten, the playwright's words to her students still resonate today for us to pass on to others, especially the youth. Finally, if you're young, make a promise to yourself that you will never give up on your dreams. The world began when you were born. It will be whatever you make it. I was born in Mississippi. I walked barefooted through the mud, born black in Mississippi. Walked barefooted through the mud, but when I reached the age of 12, I left that place for good. My dad, he chopped cotton, and he drank his liquor straight. Oh, I left that Sunday morning. He was leaning on the barnyard gate. I left my mama standing with the sun shining in her eyes. I headed north as straight as the wild goose flies. Been to Detroit and Chicago, been to New York City too. Said I done strolled all over that funky avenue. I am still the same old black boy with the same old blues going back to Mississippi, this time to stay for good. Going back to Mississippi, this time to stay for good. Going to be free in Mississippi or dead in the Mississippi mud. A poem for myself or blues for a Mississippi black boy by Etheridge Knight. Guggenheim Fellow, a National Endowment for the Arts Fellow, a National Book Award, and Pulitzer Prize Award nominee, instructor at the University of Pittsburgh, the University of Hartford, and Lincoln University. Korean War veteran, former heron addict, and armed robber, prison poet, and most importantly, a dear friend who died too soon. As I said earlier, we Bill Street writers met Etheridge in 1977 when he came to Memphis and landed in our home on Benton Street with cigarettes, beer, and a love of poets and poetry. Our main haunt was Bill's Twilight Lounge every Tuesday night where we poeted, as Etheridge would say, to anyone who cared to listen or read. It was at Bill's that Etheridge encouraged us to recite our poetry from memory. Taught us how to engage an audience. And told us we didn't need music behind our poetry because our poetry had its own music worth listening to. Etheridge's history for us started 48 years before he met us in Corinth, Mississippi, where he was born on April 19, 1931. The family moved to Paducah, Kentucky, where he went to school for a short period of time. And though a bright individual, he dropped out at 16, frequenting the local juke joints and pool halls. He learned the language of his people. 
constantly running away from home. He was sent back to Corinth to live with his uncle in 1947. He enrolled in the service during the Korean War where he was severely wounded and suffered from PTSD. This led him to begin using morphine. By the time Knight was discharged from the army and returned to Indianapolis where his family had moved, he had become addicted to opiates. He spent much of the next several years dealing drugs and stealing to support his drug addiction. In 1960, after a few previous arrests, Etheridge and two of his buddies were arrested for armed robbery and sentenced to the Indiana State Prison. While in prison, he began reading as much as he could, and he especially enjoyed reading poetry. He also worked for the prison publication and began getting his poems published in it. When Gwendolyn Brooks, poet laureate of Illinois, visited the prison, he met her and she encouraged him to keep writing, which he did. Soon others outside the prison walls began taking notice of his work, including Dudley Randall, publisher of the Negro Digest, Sonia Sanchez, who he eventually married and Haki Marabuti. Randall eventually published Knight's first volume of verse, Poems from Prison, and hailed Knight as one of the major poets of the black arts movement. Although manufacturers can dye pearls black, it takes extremely rare conditions to form pearls that have that dark, eerily iridescent glow. So in the late 70s to mid 80s, we were poets aglow from the night light. His wealth of talent illuminated the path for us to read throughout the South and beyond in bars, universities, parks, community centers, parking lots, anywhere people gathered, including prisons, even on death row. Deborah Glass, a workshop member, was so taken by his writing that she compiled poetry and letters to and from him into a play called Night Songs. We toured that show as well. Take to the wall of my cell are 47 pictures, 47 black faces. My father, mother, grandmothers, one dead, grandfathers, both dead, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, cousins, first and second, Nieces and nephews, they stare across the space at me, sprawling on my bunk. I know their dark eyes, they know mine. I know their style, they know mine. I am all of them, they are all of me. They are farmers, I am a thief. I am me, they are thee. I have at one time been in love with my mother, one grandmother, two sisters, two aunts, one went to the asylum and five cousins. I am now in love with a seven-year-old niece. She sends me letters written in large block print, and her picture is the only one that smiles at me. I have the same name as one grandfather, three cousins, three nephews, and one uncle. The uncle disappeared when he was 15, just took off caught a break. He is disgusted each year when the family has a reunion. He causes uneasiness in the clan. He is an empty space. My father's mother, who is 93 and keeps the family Bible with everybody's birth dates and death dates in it, always mentions him. There is no place in her Bible for whereabouts unknown. Each fall, the graves of my grandfathers call me. The brown hills and red gullies of Mississippi send out their electric messages, galvanizing my genes. Just like a salmon quitting the cold ocean, leaping and bucking up his birth street. I hitchhiked my way from L.A. with 16 caps in my pocket and a monkey on my back. And I almost kicked it with the kinfolks. I walked barefooted in my grandmother's backyard. <laughs> I smelled the old land and the woods. I sipped corn whiskey from fruit jars with the men. I flirted with the women and I had a ball till my caps ran out and my habit came down. 
that night. I looked at my grandmother and split. My guts were screaming for junk, but I was almost contented. I had almost caught up with me. The next day in Memphis, I cracked the Crocus crib for a fix. This year, there is a gray stone wall damming my stream. And when the falling leaves stir my jeans, I pace my cell or flop on my bunk and stare at 47 black faces across the space. I am all of them. They are all of me. I am me, they are thee, and I have no children to float in the space between. Etheridge was an original. I have never met anyone like him, and if you met him, you would say the same thing. When he needed money, he'll sell his old car to more than just one person. When he didn't have a car, he borrowed one. Like somebody in the workshop's brand new Blue Dyson B210. Does the word total mean anything to you? The Colt 45 drugs and Paul Moss had taken control of our friend. Yes, our friend. Even the one with the total car. I say that unashamedly. Not only did this self-proclaimed meddler help us get our works in print, he told one publisher, if you don't publish them, you can't publish me. He also read the Dotsonless Poets poem, Colored People, wherever he appeared throughout the country. Most importantly, he enrolled us in his graduate course on life and poeting. For these things, I will always be grateful to this provocative and sensitive soul. The skin of my poems may be green. Yes, sometimes wrinkled or worn. The snake shape of my song may cause the heel of Adam and Eve to bleed. Split my skin with the rock of love, old as the rock of Moses. My poems love you. Richard Wright, Indisha Ida Mae Holland, and Etheridge Knight, three black pearls formed from extremely rare conditions of the rich black soil of the Mississippi Delta, which gave them their priceless, dark, eerily iridescent glow never to be extinguished as long as someone remembers. To tell their stories. Black pearls, most precious in the world, let me pick you up where you belong. Black pearls, most precious in the world, you've been in the background much too long. You've been working so hard your whole life through, not getting the recognition or the praise in finances too. Hey, how about something for you long overdue? Here in my heart, you're gonna reign supreme. No longer invincible, baby. You're our kings and queens. It's our turn for happiness, and our day has come. Only answering to the most precious one. Black pearls, most precious in the world. Let me put you up where you belong. Ooh, black pearls, most precious in the world. You've been in the background much too long. Black pearls, most precious in the world. Let me put you up where you belong. Black pearls, most precious in the world. You've been in the background much too long. You can see from the closing credits uh, how many people it takes to put together uh, uh, a project of this scope, but we're lucky to have many of the core uh, participants uh, in the project. 
So I'd like to welcome them to the stage for a brief Q&A. So uh, Aya, uh, Levi, and Deborah, if you'd like to come on out. Deborah's on our way around here. Uh, before we get started, as people may be thinking about questions they may want to ask about either the project, the work you do in Memphis with the Blues Cultural Center, uh, the nature of documentary uh, theater making, which is a, a, a really unique process where you take true stories, you blend uh, the practices of history, sociology, cultural anthropology, music and poetry within storytelling and theater. Uh, you may have questions about those, but first, uh, would you be willing to introduce yourselves, the role you play, and tell us a little bit about Blue City Cultural Center? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So as you can see, we have worked together a long time. <laughs> My name is Ayanna Williams, and I am with Blue City Cultural Center, the new executive director, uh, taking over a legacy founded by two wonderful people who will introduce themselves. And uh, I always love to introduce myself as their favorite daughter, so <laughs> that is who I am. <laughs> My name is Levi Frazier, co-founder of Blue City Cultural Center with my wife, Deborah Frazier, and uh, we found company 42 years ago. Wow. We've actually been married 43. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were so happy to be involved, and, uh, so happy to be involved in the conference here. This is about the third year, actually, the second year being involved with it, for all my students from Southwest Tennessee Community College the first year. The Blue City Cultural Center was a company founded uh, to put on plays, um, exhibits, uh, conferences, uh, about the African American excuse Experience, especially about the Southern African American experience. And that's what we've been doing for 42 years. Well, I'm Deborah Frazier, and I'm the other co founder. Uh, uh, I guess I'm a transplant, but now I have lived longer in the South than I have in the <laughs> North. So um, I'm a Southerner now, uh, <laughs> truly. But um, I um, had the opportunity. Um, to really and truly work with Etheridge Knight. And uh, he became such a part of our lives. And uh, one day we were all joking, Etheridge. And I said, Etheridge, I'd really like to write a play about you. And so he gave me all the work. Um, there are several people who have completed their PhDs on the study of his poetry and his life. and. Um, we had an opportunity to tour with him, and, and of course, every tour was an adventure. <laughs> he took us to Georgia and found a, a, a corn whiskey, and he <laughs> took us on that adventure. <laughs> and um, then we did get a grant to write a um, piece called Questions, Comments, and Confrontations from the Humanities uh, in uh, Tennessee. and. Uh, Gwendolyn Brooks would not fly, but she took the train from Chicago to uh, Nashville, Tennessee, to do a special workshop uh, for women in prison uh, in Nashville. But we toured the Tennessee prison system with the play, because that's where he started. And, uh, and it was uh, extremely important to us that he had an opportunity, but he never went to a prison. He always had something happen. Because he said he, was, he wasn't going back in. <laughs> even, even as a guest <laughs> lecturer, he was not going back into the prison. But, um, we, we just, uh, it was a life lesson for us. Well, thank you so much for that introduction to your work, the projects you've been working on. I know some people may have some questions, some comments about what they've seen. What well, made you be curious about the work that the Frasers have been doing in, in Memphis or about the project? What were the subjects of the project, you might say? Questions, comments, or confrontation. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Edward would always say. That's my confrontation, that was my confrontation. That was the type of person they was. Well, I can start us off. I know, uh, uh, Deborah, as you talked about getting all these documents uh, as a PhD, uh, uh, recovery PhD. <laughs> uh, I, I know what that, how that part of my brain 
organizes and listens and responds to patterns in the work. As someone who's a theater maker, particularly an adapter, I work often either with uh, existing literary sources or often uh, non-literary sources, oral histories, folklore, uh, interviews you've document, uh, documented. What is that process like when you generated either something like this or the other work you're doing in Memphis of helping people tell their, their stories? Uh, it, it feels like you have to jump, uh, spin a lot of different plates or flex a lot of different muscles on both the left and right side of your brain. Uh, it's a very unique thing that you all do with Memphis. What is your, what is your uh, process like? Uh, it's a very unique process, and maybe could you share some of the projects that uh, you've been working on or uh, that you, you've either toured or you have uh, on your list uh, in this next chapter of the cultural center? Do you want to start? You uh, okay. <laughs> I, uh, well, uh, we have grown uh, to do so much work uh, about our community. Uh, as I listen to the poetry uh, presentation earlier, we do really and truly work in place. In other words, it, there is a creative place-making opportunity for us, and when we look at who is telling the story, it is so important. Um, the last three years, we have done projects in communities where we allow, not only allow, we beg people in that community to tell their story as they see it. Um, so Ayana may want to talk a little bit about that because we have worked in Orange Mound, which was founded in 1890, as a community specifically developed for African Americans to own their own homes, 1890. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we do the story of the history of that neighborhood, um, as well where as- is, Where is that? That's in Memphis, Tennessee. So that's a part of, it, of Memphis, okay. That is part of, yeah, and it, it wasn't at the time, though. I mean, right, was, right. Right, okay. so um, we are trying to gather those stories from elders because the story is different. You know, it, it is who is telling the story. And so your perspective is different depending on who you are and how you've lived it. And it is important to us that we tell the story of the people who actually live there and have been affected. Uh, one of the things that I, I remember is that uh, they talked about the fact that the, one of the organizations within this church of women would gather clothing for new mothers and make sure that they were taken care of. Now, you know, of course, it's a nonprofit. People go, but this was all started, and this started in their community and what they did. Yeah, over 100 years ago. Go ahead, yeah. Because I'll get it. <laughs> One thing about that particular project, which it's called Story Places, that the young people do learn their history and not only learn their history, but where I kept seeing what my parents have produced or worked on is that first we have to learn where we have come from, where your community is today, but as young people to understand that you are also creating history. So how do you want people to remember you? So what will your legacy be? And so that they understand that now you're talking about your community, now you're creating history. So that's one of the, the, that particular project. And another one of our signature programs is that we do work with the homeless population. And we realize that in Memphis, Tennessee, we're known for a lot of warehouses. So you have FedEx, uh, Amazon is you know, there, Nike, all these wonderful warehouses that come. But we're dealing with people with mental illness, drug problems, multiple children, or just don't have the knack to work at a warehouse, but they have a talent. And that talent is some type of art form. If it's words, if it's painting, if it's drawing, they are now, we now do this thing where they make dolls. And each doll is an original piece, and they are able to tell their stories through those dolls. So that they, we have taken their words of their feelings and things that they had heard about or hurt someone else with, turned, this, turned that into a production. 
and that production has now opened it up for dialogue for people who work with the homeless population, people who are in, who are homeless, and even just um, the community all around. So now we find and realize no matter where we are, that answer is in the room. And it doesn't come from the very top. It doesn't come from people at the bottom. It comes from everybody that is in that room, that we can find our own solutions and that we work towards it. If it works, great. If it doesn't, we go back to the table and try again. But our main thing is to have small, intimate um, productions or workshops so that we are really putting uh, our work towards working with the people and that they really put in their own value and they understand who they are, what they are, and you have your own voice. And so it's always wonderful to hear that you can talk about all these famous people, but you're also famous because you're famous for your community and you're famous for your city and state. Yeah, we, we really like that. Uh, the name of the program is so much love. So much love. Sorry. Because they so dolls oh. together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so much love. And these and are women. Yeah. yeah. We, we deal with women. We've also written a script. We've compiled a script. Because we really don't write them. We compile the script. And it is from their writings and their lives. And uh, what Ayana said, which was so important, is that once we do the presentation, then we ask people to come who help, who provide services for them so that people can ask questions. In other words, too many times it's like, okay, what do you think? Well, this way, it's not what I think. It is that I am helping somebody else or I am putting a question on the table that can be answered by anybody in the room. And it's not a responsibility of that person to come up with the solution, but we as a community come up with the solution. And many of our things that are put together, put together by our major writer, uh, is Lee by Frazier. And last comment, because I know it's 2 o'clock, oh. I would just like to make is that in 1992, we took a, a show, the Richard Wright piece. I wrote a play about Richard Wright when I was in college. It just so happened that a lady came to the school that I attended, and she doing a one-woman show on Gertrude Stein. And after the show, I went backstage to talk to her, and I told her how much I enjoyed the show, and she said, you know, Gertrude Stein was a good friend of Richard Wright. I said, oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. In Paris, I said, oh. She said, somebody needs to write a show about Richard Wright. I said, you have to write a show, you need to do it. <laughs> and so I was, <laughs> I, I was a junior in college, and 20 years later, uh, we were invited to Paris to do the show by wow. Michelle Fogg, who wrote a biography on Richard Wright. And he came to Memphis when I was in college and saw the show. We became instant friends. He was actually and came to Yale at the Beinecke, Beinecke Collection at Yale and doing research on Wright. Then he came down to Memphis to see the play. And I took him around to the library places where Richard Wright lived. I didn't know where he lived. He said, okay, stop right here. He said, Richard Rice used to live in that house right there. I'm going, what? <laughs> you know? And he's from Paris, you know what I mean? I'm like, wow. So 20 years later, he invited us to Paris to do the show. Both my daughter and my wife were in it, and my young oldest son. Were wow. And so we had a great time in Paris and uh, doing the show. So it, it's been a lovely journey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. So this part is, is coming to a close. The conversation will continue in, in, in 15 short minutes with the diversity of the Delta panel. It, it, it's a, a conversation with all of you. We'll be using Tennessee Williams' play and the diverse neighborhood that we see in Streetcar Named Desire. The similarities it has to the neighborhoods here in Clarkdale, Clarkdale in particular, and the Delta in general. Where our panelists, uh, some of you have met already, and some of you will have the chance to see their uh, presentations tomorrow afternoon. We'll be having a conversation, responding to each other and your questions. So we'll be back uh, at, a, let's call it tw uh, 2.20. We'll give you a little time to get some fresh air. 2.20 in this room for the diversity on the D Delta panel. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone, to this afternoon's diversity of the Delta panel.
Now, in the play of A Streetcar Named Desire, Williams sets the home of his characters in a diverse New Orleans neighborhood of people trying to make their way amid significant economic, historical, and political obstacles. Now, this is the story of the same places and peoples uh, that we see here in the Delta, navigating many similar of the same themes and obstacles that Williams' characters face in the play. Our panel today and this discussion features scholars Dr. J. Janice Coleman, Levi and Deborah Fraser, Ayanna Williams, and Gilroy Chow. This panel weaves stories and experiences together with the history of the diverse people who make up the Delta. They're a diverse group of experts and scholars and uh, presenters with academic and lived expertise about what it means to be in this place, be a part of a land of a confluence that brings people in and sometimes people find themselves leaving just like the great river directly to our west. I'll let them uh, each introduce themselves and where they're from and a brief story uh, of, of where their place is. And then we'll go through with some discussions and brief remarks uh, uh, and your questions. We'll start that here with Ayana. Hi, I'm Ayana Williams. I am with Blue City Cultural Center. We have been around for 42 years, located in Memphis, Tennessee. We do original works. Uh, telling the stories of the people in our communities. I'm Deborah Frazier. I'm co-founder of Blue City Cultural Center based in Memphis, Tennessee with my husband. Levi Frazier, co-founder of Blue City Cultural Center with my wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Gilroy Chow. Uh, I'm a retired engineer, so I don't know what I'm doing in an arts festival. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Levi just asked me, uh, how are the Mississippi uh, Delta Chinese represented in the arts? And I said, we aren't, because I don't know many practitioners here, but we have uh, raised arts people uh, who have gone on and uh, had quite success in the arts. But uh, I am living here with my wife Sally, uh, visiting over there. Um, we have two grown children uh, and that three grandchildren and they are in Memphis. Uh, they have, are close to home, and, and we appreciate that. And I'm also president of the Mississippi Delta Chinese Heritage Museum, housed in uh, Cleveland, Mississippi, trying to preserve uh, the uh, heritage that the Chinese that have, um, anybody that's lived in the Delta is aware, but people outside of the Delta are not aware of the fact that uh, there are Chinese among the many diverse ethnic groups uh, represented in the Delta. And uh, today we'll talk about some of that. Um, but uh, there, there are people of uh, Lebanese descent, Italians, Jewish, Scots, Irish, uh, besides the majority black and white uh, that we hear so much about. But uh, anyway, I'm pleased to be here and thank you for having us. Okay. I'm J. Janice Coleman. I was born and raised in the historic old black town of Mountain Bayou, Mississippi. That's about 30 miles south of here. I'm an English professor at Alcorn State University, and um, I have spent almost all of my life sewing from scraps. And I think that is what, that's what they mean to be here today. Great, great. Well, let's start with you, Dr. Coleman. Okay. You, uh, tomorrow you're gonna to be presenting from uh, your collection uh, of textiles and, and uh, human materials. Would you be able to talk to us a little bit about what you brought and the, uh, uh, and, and the story of this object? And then we'll go through, be thinking of the questions you may have for our panel about the experiences uh, and the stories of immigrants and the diverse nature of the Delta. Okay, so I wanted to put this Afghan out here first because I want to talk about how this Afghan acquainted me with the Burroughs House in Benoit, Mississippi. Okay, um, this Afghan was made by a woman named Martha Mae Jones in 1997. Uh, I had seen a lot of her work and I wanted her to make an Afghan for me. And so um, she did and she asked me on Memorial Day 1997 to come and pick it up. I went to her house, I was a graduate student then and at, at the University of Mississippi. But I drove to Benoit to pick up the Afghan. And when she brought it out, she handed it to me 
as if it were a little baby. <laughs> she had it wrapped up and she gave it to me like that. And um, when I unfolded it, I thought she had really outdone herself this time. And so I was thinking about what I knew about her life. And so I said, Mother, how did you learn how to crochet like this? Let me tell you a little bit about Martha. Martha was born very ill, but her mother didn't know what was wrong with her until she was about six years, six months old and had turned completely white. Um, she went to the doctor and she was diagnosed with sickle cell anemia. All of her life, she suffered, suffered from sickle cell anemia. And I was thinking about her surroundings Growing up, moving from plantation to plantation, being bothered by uh, mosquitoes, mud, big trucks, tractors, that was her environment. And like many of us who grew up in the Delta, seeing a cotton field in some form of development every day of her life. So I wanted to know, how did she learn to create this kind of art? Martha made robes for an entire choir one year. Uh, so that's just how productive she was. So when I said, I said, Martha, uh, how, did you, how did you learn how to crochet? And she said, I taught myself. And then she realized I didn't believe that. <laughs> there had to be more to the story. She backed up and she said, she, she said twice, I taught myself. And then I was thinking, no. And so when she started telling me her story, I was thinking, hold up, Martha. I said, Martha, do you mind if I record this story? I, I was thinking, you just don't hear a story like this every day. She said that she was in the hospital and uh, once again crying for her mother. She wanted her mother to be there with her. Well, her mother couldn't be there with her because she was a bus driver uh, and then uh, uh, maybe an elementary school bus driver, and then she had other jobs that she had to do in between the two routes of the day. So she said, one day, this white nurse came in the room and told her to shut her mouth up. She said, I'm tired of you with all this crying. She gave Martha a, a how to crochet book, the thread, and the needle. And Martha said she sat there and studied that book and learned all the stitches, and that's how it got started. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, I had the tape recorder in my car, but on my way from the University of Mississippi, I was listening to some, um, I was preparing for my comprehensive exams, <laughs> so I was listening to some early 20th century poets. Where did Ann, Ann, I'm sorry, Ann, but I had to record over those poets. <laughs> I said, I've got to get this story because this might be my last opportunity. And so I asked Martha, I said, do you mind if I record this story? And, and she said, no, you just go right ahead. And so um, this is what she said. She said, I was, I was in the hospital, and she's thinking as she's talking, and she says, right. I was in the hospital, didn't have nothing to do but lay there and think about me being sick. And I learned myself. She said, a lady, girl, I can't think of that lady's name. I've been trying for years and years to think of that woman's name. I can't think of her name for nothing. Ooh, I can't think of that lady's name. I can see her face just as good, but I can't, but I can't think of her name. But anyway, uh, like I said, this so this art was born out of her, out of her sickness. Okay, skip over a page or two here. Um, and so within this story, she shares some other very compelling stories, such as how when she was nine years old. She had to get, she was facing death if she did not get a blood trans, transplant. And to hear her talk about how she got that transplant, uh, tra transfusion, a blood transfusion, how she got the transfusion on the plantation, 
she had a she she was of a rare blood type A B, and she said there was it was just difficult to find a match. So everybody on every black person on the plantation had to be tested, and finally uh, this one man. Uh, and then, let me see. This one man matched, but she said at first she says, "Uh huh," but nobody matched. She says, "Girl, I'm a, some kind of sick." And even when I was talking to her, she's moaning as she remembers her pain. She said, "Oh, honey, I was so sick that year." That year, and then they tested him, and so she was able to get the blood transfusion. And she says that at, at that time. If you got a blood transfusion, you had to find somebody who would donate that blood back. And, um, and I suppose that happened, but that's how she got the blood transfusion. She says, I said, well, who did it come from? She said it came from one of the straw bosses, managers or whatever. She says we called them straw, straw bosses back then, one of the managers. She says, he gave me a unit of blood. I will never forget that. He did now, though. But I'll never forget him for that. Sure did. And, and, and that's what she says. And then from that point on, then they started, if you need your blood, you could just get it. You know, without donating. But when I first got here, they had to donate the blood. Well, to make a long story short, Martha died in, on April 30th, 20. 11. And a year later, I had been thinking about transcribing this interview. I think I waited a year after she died because I didn't know where the tape was. I had moved several <laughs> times, but I knew I still had it. And after I transcribed it, I wanted to know more about her life. And that's when I started going to Minoa to visit her elderly aunt. The aunt must have been 78 then because she's 88 now. And so for 10 years, I've been going to Minoa to visit her aunt and to do things for her that she can't do for herself. So, Tennessee Williams. Martha lived on the, along the same road as at Burroughs House. That's how I got to learn. And so for reading about the Burroughs House, I read about the short story. 27 wagons full of cotton. So that's how I got to know the Barrow's house. And, um, and so now, every time I go and visit her aunt, Miss Virginia, uh, at first I was still recording uh, Martha's story. I was interviewing her, her aunt, Aunt Virginia. I think I've written about 100 pages now. And uh, I've accounted for just about every year of Martha's life. But every time I go to the house, I say, um, Miss Virginia, what's going on at the Burroughs house? And she'll say, I don't know. I ain't heard nothing. I ain't heard nothing. But I went there in December 2013, and she had something for me. I said, Miss Virginia, what's going on at the Burroughs house? And she said, well, Janet, that's what she called me, Janet. She said, I got something for you. She said, I saw this article, this, this story in the newspaper. This is dated Sunday, December 1st, 2013. It's about uh, some children, sixth grade students at Hayes Cooper in Marigold. Uh, they, you all would know Marigold, some of you from home of Po Monkey. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, these students from the school had gone to the Burroughs house to learn how to take pictures um, from different angles. And she saved this for me and was very glad to give it to me. But even now, when I go to her house, I greet her and I still say, Miss Virginia, what's going on in the Burroughs house? And she still say, I ain't heard nothing. <laughs> so when I, go, when I go through there, when I leave here, um, maybe Sunday, I will stop by there to see her and I'll ask again, what's going on at the Burroughs house? So I'm going to stop it there, but I will say this. Um, so that, that's how I got to know the Burroughs house and the story, 27 wagons full of cotton, and that has informed my presentation for tomorrow. Uh, because before those 27 wagons full of cotton, I said there were some cotton sacks. So I brought a display of, 
I don't know, six or seven cotton sacks that I've made quilted. And um, and I also have a wagon full of cotton, genuine cotton. Oh, and um, I will say one final thing about Martha, though. She always depended on the kindness of strangers. <laughs> uh, because she could, there was a lot she couldn't do for herself. So I'm just going to stop it there and talk a little about it. That, that's perfect. Uh, as we talk, like, this is a perfect introduction to how objects and people's stories uh, tell, tell about place and preserve the complexity within the history of place. Uh, if we go in and read a lot of geological facts uh, uh, about the mineral content of, of the soil of the delta, we might know something here, but when someone starts saying, once upon a time, there was people who did this, who did this, it starts to hit us here or in a way that, that, that changes uh, our heart. Uh, it, it, this is incredible about how these objects preserve memory and the story has a kind of history. Mr. Chow, one of my first experiences coming to Clarksdale uh, was coming across the tracks just up the road from the New Roxy. Someone says, this is the New World District. And I was at a time in my life where Clarksdale uh, felt like it's safe. I wasn't doing so well and people were so nice. My imagination was, uh, uh, was really well served. I felt really safe here. Uh, people were incredibly kind, but there was something about the land and the people that were very catalyzing to me. And that New World District uh, w was incredibly interesting to me. Uh, Mr. Chuck, could you tell us a little bit about the New World District here in Clarksdale and, and, and whose New World it might have been? Sure. The New World District is the uh, intersection of uh, 4th and Isquina, and um, there were three stores on the corner of 4th and Isquina. The Goon family, the Jew family, and uh, D and T uh, grocery, and uh, so there are three Chinese stores operating on one intersection in Mississippi, and uh, this was documented recently in the Merchants of Issaquina. It became a large anthology uh, to document the stories of the Merchants of Issaquina, and there's a story there about the Chinese family. So. When you talk about Clarksdale, uh, people think of it in terms of cotton and plantations, agriculture, they'll talk about Hobson, one of the first mechanical cotton picker, but um, Sally's grandfather settled in Marx over a hundred years ago. So the Chinese have been around for a long time, but um, it's probably the wrong way to say it. They don't get a lot of credit. <laughs> uh, but we're trying to preserve that heritage, the Chinese Heritage Museum that's located in Cleveland uh, in a partnership with Delta State to preserve the fact that Issaquina, the New World, was one of many Chinese uh, enterprises across the Delta. And uh, why the Delta and then why Mississippi? Uh, some of the stories say that they came to replace the slaves in the cotton fields. But I have not met one Chinese family that has ever worked the cotton fields. But uh, everyone that I know uh, for the past 80 years for me uh, has been in a grocery store. And so uh, these have uh, created a, a synergy in a sense that uh, these grocery stores were across the communities, uh, mostly in, in the small towns. When the demographics were different, uh, people didn't have transportation to go far to get their groceries, and they didn't have carts full of groceries. You got enough for the next day, or the day, or the next meal. And so the grocery stores had to be convenient. So at one time there were 25 uh, Chinese grocery stores in Clarksdale, 50 in Greenville, probably 30 or 40 in Cleveland, and now uh, I think Clarkdale has maybe three, Cleveland has zero, um, maybe one or two in Greenville. But at one time they were part of the landscape of the Mississippi Delta, uh, along with the Lebanese grocers, some of the Italians, even um, the uh, Greeks um, were immigrants that came and settled and uh, made their way through the Delta and now uh, people are, are um, still here, uh, the, the Jewish people, uh, 
uh, just uh, have been a part of the community and have contributed to the community in so many different ways. Uh, but we, we uh, now see where, like our own children, have gone to uh, Memphis or uh, Jackson or other places. So we don't have that, but um, it's, it's an important part of the culture here and uh, still contributing. Uh, so uh, instead of uh, 500 Chinese, uh, we probably have about 100, and you might be split uh, half immigrants that have uh, are not even a generation away from the settlers that came from China, and those like Sally and our grandchildren are five generations deep in the Mississippi Delta. So uh, in answer to your question, the new world, um, one store is demolished on, in, in the New World on 4th and Queen. One store is still there, and the other is still there as a, um, as a flower shop. Um, but uh, the goods is still there, and that's a tragic story. Uh, Davis was shot and killed in front of this store, and, but uh, his perpetrators were caught uh, the next day. But uh, so the life of the Chinese has have been um, really diverse in that uh, there are great success stories. I was telling Janice about uh, one of the child children out of Shelby uh, runs a uh, corporation that's uh, bigger than Clarksdale. <laughs> but, um, uh, but the other children are quite successful, but none of them uh, resettled in, in Shelby. Uh, all of them are in um, California, Miami, uh, and, uh, and, and maybe Virginia. But uh, Clarksdale has spawned its share of uh, successful people uh, of, uh, of Chinese descent. Uh, Mr. Chow, you bring up a really interesting question, uh, I, I, uh, thought, an idea of people from a place and then why or how or what would they leave? Uh, Deborah Levayana, you, you talked a lot about uh, people born here and then either participated in the Great Migration or the mi Migration of their own. This would be a question for the panel to bring both the uh, Blue City Culture Center and everyone in. Um, like the river that is flowing, what, uh, what stories or experiences, opportunities uh, may be bringing immigrants uh, to this area? Uh, may see this as a land of opportunity, uh, different wherever there may be less opportunity in other places. And then the inverse of that, what to, uh, what are the obstacles that are making people say, I have to go find someplace else to tell my story, to make my story? Either the, the people that you've met, the histories that you've studied, or, or, or the listing in, in the projects that you've created with Memphis. So what, what brings people here, and, and what often uh, may lead them uh, to, to find a new home? Well, I'd just like to comment on uh, Mr. Uh, comments about you know, the Chinese in the neighborhoods. And, and I remember in Big Hampton, we had Chu's grocery store. And right across the street from that was an Italian grocery mm -hmm. store. And I said grocery store, but they were small stores. And then when I moved into my other neighborhood where Tennessee Wheels, the house where Tennessee Wheels did his first play in the Glenview area, we had Joe Hong's uh, Chinese store on my street. And uh, we, we got to know the home very well. As a matter of fact, uh, when we moved and, and Mr. Hong had died, I was in, I don't know if you remember this store called Zares. Anybody remember Zares? <laughs> anyway, I had gone to Zares and my parents would call my nickname was Brother, but we came from Bay Brother, Bay Brother to Bay Brother to Brother. Okay. <laughs> so I remember going into Zares once and I saw Mr. Hong. I said, Miss Hong. You don't remember me, but you might not remember. She said, brother! <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and then we hugged each other and all, but uh, it's just kind of a close-knit feeling because the people in the community <coughs> were like that at one time. And uh, and then the house in the Bing Hampton area that we lived in, I went by one day just to see it, and there was an Asian family standing in the house. And there was a certain, in the, this area called Bing Hampton, a certain, uh, gentrification going on, but it's like a pre-gentrification. And uh, in that house, again, we had an Asian family. And so it just, place, a sense of place is 
interesting because there, the people who are there now will see a totally different perspective of the neighborhood than I saw. But I would love to get together just talk to them. What did you see? What did, what did you see when you were there? Because those kinds of relationships, I don't think we have enough of to, to, to move both parties along. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's so funny because we were just talking and um, in the, was it the late ninth, yeah. 1990 yeah. or so, we had gone to a workshop, um, w well, it's uh, called Performance <coughs> Arts. It was a conference where you could bring people, uh, artists together. And Memphis had this Chinese exhibit, huge exhibit. And uh, we saw a dance troupe there called Chin yeah, and Dancers out of New York. And we brought them to Memphis yeah. because we wanted to see what did the African American community and the Chinese community have in common? And so we worked together with them and also the National Civil Rights Museum to do what are the myths, the fairy tales, the stories that we all share. And uh, it was quite an experience because one, we had to cross that cultural uh, divide that we have Yet still, as human beings, we had such a closeness. And again, it was for us as African American artists to open up even more about what it is that we do and say and feel, and that we find out that we are closer than what we think. Uh, but at the same time, that's what that's what artists do. That's what art does for each community because it allows us to say, this is how I see it, without it being a negative or without it being attacked because we are different. How we view, what we see, but it is so important that we have the opportunity, each community has an opportunity to see the world from the eyes in which we see it and it is uh, not only allowed, but it is appreciated. Because the, the, what we saw today, what we did today with the three artists, um, Indisha May Holland, Richard Wright, and Etheridge Knight, are all African American artists from different time periods. But at the same time, our story has to be told and it has to be given the um, same level of accomplishment and appreciation as a Tennessee Williams. Because they are. They are artists who have a perspective about a place. And that place is different for how I see it, how you see it. And, and I also teach speech. I tell my and how you see. I'm a mother of three children and I have a favorite daughter. <laughs> My only daughter, because I have three granddaughters. I keep telling her that. <laughs> They're granddaughters. She, she's just my daughter. <laughs> Two sons. I, I would like to say, too, um, going back to Chen and Dancing, right now to Memphis, we also had the great fortune, I'd say great fortune, to have a piece called Rising Fawn and the Fire Mystery. And it was based on a Choctaw story written by Mary Lou Awiakta from Memphis, uh, who's Native American, grew up in, in Knoxville. And so we got together with Mary Lou and said, Mary Lou, we want to put this children's book on as a children's play. And, she, and we said, we want to use Native Americans, European Americans, and African Americans in it. And she said, well, the largest Native American community Tennessee is in Ripley, Tennessee. And so we got in the car and we went to Ripley, Tennessee. And we got Native Americans from Ripley, African Americans from Memphis, European Americans from Memphis, and we were all in the play of Fire uh, uh, Rising Fund and Fire Mystery. And, we, and it was great because uh, we met some people from Chuckalissa, the Gothic Indian village in, in Memphis, and we were able to use some of those folks to work with us and put on a uh, uh, workshops after the play. So yeah, we've been doing this kind of stuff for a while. And, and now we've turned it over to our daughter. <laughs> uh, we're not retired, we're just, I started this, 
I did. No, no but, this time. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to get into theater because I wanted to perform, and then I didn't know you had to raise money. And I, <laughs> I raised one five hundred dollars, and I said, "Okay." And they said, "Oh no, no, no! You got to keep doing this." <laughs> I said, "No, I want to be an artist." This, this is perfect. This idea of the stories that are not being told. Uh, we spent a lot of time telling these stories. What questions may you have for our panel about those stories not being told? Intellectual curiosity is, is a comparable muscle to a, a, an emotional or imaginative empathy. They're very similar because they make us curious or want to know about someone's uh, experience, to examine that and try to get beyond our own understanding and understand them. What questions may you have about the stories that are not being told, particularly of these diverse experiences that Delta? Yes. Was uh, Tennessee Williams exposed to uh, the phenomenon of the New World District when he lived here, and did, did his experience with that reflect itself in any of his works? The question is, was Tennessee Williams uh, exposed to the phenomenon of the New World District? Uh, if anyone has something they, they know, Mr. Chow, do you know much about Tennessee Williams and the New World District? Well. <clears throat> You know, I've been thinking about that over the past uh, couple of weeks. And, um, you know, as a young man in the community, and if you know where he lived, uh, we know that there were Chinese in the, uh, in, in the area. Uh, there's a tombstone in the Grain Cemetery that says Pang. And uh, a uh, visiting writer saw the tombstone and looked up Pang in the phone book and said, uh, and so they called Uncle Pat. <laughs> and Uncle Pat said, uh, he thought about it a moment, and it wasn't a pang that we knew, but he said, well, I'll be, <laughs> my granddaddy made that tombstone. He carved it out of a turnip, put it in an apple crate in verse, and molded a cement tombstone, and it's there to this day that says pang. So, was he exposed? The size of the town tells you that it was not huge. It's not a booming metropolis. So he had to be exposed to these other cultures to the point, you know, as an inquisitive, observant young man, because, you know, obvious in his stories that uh, I think he was exposed, not definitively, but just living in Clarksdale, knowing the population, that he had to be exposed, and I think the diversity in his writings uh, exhibit that. That's just a, an observation on my part, <laughs> not a scholarly work, uh, of course. Thank you very much, Mr. Chow. Excellent question. Uh, uh, other questions about stories that might not be told that we, we, we could spend time listening to today? Our curiosity. Yes. Uh, so you all have been married 43 years, but you've been doing this 42. So it's like, did you have this plan? To do this <laughs> Great. So the question was, uh, <laughs> Frank just talked about being married for uh, 43 years and then in business for 42 uh, years as arts maker. So could you tell us a little bit about the plan? <laughs> uh, uh, what was the need and what was the story that needed to be told? It would be great to hear about how it's continuing, the next steps of the lake. Well, when I got out of college, the year after I got out, some friends of mine and I decided we wanted to start a theater company because we weren't seeing enough about ourselves, the diversity of African-American culture. We saw the butlers, we saw the maids, but we didn't see anything else. We didn't see the, the doctors, the lawyers, the sanitation workers, the other people. So we decided to start our own theater company. And that's what we did. There were six of us, there were only three of us left. One is in New York, she eventually went into banking. Myself and a friend who was in Texas, he's a, a community college instructor. So we did that, and then out of that organization, which my wife became a part of too, when she came down, we started Blue City Cultural Center, which we started like two years after Bill Street Repertory Company. Well, Bill Street Writers came out of Bill Street Repertory Company. We talked about Bill Street Writers here and when we met at the Richard so that's how we started. That's how we decided to do something about the way we were looked at and how we wanted to do something to just energize ourselves and our hearts and all. And at that time, we would pay you 
You don't have to pay us. We said, come on out and do something, we'll pay you. So thank you for inviting us out. But now, of course, it's a little bit different. And we sometimes joke about how people are today. And they want to get paid before they even walk through the door. And, and sometimes we said, it's three things. We always used to say, it's three things we have to watch for. People who come in and they want to work with us, they say, can I get a business card? Can I get business cards? Or people want to get paid. And I forget what the other one was. But we said, those people we don't want to hire. <laughs> they asked for a business that card. Was we don't. That was their application. That was their application. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we actually met through um, a Genius Award winner, uh, Lee Brewer, who had a theater company out of New York called Mabel Mind. And uh, he had done a program at Southwestern at the time, which is now Rhodes. And I had been accepted at American University. and. Usually they did another program, but this year that I was there, they brought Mabel Mai and uh, Lee Brewer. And I, I totally, I, I hated DC. Mm -hmm. I hated it. And I, I, I said, but I, I want to do theater. And he said, well, there's this young guy that just started a theater company in Memphis. I'll call him up. And, and I always tell my students, I said, you know what? We did, um, what is this thing? Um, where you you find people online. Mm -hmm. So I, I found my husband I found my husband on the telephone. <laughs> I, I, I didn't I didn't even know what he looked like. Uh, but we started talking and we said, you know what? We want to write stories. I said, Levi. I said my, my mother uh, was a maid. My dad worked for the post office. And they had six children and I and they had ordinary lives, and they loved each other. And I said, but we don't hear stories about that. And you guys said, yeah, my mom did. My, my mom's a hairdresser. I mean, she has her own salon, and my dad works for International, International Harvester. And he said, we don't hear stories about that. Why can't we? And you know, I was like, well, we'll just write our own. So I got on a plane, came to Memphis, and realized when I got off that I did not know what this man looked like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. Oh my goodness, what am I going to do? <laughs> but um, the year after we got married, we just, you know, the, the Bill Street wanted to go with the tried and the true. And I said, but we have a writer's group. We can, we need to tell our own story. And, uh, and so that's what we've done. And now, after 43 years, I hate it. and I told her, I said, you know what, Ayanna, what we want you to do is to now take it to the next place. Because we've taken it where we want to go. I just want to perform. That's, yeah. that's yeah, what I started. I always wanted to perform. So there you go, kiddo. <laughs> Segue. <laughs> Where I see it, as much as I did not want to be a part, um, <laughs> I was, I kicked and screamed, I went everywhere else, but it still ended me right back to what they do because I realized the work that they had started has always, I've always enjoyed. I love seeing people move to the next level. And as I see people move to the next level, as they're moving to the next level, so am I. So it's not that I am the one who gets ahead, we all get ahead. And the more I kept looking at it, and I went back through 42 years of work, that is, wow, is all I can say. And I, did, I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about the different artists, uh, different plays that I don't believe I would have been able to do any other time, or would have wanted to. But I realized that the work that Blue City Cultural Center does, that my parents have done, has always been about the people. No matter who you are or what you are, but you all have a talent. And through that, I said, you know what? We're going to go back to what we do and what we do well, because I think we got out there, got so, to this thing where you get so big that you kind of get lost in the, in the shuffle. And I'm like, no, let's come back to what we do and what we do well. Let's be right here with the people, one-on-one, -on -one, that we can actually put hands on you, touch you, 
and the small, <laughs> intimate things that we do, and we do that extremely well. And that is collecting those stories and turning those productions into a play. And as I'm going through different fellowships and learning more about how to become an executive director, how to move this organization so that we are not left behind, but because I believe we had always been ahead of the game, and now we're right where we need to be, and that is restructure ourselves. And again, that's going back to being small, intimate, to be right here with the people, and that we work together and showing our talents together. But I'm learning that we have to put the power behind our own words. And if we don't do it, no one else will. And through that process, I said, well, ding, ding, ding. Let me get my PhD in this whole process because I believe that the work that they're doing, they, people should be able to research it and see that you too can also do this. So it is about lifting up our voice. It is about telling our stories. It is about sharing those with others, but also teaching people who we most of the time either feel have no hope or forgotten about because you're known as a thug or you are just, um, you're, you're homeless and you can't do it or because of the mental illness or the violence, but there is a talent and if you find it and you hone in on somebody's talent and find their strengths and develop those weaknesses, then we all come together and work together and move forward together. And that not only brings together a good Person, it builds the community, it builds the city, which then turns into the state and into the world. So that's how I feel that. I think a lot when you ask the question, why do people leave their city or their place to tell their stories? Sometimes we get lost in our own space, but as we move out sometimes that other people can learn, and as they learn the stories, if they're in New York or Paris or Chicago, they're like, well, let me go back to the Delta and see where this is and what it is. And now they come back to see it. So their stories are being shared with others around the world. And the good thing about streaming and the Zoom, that now we are connecting with people across countries, continents, everywhere, that they are able to now share the stories we can share our stories with each other. And I just believe if we do that, that's what we do and do well. And allow young people, homeless, um, prisoners, be able to share and hone in on their own talents. We have time for one, uh, one or two more questions. Yes. This is for Mr. Child. Um, when uh, you mentioned about um, uh, no Chinese uh, in the cotton field, I've never, um, I mean, picking cotton. Now, I've never uh, thought of Chinese picking cotton uh, here or anywhere else. I always thought of them being merchants and how enterprising that was that you come to a place that is that the competition is not so great. Right? Because you know there are northern states and, and uh, western states, but this is what I uh, haven't found uh, Chinese in the Delta. I wanted to uh, ask a question about what position they may, might have found themselves during the civil rights movement as merchants. What threat that was? Well, it was different in each community. Uh, the biggest uh, impact was the boycotts. Mm -hmm. So uh, people were asked to boycott stores uh, across the whole community. So in some communities that included the Chinese stores, but in other communities it didn't include the Chinese stores. So some did very well because in order to boycott one store you still got to get your bread and milk somewhere. So you went to the Chinese store. So in some communities they thrived and other uh, they were impacted. But uh, Chinese uh, were a uh, social and an economic group. Uh, and uh, people ask you, where were you during, during uh, all of this? And uh, sad to say, uh, I was in school at Mississippi State when James Meredith settled Ole Miss. And there were people that said, 
oh, we're going up to Oxford because we're going to get those folks and others, myself included, I got to take care of this test I have tomorrow. <laughs> and I remained a student and I was not an activist. And uh, I think that's a choice that everybody has to make in their own lives of how do you choose to impact the world? What are you going to be somebody that that gets out there with a picket sign and um, protests something, or are you going to be somebody that just goes about your life? Um, you know, I think about uh, the uh, Mississippi Two Museums and the Civil Rights Museum uh, when at the grand opening. I was there, and the president was there, and uh, there were a group of protesters. And the next day, I saw in the paper where the opening of the museum was marred by these uh, uh, activists, and they got all the press. Mm -hmm. The museum got little press. Mm -hmm. They didn't talk about the museum and what it represented. They just talked about the people protesting uh, the president being there. And so, uh, you know, again, these are personal choices. Some people came in and made it to do and got all the ink. And to me, it detracted from the opening of this wonderful museum that uh, everybody needs to go see. But um, so answering your question, Ms. Blue, uh, um, everybody was impacted differently, but I don't think there was a, um, a specific group that said that we've got to uh, fix these rights. Uh, in a manner of speaking, they were taking care of business. They took care of their own businesses and, and did what they had to do. Uh, so uh, certainly they were impacted. There were people that, that did participate and help, and others just went about their business uh, every day. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Time for one more. Great. Well, if if, uh, if you if you have a question or one shows up in the next 24 hours, mm -hmm. we'll be lucky enough to have Dr. Mm -hmm. Coleman and Gilroy presenting tomorrow afternoon, so you have a chance to talk there, or we'll have some time before our next presentations this afternoon. But to the panel, um, when we've been talking about the diversity of experience at the Delta, and we started off with stories and listening. And that, that theme has ran through. It's about listening to these stories, particularly the stories that are not being told. Um, in your own work and in your own experiences, uh, what do you think that the stories that must be told about the Delta, either the past, our present, or present, are going for that are going to be really important to, to know, either to learn from or to aspire to work? I'll say for as you're listening, I don't think you can go, I think the history still needs to be told because it needs to be passed on to the next generation. But we also need to know what's going on in today's time and what's happening right now. But also at the same time with those being tied together that we know how our future will come out and where do, where do people want to see their community, their places, or their stories to be shared for the future. So I think from, as I look at it, it should all be tied together. And I think one important thing um, needs to happen is this idea of intergenerational storytelling, where elders get an opportunity to give the history and young people get an opportunity to then translate that. Uh, into what needs to happen. It's funny because one of the young um, performers in the piece that we did had never heard of Etheridge Knight, and Adisha Mayhala, or Richard Wright. So we're saying, you, you have to know your history. You have to know a little bit about who you are. And with things like Ancestry and uh, Ancestry.com and 23andMe that we begin to see, particularly as African Americans, that a lot of our history, our story is just not there. Um, I have a friend who is an urban anthropologist, and she said that uh, basically we, we were numbered. You know, we were, we were like cattle. 
Um, and uh, so we have to dig so far back to, to find that story. But at the same time, young people do need to know. They need to know it so that we have a perspective of where that is and then where to take it. That it doesn't matter what your history is, that you didn't get here by yourself that there were things that immigrants came over, some forced, not by choice, some came by choice. But the thing is, is that you're not here because of what you did, you're here because somebody laid a foundation for you. And I think more than anything else, that that history must be told. And it has to be told within families. And then it goes out because it's those personal stories that help us to grow and we see where we are and where we can go. The psychologist they have a test they give, it's called an HTP, house, tree, person. Based on how you drive that house, that tree, and that person, if you go along with the, the, the another, maybe some background information about you, psychologists claim that they can tell something about you. If the tree has a knot hole, ooh, that's sexual. Um, <laughs> if the house does not have any windows, that's something. If the uh, person does not have a, a, eyes are shut, that tells something else. And so I look at it in a very simple way. What we have to do is go back to those very basic things and talk about those, those people, those places, the house, you know, and those things which tell something about you. And I, I, I'm looking at Tennessee Williams' show last night, and I saw that, you know, uh, and I saw those places, I saw those things, and I said, man, these whole stories are, build, are built around these things, these objects, these people. And when you put them all together, they tell a, a composite story. There's a, I can't remember his name, he wrote a book about art. What is art? that art is a, must have unity, complexity, and intensity. And when I looked at Tennessee Williams, I thought, it has it. And so once we tell these stories about these people, these places, and these things with unity, complexity, and intensity, then I think we hit on all those cylinders and we'll run like we should. Amen. Wow. I, think, I think when we tell stories, we both well, we have to emphasize is how our place shapes us. Uh, sometimes when people see my contacts, and I'm talking about other African Americans, they are reacting one way or another. There's a girl, you ought to be tired of those fields and picking cotton and all of that stuff. And I would say that was my background. But for me, it wasn't a place of, um, of pain. Um, it wasn't much hard work. Uh, we were in our parents' fields, and uh, I, my older brothers were usually the, super, the supervisor. We had a lot of hired help. We would be out there telling stories, holding dances. <laughs> when I was a little girl, we were building playhouses in the sand. It wasn't a bad place for us. It was a, it was a social place. That's where everybody was. But other people think, I don't know why you're still making cock sex. You are retired. <laughs> that, that's my background. I can't get away from it. I don't want to recreate a skyscraper. That's not part of my background. But I can reimagine the cotton sack in a variety of ways. That's the thing. Yeah. I think all these uh, reflect on us as individuals that where we were where we are and where are we going. And so you have to spend time with each to determine a good future and outcome for yourself. Um, because uh, in the back of the store is not so bad because that's what you know. But then if you start out in a, in a, in a home, what do you want for your children? A nicer home. And so, uh, so it is with every individual. You, you have choices to make, and, and uh, hopefully uh, you'll make uh, good choices, and things will turn out right for you. But you've got to know where you came from to know where you're going. And I think that's what uh, we're all seeing to some degree. 
thank you so much to our experts for your, your stories and your insight and for you, uh, all of your questions. Uh, let's please give them a round of applause. <laughs> We'll be back at 3.45 uh, for our next presentation, so feel free to get outside and enjoy some fresh air. Uh, it looks like it might not rain for a while, but it was sunny and raining about 30 minutes ago, so we'll see what happens. Thank you so much. We'll see you at 3.45. is by Dr. Paige McGinley, Associate Professor of Performing Arts and American Culture Studies at Washington University in St. Louis with local blues musician Lucia Spiller. Dr. McGinley is the author of the award-winning Staging the Blues from Tent Shows to Tourism and shares her research discoveries about the 1955 Broadway premiere of Tennessee Williams' Cat on the Hot Tin Roof and the substantial but little acknowledged stage roles of Piedmont blues musicians Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee. Now, local favorite blues guitarist Lucia Spiller will be playing during the presentation on the video that we're about to watch, uh, and offers his interpretation of several of the plays, Cat on the Hot Tin Roof's original songs, and invites listeners to consider how music might serve as a companion or counterpoint to onstage action. Hello, uh, my name is Paige McGinley. Uh, I'm so happy to be part of this event. Um, I hope the festival so far has been uh, a rewarding experience uh, for each of you. Uh, I really wish I could be with you in person, but I'm so, so grateful to Matt Foss and Jen Waller um, for all the energy and creativity they've put into making it possible for me to participate um, and their teams as well. I know there's a whole uh, world of people behind the scenes here. Uh, and I'm especially grateful to my collaborator in this presentation, Lucia Spiller, uh, whose music uh, you likely already know um, and will uh, be hearing more of throughout the festival. I noticed uh, in looking at the uh, online program that you had an earlier panel uh, dedicated to the poetry of place. Um, and uh, rather than just existing in the no place of Zoom, uh, I wanted to take a minute to reflect on the ways uh, our various places are linked. Um, both by Tennessee Williams uh, and in other ways. Uh, and this is something that I'll return to um, as, as we explore the role of blues and folk singing um, in developing a, a theatrical sense of place in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Um, so I'm recording today uh, uh, in uh, Washington. Well, I'm not at Washington University. I'm in my home office uh, in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, just a few miles from the confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. Um, so St. Louis is a city where lots of migrants from the Mississippi Delta region um, made their homes uh, in the first half of the 20th century and, and continue to. Um, and our region, St. Louis and the Mississippi Delta, um, you know, our shared history is a pre-Columbian one as well, right? We're the sort of Northern and southernmost edges uh, of the Middle Mississippian peoples of pre-Columbian times. Um, just over uh, the river that way from me is uh, Cahokia, uh, the first and largest city in North America, uh, a city that at its peak in 1100 CE was larger than London. Um, and at this time of year, especially as the migratory birds are making their journeys, uh, I'm also very much reminded um, that we're connected along the Mississippi Flyway. Um, and of course, uh, St. Louis and the Delta are both hugely significant places uh, in the life of Tennessee Williams. Uh, he moved to St. Louis uh, as a young child, uh, famously despised it. Uh, he, he named it St. Pollution, uh, was his name for St. Louis. Um, and many of you probably already know uh, that the Glass Menagerie uh, is, is set uh, in St. Louis, uh, the International Shoe Factory uh, still stands downtown. Uh, you can visit it here. Um, and then, you know, uh, Williams left St. Louis, but he could never really leave, right? He was uh, involuntarily committed to the psychiatric ward uh, at Barnes Hospital uh, by his brother in 1969. He died here uh, and against his wishes uh, is buried here. Uh, so, so, and important but often tragic place in the life of Williams. 
Um, and if you're interested in learning more about Williams and St. Louis, um, and so um, I was invited today to share with you some of my research on the 1955 uh, Broadway premiere Had on a Hot um, and uh, I'm really thrilled to be in collaboration uh, with Lucia Spiller. Hear um, some music uh, from Lucius a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but I want to let you know just a little bit um, about my work and what led me to Williams so you have a sense of where I'm coming from uh, with this research. So um, I have a, a degree in theater and performance studies. I teach in a theater and performance studies department at WashU. Um, I, I don't necessarily consider myself a Williams scholar, uh, but when I was writing my first book, um, which is called Staging the Blues, I found that I just like could not get away from Williams. It was like, he was following me <laughs> through the process or I was following him or we just kept colliding um, in all of these different ways. Um, uh, so the book is, a, is about the theater history of blues, right? Blues on popular entertainment and variety stages uh, throughout the 20th century um, from tent shows to the blues and folk revival to blues tourist economies uh, at the end of the 20th century and into the 21st. Uh, so in the course of my research, I've spent a lot of time in Clarksdale um, thinking about um, blues tourism. Um, and it was at that point that I learned about William's history in Clarksdale um, and became really attentive to the way the Delta, um, a multiracial, multi-ethnic Delta shows up in many of his plays. Um, I was also writing about the Blues and Gospel Train, um, which is a blues and folk tour. Um, uh, in the 1960s, uh, which featured lots of blues stars um, that you may know of, including Muddy Waters, Sonny Terry, Brownie McGee, Sister Rosetta Tharp, who gives an amazing performance. Um, and I learned while researching that tour that Terry and McGee, um, who were a very widely known um, blues guitar and harmonica duo, um, and they were hugely popular in the blues revival, had been in the original cast of the musical Finian's Rainbow um, and Tennessee Williams' Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. And I found this really interesting and fascinating and I sort of filed it away for another day. Um, so after the book was published, uh, I, I kept coming back to this question. As I was thinking about Cat on a Hot Tin Roof and I just couldn't make sense of it. I thought, what roles did they play? Like, what does it mean? that they were in this original Broadway cast. Um, so uh, to, my, to my bookshelf I went, this is where I have my visual aid part of the presentation. I, I consulted, uh, you may have a copy of this, right? This is uh, the New Directions uh, uh, publication of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, uh, copyright 1974. Obviously this is a newer print than that. Um, but this is the 1974 edition of the play. Um, Williams was famously known for making substantial revisions to lots of his plays after they premiered, oftentimes even after they were published. Um, and the 1974 edition um, is, is considered by a lot of scholars to be the definitive one. Um, and it's also the one um, that circulates really widely. Right, so it's the, the version of the play that's assigned um, in uh, college courses, right? It's the version of the play, almost always, it's the version that gets revived when a revival is performed. Um, so, so when you think Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, um, you may be thinking of this 1974 version, I was. Uh, but I quickly realized um, that this, uh, script here is not reflective um, of the original production, the Broadway premiere in 1955. Um, and this is like one of the, you know, sort of great uh, dilemmas of, of the theater scholar, right? Uh, to realize that there is no authoritative version necessarily, um, uh, but there are different versions. And the Broadway premiere in 1955 was a very different version um, than the one that most of us are 
um, reading and seeing on stages today. Um, so I set out to find out what I could um, about that famous production in 1955, um, which won that year um, uh, the play did. So uh, I, I, I went to the archives uh, as, as I do as a historian, the New York Public Library and the Harry Ransom Center uh, at UT Austin. They have a wealth of materials related uh, to this production. Uh, which is well known uh, for its famous and uh, famously difficult uh, collaboration between Williams, uh, the director Ilya Kazan, uh, and the designer uh, Joe Milziner. Uh, so uh, with the help of a research assistant, I discovered um, the rehearsal and production scripts of the play. So the scripts that um, the actors and the director and the designers were working with on a day-to-day -day basis throughout rehearsal. Um, these have uh, a lot of handwritten notes and annotations from Kazan, the director, which gives us some insight into um, what he was thinking and what he wanted the production to be. So uh, this was an amazing find. And, and when you compare um, that production script with Kazan's notes um, and cuts and additions um, with the uh, published version, um, there are some major, major differences. Um, uh, one is, uh, and I'm not gonna talk a lot about this, but it's just really interesting. Um, in act three, uh, there's a thunderstorm. And in the published version, the thunderstorm uh, is just sort of in the distance, uh, the stage directions say things like, distant thunder and characters you know, sort of look out the window and comment about how windy it is. Um, but it's really just a backdrop to the action that's happening on stage. Um, and uh, in the 1955 production, the thunderstorm was this huge uh, theatrical special effect. And there are pages of stage direction is about the thunder and the lightning. Um, and all of this is um, part of the huge argument that is happening between this wealthy white Mississippi Delta family, the Pollitts, over who will inherit the estate uh, when Big Daddy uh, dies of cancer, which we know he's going to do. And of course, the big problem uh, is that uh, Brick, uh, his son Brick is in love uh, and is mourning the death of his love skipper uh, his fellow teammate and his wife, Maggie, uh, is, is unable to interest him sexually, right? And they cannot have a child. And so who will receive the estate? Will it be Brick and Maggie? Will it be uh, May and Gooper? Uh, and so there's the storm, right? Which is like the symbolism is really obvious. <laughs> um, and that's very much lightened up um, in, the, in the published version. So that's, a, you know, that was an interesting thing that I noticed. Um, but for the sake of what we're talking about today, um, and this helped answer my question about Terry and McGee. In the production script from 1955, there are five black characters who are named. There are only two black characters named in this 1974 script. Um, many of the stage directions detailing the activities of those black characters are eliminated in New Direction. And the production script also has songs interspersed throughout the play, most of which are also eliminated in New Directions. Uh, so if you go by this script, which many people do, um, you get something that Williams approved of, but it's a very, very poor approximation of what the Broadway premiere was actually like, um, in large part because the Black characters that were so central to the world of the play become really minimized as bit parts. Um, and in the, this edition that circulates, they really are bit parts. Um, but their role was so much larger in 1955. Um, so who were these performers? What did they do on stage? Um, what are the consequences of their contributions being um, minimized um, or even erased, um, as I think happens? when we um, rely too heavily on this 1974 version. Uh, okay, so who were some of these performers? Uh, the, uh, 
the white audience at first, I mean, I think one thing is important to recognize that the New York theater world in the 1950s um, is, is still large, largely segregated. Um, and so the white audiences um, attending Cat on a Hot Tin Roof um, certainly recognize many of the play's white stars. Burl Ives playing Big Daddy, um, Barbara Bel Geddes uh, as Maggie the Cat, Elizabeth Taylor, of course, would famously take this role in the film, um, Ben Gazzara um, playing Brick, uh, a role taken up by Paul Newman in the film, um, uh, and, and the Black performers, Maxwell Glanville, Musa Williams, Eva Von Smith, uh, and Brownie McGee and Sonny Terry, um, these five performers are rarely mentioned in the mainstream press around the event. Um, so critics of the time, you know, the sort of preeminent critics of the New York Times, at the Nation, um, they don't mention these performers. Um, but if you look uh, at, the, at the Black newspapers, um, the Chicago Defender, for example, they're publishing profiles of these Black performers because most of them are really well known among Black audiences. Um, and most of them were known um, for their musical talents, right? So I've already mentioned Terry and McGee as this really famous guitar and harmonica duo. Um, Musa Williams made her name in musicals and operas. Um, she had appeared in Porgy and Bess um, and the John Henry opera with Paul Robeson. Um, Smith uh, was also uh, in John Henry. She was a member of the Eva Jesse Choir, which was very famous. Um, and Maxwell Glanville, who was uh, a member of the Board of Governors of the American Negro Theater. So, so these five performers um, were, were stars in their, in their world. Um, and, uh, and they are um, bringing that artistry to Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Um, so, so let's talk about the music. What was the music in the Broadway premiere of Cat? Um, and then we'll talk about what that might have done, um, how it might have changed uh, the world of the play. Um, so there's a lot of singing, as I mentioned, in the Broadway premiere of Cat. Um, almost all of it uh, was done by these Black cast members. There are a couple of songs that are sung by the children. Um, if you have seen the film of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, uh, the singing of the children uh, is still present, so you, you have a sense of that. Um, and all of these Black characters are cast as servants of various types, right? They are servants on the Pollock's Mississippi Delta plantation. Um, and as the family uh, wrangles and schemes over who will secure Big Daddy's inheritance, um, the script shows us that these Black performers are constant presence on stage. Um, they're always there always doing something they're often singing and this provides a real counterpoint to uh, the story of the Pollock family. Uh, so William's scripts uh, often suggest live music, um, often blues and jazz. We see this in Streetcar, we see this in Summer and Smoke, um, but it seems as though the engine behind all of this music in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof was Ilya Kazan, the director. Um, he loved blues and jazz. Throughout his career, he returned again and again to questions of racial prejudice and the American South um, uh, you know, in his theater work and in his film work. Um, and so like many white liberals and leftists who came of age during the 30s and 40s, uh, Kazan's uh, I would say his sort of proletarian sympathies for the working class and his romantic attachment to black Southerners were really acutely and also problematically entwined, right? Kazan identified with black Americans. Um, he saw in them a reflection um, of his own experience as an immigrant outsider. Uh, and so this, um, this kind of, uh, I would say sort of romantic racialism was very common among white men of the beatnik generation, Norman Mailer, Jack Kerouac, others, right? And, and so we can see Kazan's sort of attachment to 
um, to the South and to Black people of the South in particular um, in firsthand accounts of a, of a trip through the South that he took um, in 1935. Um, he later claimed that he met Hudi Ledbetter, um, better known as Lead Belly, on that trip. Um, though, uh, if you look at where Lead Belly was that summer, it seems unlikely that he actually did. <laughs> it's unclear. Um, but what is definitely true is that he loved Lead Belly's music. Um, and who better to cast uh, in uh, the role uh, in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof than two of Lead Belly's protégés, um, Brownie McGee and Sonny Terry. Um, so I keep talking about uh, McGee and Terry and at, at this moment, uh, I'm going to pause and we're going to listen uh, to uh, a song of theirs, sometimes called Hootin' the Blues, sometimes called Whoopin' the Blues. Um, so you can get a sense of their sound. Um, and as we talk about Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, you can really um, keep the sound uh, in your mind. Sounds perfect. Tony, uh, insert link one here. And then we'll start back when you're ready, Paige. It's going great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, so um, now that you've heard McGee and Terry, um, I want to talk uh, a little bit more uh, and, and sort of prompt some questions for all of us about what did the music do in the world of this play? Uh, and so if we think of this really elaborate um, and quite complete sound score that McGee and Terry and the other performers offered, um, how, does that, how does that impact uh, the story that's being told on stage? Um, we'll get into some listening here too um, uh, of, of Lucius's uh, interpretations of some of these songs. Um, so there are kind of two separate questions here, right? What did Kazan think the music was going to do? And then what did the musicians do with the music, right? So the making of a theatrical event is always a collaboration. Uh, and so you have a lot of people, some of them may have different agendas, right? Um, involved in making the work together. Uh, and in a feature story um, on these black performers in the Chicago Defender, um, the, the performers described how they were suggesting the musical choices to Kazan. So they were choosing the songs. Um, they were full collaborators in this rehearsal process. Um, notably, you know, there was no musical director assigned to this production um, as, as there had been, for example, in the premiere of Streetcar, um, which also used a lot of music. That had a musical director. Uh, in the case of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, these performers were, in a sense, the musical directors of the piece. Um, and so my sense here is that Kazan um, had a kind of romantic attachment, as we've said, but also limited understanding of African-American musical traditions. Uh, but the power of the performers really broke open the play in a new way. And they help us see uh, the wealthy white people um, fighting over this estate uh, in, a new, in a new way. And part of the way that they did this uh, was by making opportunities for their own artistry. Um, so so one, of, uh, one of the pieces that they suggested um, and included in the performance uh, was a song, an African-American spiritual called, I Just Can't Stay Here By Myself. Um, and this had been made famous um, by the Hall Johnson Choir. Um, it was well known. Um, and so at this moment, um, we're going to watch uh, a brief clip of Lucia Spiller, who's recorded a version of Walk With Me um, which is a spiritual um, that, uh, that has a good deal in common with I just can't stay here by myself. Um, I received these recordings um, this morning. I'm so excited to share them with you. Um, and before we watch, um, for those of you who are not in Clarksdale or familiar with Clarksdale, um, I wanna take a minute to explain, uh, Lucius is performing at the Shack Up Inn. So the Shack Up Inn, is a hotel 
uh, and uh, lodging and entertainment venue in Clarksdale um, that has, um, as you can see in the background, um, repurposed uh, old signage, um, agricultural equipment, um, and you know, somewhat troublingly, in in in, in my opinion, sharecroppers shacks, right? Sort of creating a kind of stage set uh, of a southern past, um, and uh, I, I mean, I think that the choices that Lucius is making here are really interesting, right? The American sign um, in the background um, to be performing in this venue, the flag shirt, right? Reminding us this is not just a southern past, right? This is an American past, and how does the performance of spirituals sort of root us down in the truth? Uh, of American history. Uh, and so uh, let's listen to this uh, wonderful performance of Walk With Me and talk a little bit more about some other songs. Great, and then uh, Tony will put in Walk With Me. And then Paige, there is a recording of uh, I Just Can't Be By Myself that Tony must not have uploaded this morning. Oh, so, no, I didn't see it. I just yeah. saw Walk With Me. So I figured it was a, just a... No, uh, yeah, Walk With Me was just him playing extra. I'm so sorry. So if you want to reference it, it it's it's very in the same sense. So we, can, we if you want, would you like to uh, um, talk about it unseen or would you prefer just to stay the course? I'm so sorry. Uh, no, 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 that's okay. Um, I, I can say, um, do you want me to go back and do that part again? Or no. I can just... Let's just play Walk With Me and then we can go write it uh, and then we can say, and then here's a, a, a second song I talk about from the show. How's that sound? Great. Great. Yeah. And then we can, then we can do, I just can't stay here by myself. Yeah. Let's do that. Great. Okay, great. great. So we'll just, we'll announce, I just can't stay here by myself here now. Uh, 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 I'll go back off. You can talk a little bit and introduce that and we'll take a second pause. Great. Sound good? Great. great. Thanks, great. Paige. Okay. Um, and now we are going to hear a recording uh, of I Just Can't Stay Here By Myself. Um, and I'll introduce this um, with uh, a, a quotation um, from W.E.B. Du Bois, um, one of the great thinkers on the spirituals, uh, which he called sorrow songs and the sifting of centuries. Uh, and I think what he has to say here um, uh, has uh, great relevance to our understanding of a play that is about the quarrel over land. Your country, how came it yours? Before the pilgrims landed, we were here. Here we have brought our three gifts and mingled them with yours, a gift of story and song soft, stirring melody in an ill-harmonized and unmelodious land. Let's listen to I Just Can't Stay Here By Myself. All right, we'll insert track three, Just Can't Stay Here By Myself. Great page, sorry for that confusion, that's my fault. All good. Great, okay, and, uh, and then we can go on here. Great. Three, two. So one of the things that's really striking about the music that was um, chosen for Cat on a Hot Tin Roof is that it was not contemporary, uh, right? These songs are old songs. The contemporary music of 1955 would be rhythm and blues, rock and roll, right? Um, but here we have um, spirituals, old folk songs, ballads. Um, and, and I think, you know, in many ways, this is a, a kind of familiar um, association of, uh, you know, Mississippi as being sort of out of time or of another time. Um, but audiences, of course, are very firmly rooted in 1955, as are the performers, right? And the music, I think, choosing these old songs um, shows us just how much the poets are trying to hold on to a way of life that's rapidly transforming. Um, so what is happening in 1955? Um, you know, it's it's a pretty remarkable period. Um, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof ran on Broadway for 20 months, uh, March 1955 to November 1956. Uh, and during these 20 months, uh, the Montgomery bus boycott 
was launched. Uh, Emmett Till was brutally murdered in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, ruled in uh, what came to be known as Brown II, uh, that school desegregation should be carried out uh, in their famous phrase, with all deliberate speed. Um, so all of these things are happening uh, off stage. Uh, and on stage, we see um, the white characters of Cat, right, who have grown wealthy and grown powerful on the ways um, of the old South, looking at this uncertain future, right? Big Daddy is dying of cancer. Brick and Maggie's childlessness is creating this crisis of succession. Um, and, and the inheritance of what they call 28,000 acres of the richest land this side of the Nile is really in question. Um, and so we have the song choices of Terry and McGee and their collaborators sort of reminding us um, that the Pollock's attempt to hold on to this old way of life can't be separated um, from the transformations of, of the post-war South. And so what I'm trying to get at here is this idea that music is acting as a kind of counterpoint to the story, right? Pointing out uh, perhaps what this family is unable or unwilling to see uh, about their, their lives and the future of Mississippi. Um, so uh, on that note, uh, let's move toward another song here. Um, another way that the music operates um, is by highlighting all the under and uncompensated labor um, that's required to generate the vast fortune of the Pollocks. Um, in the 1955 production script, um, I noted there were a lot of stage directions that get cut. Um, and a lot of those stage directions have to do with the work that the black characters are performing on stage. Um, the New Direction script and the 1958 film has um, this work kind of fade into the background, uh, but the 1955 production really shows that labor really out front, um, how, how much work is involved um, uh, as the servants set up the birthday party, as they protect the property against the storm. Um, and by putting that work really firmly out front, um, this highlights the leisure of the Pollocks, right? And the kind of work uh, that makes their leisure possible. Uh, and so uh, there is, there's one song in particular, there's two songs, but uh, the first uh, really highlights this uh, and shows uh, Terry and McGee kind of making this song their own. Um, and this song is called Pick a Bale of Cotton. Um, and Pick a Bale of Cotton is a song um, that has been um, and continues um, uh, to be used to uh, essentially excuse enslavement. Um, it has a, a kind of jaunty rhythm uh, that suggests uh, that uh, enslaved Black souls were content uh, with their lot, right? This, this song has a very uh, difficult history. But something really interesting happened um, with this song in the 1930s and 1940s and 1950s, uh, which is that Black folk performers took it back. Uh, and they began performing this song very regularly, creating all kinds of versions um, and turning it into an occasion to really showcase their virtuosity um, as each verse uh, for the sake of time, we, we'll show you a short clip here, um, but the performance of this song can go on and on. And as each verse goes on, the lyrics are sung faster and faster. The guitar picking gets more and more elaborate and difficult. Um, and it becomes an opportunity for the musician to show um, their, um, their excellence, right? Um, and so this song was a favorite uh, of uh, Hootie Ledbetter's, of Leadbelly's. Um, Terry and McGee regularly performed it in their concerts. They made a great recording of it. And now we're going to hear Lucia Spiller's interpretation. Oh, Lord, pick a bell of cotton, pick a bell of cotton all day long. Oh, Lord, pick a bell of cotton, pick a bell of cotton all day long. 
Jump down, turn around. Jump down, turn around. Pick the bell, got to jump down, turn around. All day long. Jump down, turn around. Pick the bell, got to jump down, turn around. All day long. Oh, Lord. Pick the bell, got to Pick the bell, got to All day long. Oh, Lord. Pick the bell, got to Pick the bell, got to All day long. Me and my woman go pick a bell, got to Pick a bell, got to All day long. Me and my woman go pick a bell, got to Okay, so one final song I want to share with you, um, and uh, this is sort of also on the on the topic of, of labor. Um, this is a song that was wildly uh, popular in uh, in the cabaret blues world of the 30s and 40s, uh, as well as the blues revival of the 1950s and 60s. Right, this is the world of uh, uh, the second half of of Lead Belly's career and of uh, Terry and McGee. Uh, and that song is John Henry. You may you may know this song um, uh, quite a bit. Uh, in the uh, production of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, um, John Henry is the very end of the play. Uh, it's the last moment. Um, the lyrics are are changed a little bit. Um, instead of saying John Henry, they say my buddy. Uh, but the story is the story of the American folk hero, John Henry. Uh, and uh, John Henry, uh, if you don't know uh, the sort of legend of John Henry, uh, he was uh, uh, an African-American steel driver. He was unbelievably fast, unbelievably strong. Uh, he was challenged to race uh, a steel drilling machine, um, a race he actually wins uh, due to his uh, superior uh, strength and speed. Uh, and then victorious, uh, he dies uh, with the hammer in his hand um, as a result of the, the strain on his body. Um, and so this song um, was sung and adapted um, by lots of labor and anti-racist activists and blues and folk singers um, for decades in the first half of the 20th century. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there was, there was an opera, John Henry, um, uh, uh, that Paul Robeson um, uh, uh, was the sort of prime uh, mover uh, on that opera uh, that some of the performers from Cat on a Hot Tin Roof also appeared in. Um, so, so like Pick a Bale of Cotton, this is one of those songs um, that um, sort of highlights um, both the incredible sort of physical um, and technical virtuosity of the steel driver, of the musician, um, but also the costs um, in a racist society that are, are, are paid. Um, so, you know, this is the song with which uh, uh, Terry and McGee sort of closed the premiere of Cat. Um, and so we'll listen to it now and then think about how that uh, might have changed that moment. Walk with me, Lord. Walk with me. Walk with me, Lord. Please walk with me. While I'm on. This tedious journey 
Walk with me, Lord, please. Walk with me. Hold my hand, Lord. Hold my hand, Lord, please hold my hand while I'm on this tedious journey. Hold my hand, Lord, please. Hold my hand. Mm -hmm. 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 While I'm on <laughs> this Jesus journey. Walk with me, Lord, please. Walk with me. So uh, the play ends not with the moment of Maggie attempting to seduce Brick. Uh, but the field hands and the servants singing the line, last words I heard that poor boy say, give me a cool drink of water for I die. Give me a cool drink of water for I die. So whose death are we talking about here, right? On the one hand, there's the impending death of Big Daddy. We know he has cancer. We know he's going to die. Um, but also the death, uh, of John Henry, the hero, also potentially the death of an old Southern way of life. Um, there's there there are many many layers of possibility here. I think when we um, when we imagine how John Henry might have sort of landed uh, on its 1955 audience and what it might have meant to its 1955 performers. So one of the complexities of of, of researching. Uh, you know, any historical event, um, including, uh, you know, a historical theatrical event, uh, is we have a, we, we often have no way of knowing exactly what people were thinking and why they made the choices that they did. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's quite rare that the historian will be able to sort of find, you know, uh, the, the, the diary, uh, you know, that says, this is exactly why I'm doing this thing. Um, and collaborations are complicated things. Um, and the collaboration of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof is often described as a collaboration between set designer, director, and playwright, Neil Zener, Williams, and Kazan. Um, but if we think about performers, um, and in the case of this presentation of these five black performers, Glanville, Smith, Terry, McGee, right, as full-fledged collaborators, uh, we begin to realize um, uh, that the style that Williams and Kazan are credited with, right? This is called the American style. Um, this is also African-American style and artistry. Um, and remembering these contributions, um, I would argue brings us closer to understanding uh, Williams uh, and his contribution to the American theater. And with that, uh, I would, uh, you know, sort of conclude my remarks and uh, would be happy to talk uh, with Matt, who will try to channel uh, your questions. Hi, Matt. Hi, Paige. Well, thank you so much. And because of the unique nature of this hybrid uh, in-person stream, I'll provide kind of the proxy for our audience, those who will be joining us here in Clarksdale and those who are watching from home. So first, thank you so much for your presentation. and. Uh, I'm really excited to have this conversation with you and, and for our audience. Now, as a theater maker, um, 
this discussion between the difference between the printed version of the script and these uh, uh, prompt books and production scripts. Uh, in, in my experience of looking at them the same, we go from the director's pencil uh, from these kind of living documents that are often really incomplete. They represent a lot of pre-work, but don't have a very good record of what was happening in the room. The, the, uh, the first ideas that are often the uh, not the best ideas that were discovered in that collaborative space you're talking about. And then when it moves into uh, print or press, a lot of those conversations uh, may either be uh, conserved in terms of the existing new stage directions or the blocking from the stage manager that can be a bit sterilized or curated based off of maybe Williams' decisions that once we move from the director's pencil back into his typewriter where he has more agency again as it moves away from a theatrical event uh, to uh, something that lives on the page again. Um, that discrepancy or transmission of ideas is, is really interesting. Have you found any other um, interesting trends or patterns, particularly with Williams and Kazan or these collaborations in the other plays, either in relationship to music or uh, maybe Williams' ideas once uh, he got back to the pages after the stage uh, production or the film production? Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's a great question and, and one that, um, uh, you know, sort of percolates through all kinds of theater historical research. Um, and, you know, again, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not arguing, oh, that the 1955 version is, is the authoritative version and we should all do it that way. Um, you know, I, I'm not, I, I'm rather than saying there's one version um, is to, is to just uh, destabilize a little bit our idea that this is the one, right. Um, and so, you know, Williams is really, is really wonderful to, to work with because he saved everything. And there, uh, the, the, there are so many drafts um, of so many of his works that, um, and a lot of these are held in the collection at the Harry Ransom Center, that one can really follow his thought process in, for example, you know, moving in the case of Cat from a story to a play and how that happens. Um, you know, the Kazan stuff is a little more incomplete. Um, and so uh, with with Kat, you can see some of Hill, but then you can see him change his mind, right? And he crosses it out. <laughs> or things that um, like literally like cut out with scissors and then like taped into a different part of the book. You know, this song is gonna go here now. Um, and then of course this, stage manager's prompt book is really useful because that's the sort of closest record we can find of what is actually happening on stage because they're the ones responsible for, for you know, calling the show. Yeah. Um, but we also see this happen, um, I think, uh, this sort of collaboration with Williams and Kazan in Streetcar as well. Um, and there's a kind of not identical but similar process where Kazan really wants to bring um, really amplify the role of blues and jazz in the premiere of Streetcar. Um, and I know this is something that you're working on in the, in the festival. Um, and so, you know, there are some really fascinating um, story. This is a really like technical problem for Kazan and Williams because Kazan wanted the music to be, um, uh, to be live, but distant, right? So, uh, so the solution for that is to have uh, the musicians actually in another room off stage, but but having that music then sort of piped in, um, you know, in uh, in a time when the sort of technological abilities to do that were a lot more limited than they are now. So anyway, you see that that Kazan is really interested in amplifying the musical dimension of of a lot of Williams' works, um, and the fact that it, it kind of drops out. I, you know, I don't know that that means that Williams didn't like that, but, um, uh, or that he just wanted to give directors, other directors, an opportunity to make their own choices about that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, Look, particularly with uh, one thing that people often don't understand that plays are so thin because they're, they're actually just the bones of an experience that we have to reanimate with our living, breathing text. Like, like you said, that the, um, the 
the, the cat on the hot tin roof that we're referring to was just the first, not the definitive. And unfortunately, that's a correlation in America that we often, this is how we're, it's supposed to do, uh, and it cuts us off that examination of what we could do. Looking at, 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 at streetcar, particularly with the very thin um, bones that we could re re animate with very contemporary gut, uh, guts and lungs and air that allows it to be the brief chronicle and abstract of our time, to hold up a mirror to, to, to our time and place. Uh, one of the questions we're exploring in the festival is what is the, the music of New Orleans now, mm -hmm. or America now, that can be in conversation with the unique nature of Elysian fields around the conversations of immigration, op economic opportunity or obstacles, um, in the same way where New Orleans at that time was a uh, catalyst and crucible for American ideas. It has been forever. Um, what would it mean to do a production of Streetcar now? And what music do we hear? Uh, do, does St. James Infirmary live next door to uh, Feel Like Funkin' It Up by Rebirth? Um, is, uh, it, it, it is something from... Um, you know, Danny Baker can live next to even Jimi Hendrix's Voodoo Child, these type of uh, uh, licks that in some ways that feels like the, the tension uh, and opportunity of storytelling that you're talking about. If you were getting to work on a dream collaboration of either Cat on a Hot Tin Roof or Glass Menagerie or, or, or Streetcar, are there, are there moments of musical storytelling that you would love to bring in the table or invite theater makers uh, to consider or, or musicians you'd like to bring to the, uh, into those rooms to see uh, in the same way that these musicians were truly collaborating, almost music directing inside the collaboration? What kind of storytelling do you think might be available or really worth uh, examining and challenging for our, our current American theater? Mm. Oh, this is fun. Um... Well, I mean, I think I, I've got to, I've got to go, you know, for the St. Louis team here, uh, and 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 think about Glass Menagerie. Uh, you know, I, I think that one of the interesting things about the Williams and Kazan collaboration um, is, you know, Williams, you know, sort of famously described his aesthetic as plastic theater, right? This that we would have the realism uh, of the social world, but but also the the one could be equally, if not more true um, to, to emotional experience um, by accessing some of these um, less realistic, more expressionistic or abstract images or ideas. Uh, and Kazan was always like rooting down in the social world. He was really, and if you think about his, his movies and the, and the things he did apart from Williams, you know, on the waterfront, right? He's always really about like the grittiness of the of the social world, um, and this sort of connects to some of his sort of proletarian leftist politics, right? So, so for him, I think the music was often about doing that, um, and and this question of like what kind of music would we want now, you know, doing these plays now. Um, I mean, I think with Glass Menagerie, I mean, St. Louis is like an incredibly musically interesting city um as a kind of you know i think the delta of course is you know they've, they've got the claim on the crossroads but but st louis is also a, a crossroads in many senses you know this place where uh you know the midwest uh meets the south where westward expansion and um sort of settler colonialism sort of meets black migration um and and immigration now and so you know there are um uh the sort of you know, St. Louis rap scene, um, but also the the um, music of the Balkans, right? That um, uh, is is huge in St. Louis because of our very large um, Bosnian immigrant population here. And so you can, um, I think, one of the things that um, you know in this, you know, Kazan Williams streetcar, right? Rooting down in a kind of multiracial, multi ethnic world, even if these white characters can't really see it, um, that the music makes that alive and makes that present um, is something that can still be really, you know, interesting to us, I think, as, as theater makers. That makes so much sense, too. And it seems embedded in the text. Uh, it's interesting what Williams is writing and what Kazan is, is responding to is, 
exactly what you talked about in the plays of the music's coming from distance down the street uh, in Glass Menagerie, in the dance hall, you know, a few floors below. It's, all, it's coming from an other place yeah. and has a kind of an othered sense about it. So what are these, so often directors uh, impose rather than imagine with, like impose on, t- on top of rather than imagine with. But if we take the text seriously, it allows for these really, maybe some really interesting juxtapositions that Tom and Amanda are hearing blaring music from the corner that could be, uh, you know, uh, a SoundCloud hip, a SoundCloud hip hop track from the corner. Yeah. What is today's blue piano? It, it could be, but it, uh, it, it could be uh, s- s- something from the time, but it could also be something that we'd hear like in David Simon's Treme, like playing through for yeah. streetcar. Yes, for sure. And, and to have that meaningful conversation, we can see that that was already happening uh, uh, not only in the stage play of Streetcar, but the film, this discussion of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof and how to bring those authentic conversations in. Yeah, yeah. I think that word juxtaposition is really key um, and uh, that that there's that um, tradition um, in these productions of Williams, um, you know, that Kazan is bringing these sort of notes of juxtaposition, but so are um, these Black performers, right, who are, who are bringing their own sort of um, sort of counterpoints right to to the onstage action that makes you know being uh the, the impact of being in a place like clarksdale and imagining what that'd be like for williams tension and juxtaposition or contradiction around what it means to be america uh opportunity or, or lack thereof the idea of e- even the tiction, tension juxtaposition of, of the blues music of form and function and 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 then breaking those rules. This all this is all a really fruitful and catalyzing idea. Thank you so much for bringing it to us, Paige. Uh, we're so grateful uh, t- to have your thoughts, and we hope to have you down in Clarksdale really soon, so that we can have this conversation in person. I would really like that. Um, thank you very much, Matt, and thank you, Lucius, and um, and to, to all of your teams down there. And um, enjoy the festival, and uh, look forward to talking more. Great. Everyone will be right back uh, with the rest of our program for today. And thank you so much for being a part of this year's Mississippi Delta Tennessee Williams Festival. Welcome back, everyone. My name is Dr. Matt Foss, and I'm excited to uh, welcome you to this afternoon's presentations here on the last day of the Mississippi Delta Tennessee Williams Festival. Right now, we have Dr. J. Janice Coleman who's a native of Mount Bayou, Mississippi, and a professor of English at Alcorn State University. She received a BA in English from Alcorn State, a master's in popular culture from Bowling Green State, and a doctorate in English from the University of Mississippi. A patchwork artist and storyteller, she weaves the stories of the people in Mississippi, particularly her delta, into the works that she creates. For more than 30 years, she's been developing an exhibit entitled Quilts and Other Quadrilaterals, in addition to quilts, the exhibit includes cotton sacks, pillows, pin cushions, tote bags, tablecloths, bottle covers, and doll clothes. Taste Dr. Coleman, I sow the life that I know and the lives of others whom I have met on the flat lands of the Mississippi Delta. She now lives in Vicksburg on a hill. To view more of her work, please visit her Mississippi Delta Shotgun Sewn Arts Museum at www.mdssam. Dot O-M-E-K-A dot net. Dr. Colvin. Good afternoon, everyone. Once again, I bring you greetings from the historic all-black town of Mount Bayou, Mississippi, which is about 30 minutes, or about 30 miles south of here. Uh, Mount Bayou was the place where I first learned about Tennessee Williams when our high school English teacher required us to read The Glass Menagerie, and I was able to grasp the concept of a gentleman caller. Okay? I also bring you greetings from Alcorn State University, uh, where my students say, I have been teaching there for a minute now. I say, I think it's going on two minutes. But anyway, in 1916, the same year that this house was built, uh, an observer visited the Alcorn campus, and he recognized that it was then Alcorn A&M College, 
But one thing he said about the college was this, they do not raise cotton, although that is the chief product of the Commonwealth. They must have concluded that there is too much of this being raised anyhow, and that it would be encouraging the burdening of the market. At all points state, I continued my study of Tennessee Williams when, our, when an English teacher encouraged us to read uh, A Streetcar Named Desire and some other works by Tennessee Williams. Yesterday, I told you all how I came to know about uh, Tennessee Williams's um, 27 wagons full of cotton through my experiencing, experiences in visiting Benoit, Mississippi and hanging around the Burris House. And so from that, I got the idea for this, for, for a name for this presentation, which is before the 27 wagons full of cotton. As you know, there had to be a cotton sack somewhere. Actually, I think there were 28 wagons full of cotton because I have one right here. I have one. There were 27 left right here. Authentic Mississippi Delta cotton. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to go and talk about something that many of you probably could not conceive of. And that is the fact that if you grew up in the Delta, and especially if you own your own land like we did, and sometimes even if you didn't, you got a cotton sack before you got any other bag. Before I had a purse, a wallet, pocketbook, before my brothers ever had a bill folder, they had the cotton sack as their first bag. I think it was 2013 when I first went to Mississippi Valley State to do a presentation at the, um, the annual symposium, Cotton Kingdom Symposium, they would have. And my first year there, my presentation was about the cotton sack as the first bag. Now, before I went, the Sunday before, I did a little study. Well, first of all, I went to a cousin's house to, to borrow an authentic cotton sack. This is the sack here. So well, you know I didn't make this. This is the authentic cotton sack. It is nine feet long. Okay. I haven't tried on one of these in a long time. Okay. nine feet long so I'm going to keep this on for a minute because I need to say I need to say some other things about it okay so my cousin's house my cousin's house I really didn't know when I got up this morning that I'd be wearing a cotton sack before the day is over but I'm just improv improvising all kinds of ways my cousin my cousin's house was in view of the church and so when I was leaving his house you know the Delta land is flat and I always say if it weren't for the trees you could see all over the Delta see what everybody is doing so I could see the church had just let out and I went there I saw these men my cousins mostly brothers cousins standing around outside the church so I went and conducted a one question interview I thought I knew the answer already, but I asked the question anyway because I was trying to get some content for my paper. So the question was, what did you own first? Uh, what was your first bag? Was it a cotton sack or was it a bill folder or a book satchel or something? Ronald, one of my brothers said, he said, I know it was a cotton sack. What would I have put in a bill folder? I didn't have any money. I think somebody gave me a bill folder when I got my driver's license during my senior year in high school. Andre or Ted, my third oldest brother, answered next. And by the way, 
Ted called me a few minutes ago, talking to me about a football game. I say, Ted, I am at the Tennessee Williams Festival in Clarksdale about to talk about you and the cotton sack. Okay. So Ted said, I probably should be the one to give that presentation because I can probably talk more about that cotton sack than you can. He's a few years older than I am. But he said, but I'll put it this way. I had a cotton sack long before I had my first chicken breast. Now, now what he meant by that was the privilege of eating a chicken breast was usually reserved for adults. Children got a leg or a wing. Yeah, yeah. So I said in these pre-chicken nugget days, children almost invariably were served the smallest, the smaller pieces of the chicken, such as a leg or a wing. Okay. Then I asked a non-relative who was one of the deacons in the church. Same questions. What did you have first? A cotton sack or a bill folder or something else to carry your personal belongings in? Now this is what he said. He said, I know for sure that I had a cotton sack first. The first semblance I had of a bill folder or wallet was a green corn carrier from a, from a bank in Cleveland with the bank's name on it. You remember those little plastic things you used to get? They, they were rubber and they had the little slot in the middle. <laughs> he said it was one of those soft plastic oval shaped containers oval shaped containers with a slot in the middle for inserting coins. And then he said, I might have finished high school or about to graduate when somebody gave me that. But I had a cotton sack long before then. I had to call my oldest brother, Woody, in Detroit to, to uh, include him in this survey. He said, I don't even have to think about this one. I know for sure it was a cotton sack. When I asked him how old he was when he started going to the field, he responded, I don't recall a time when I wasn't in the cotton field. Even as a child, the cotton field was my playpen and my work ground. Okay, so because we were on the phone, Woody and I got to talk a little bit longer about the cotton sack. He said, but I'll tell you one thing about that cotton sack. There was a lot of pride in the fact that we owned our sacks. We had our own. If you happen to get a new sack, you would have so much pride in it that you didn't want to get an oil spot on it or anything. You were protective of that sack. I was hurt if too much dirt got on my sack. And if you had an old or used sack, you knew it because it had your name on it. Or it might have been scratched in a particular place. Or you may have known it by the strap. Sometimes, you, you would have to adjust the, adjust the strap to fit you. He said most people would just tie a knot in the strap, but if my strap was too long, I got a needle and some thread and adjusted the strap on my sack. In another conversation with my brother Ronald, going back to him, I mentioned that Woody had, what Woody had said about adjusting the strap on the sack, on the sack to fit him. This strap e report, evoked a strap memory from Ronald. So Ronald said, he said, oh, that strap was important now. It made all the difference between a luxury car and a clocker. If, if, your, strap, if your sack had a strap that was padded like, like this one, so that it did not cut into your shoulder when you filled it with cotton, then you had a Cadillac of a sack. So this right here, padded strap, this is a Cadillac of a sack. Okay. And so Woody also mentioned um, how bad he felt. You know, we had um, a significant amount of hired help. And sometimes, uh, depending on who was passing out the sack, they might give our sack to somebody else. And Woody said that would be a long day in the field when you didn't have your own sack. He said it was like going to school and then Somebody new has come, and they are sitting in your seat. It was just like that. Okay. Uh, whereas my daddy would say, what difference does it make what sack you get? But he wasn't out there picking. <laughs> okay. So I think I'm going to, 
I'm going to stop with this part now. Some of you all have some handouts um, that I passed out to keep myself on track. Um, uh, yesterday, I talked about Miss Virginia over in Benoit, and we have talked a lot about going to the fields in the cotton sack. I'm just throwing this in. And I asked her, what does she remember about her cotton sack? And she talked about the length of, and all of that. But she also said, she said, um, she, she talked about repurposing the cotton sack once the harvest was over. She said sometimes it would be so cold in the house and there were boards missing in the floor. And when it was really cold, they would throw the sacks over the floor to keep the wind out. And she said if it snowed, we would sometimes stuff the door with the cotton sack. Okay, now I'm going to move on to, is the next thing on there the cotton sack reimagined on the back of the handout? Okay, all right. I'm going to start with the first full length cotton sack that I made. That would be this one right here. It didn't have a name at first, I was just making a sack. Or so I thought. But I have since I have since named it Blues, Browns, and Buttons. Imagine that, a cotton sack with nearly 40 buttons. That's the reimagination of a cotton sack. Well, I had always wanted to make myself a cotton sack. And um, one day I was showing the sack in class after we had read Alice Walker's Everyday Use. Do any of you all know that story? It's a story, Alice Walker's Everyday Use. It's a story about which of two sisters will inherit the family quilts. In the story, two quilt patterns are mentioned. One is, I'm having a wardrobe malfunction here, I guess. That sometimes happens in the field. <laughs> One is um, walk around the mountain, and the other, pattern, quote pattern that she mentions in the story is the Lone Star. So I took this set to class to, to talk to the students about patterns and how you weave them into a quilt. Um, there is a pinwheel pattern at the top of this sack that you can't see, but I'm sure there, oh here's one. Oh, here's one, here's a better one. So I was talking to the students about the pinwheel pattern and the nine patches and some other patterns. And a student right here from Clarksdale said, but why would you make a cotton sack? And I started thinking about that because I said, who gets up in the morning and, say, and says, I think I'm gonna make a cotton sack today. <laughs> So I told her that was a very good question, but I didn't have a ready answer for her. I hadn't thought about it. And then, uh, but, but I thought that at some point it was something that I needed to answer. Why would I make a cotton sack? Well, I could talk about it representing, the cotton sack representing my background and my place and all of that, but it had to be something deeper than that. Ralph Ellison once said that he sees no dichotomy between art and protest. And I thought about that and I said, in making a cotton sack, am I protesting something? And I have concluded that I am. I am protesting this right here. This cotton sack is drab. It's not what Keats would call a thing of beauty, which would lead to a joy forever. None of that here but it's, it's for function. My cotton sacks, they are not lazy, but as I was telling some of you all earlier, they just don't go to the fields. They go to colleges, they go to conferences, they go to festivals such as this one. Yeah, so this is what I was protesting. This is what I was trying to improve upon by 
creating these cotton sacks here. How do you all think I did? Yes. Okay, thank you. That makes me feel good. Yeah, an all-out protest. <laughs> okay. Now, so this sack, and I can tell you I didn't spend any money on any of these. I probably spent maybe $5 all together because people give me, they give me fabric or I find fabric in thrift stores and that kind of thing. So you don't have to spend money to create art. Okay, so this sack right here, blues, browns, and buttons, is uh, made out of, made out of uh, some of my old clothes that got too small, such as the khaki pants, um, this aqua blue, I don't know where I got it from, but I didn't buy it. It was, it was just some scraps. These blue buttons here, they were part of a necklace that some student had dropped on campus, had about a hundred buttons, and I picked it up and I've used it in so many different things. And um, down here at the bottom, you can see I was running out of the fabrics in these colors. And that's why the pieces get smaller here. And so um, making this bottom piece in this bottom part took a little bit longer than the top part because these pieces are so small and I had to put so many more of them together. I made this, this sack, like I said, that's my first full length. I made this sack in July and August of 2009. I had been on it, you know, almost all day in July and almost all day in August. School started. Uh, I don't know, somewhere around August 19th, August 20th, and uh, I hadn't finished the sack, so I went to class and told my students, I said, look, it looks like I'm here, but I am not. And I was thinking I'm not going to be able to do much of anything else until I finish this sack. So when the students saw the sack in an exhibit sometime later, one student said, I think that's the sack that held up the syllabus. <laughs> <laughs> Which it was. Okay, now the next one, this one. This sack is called, it doesn't open, so it's, it's kind of like a blend between a sack and a quilt. And uh, I'm going to grab a chair here so that I can put this sack. But it is sack style, though. I started on this sack the mom in November of 2010, almost the moment that I heard that my grandmother, at nearly 102, was going had gone to the hospital for the first time in her life. And so I was thinking, she's not coming back. I went to my attic and I got out of a box of scraps that I had written on, scraps from Grandma Alice. And I started on this quilt or sack that day. And that's why it's, it's small, but I tried to include her entire life story the important things on this sack. Okay, so it's about twin size. And when the fabric started running out, you know, I had to bring it to an end. Okay, my grandmother was from St. Francis via Louisiana. And I was talking to her in 1995. And I asked her, um, why did she come to Mount Bayou from St. Francis Ville? and never go back. And she said, this is what she said. Can someone help me hold this up? Yes. Okay. I'll do it. Okay. 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 She said, she said, I came here to Mount Bayou, Mount Bayou, Mississippi, from St. Francis via Louisiana to pick cotton for Stafford Coleman Sr., who was my grandfather. She said, 
and I liked living here, so I stayed. Okay? And then, so, um, like I said, I started on this when she got sick. She died a few days later, so I did get to visit her before she died. But here I put um, Mrs. Alice Carter Coleman, and her birthday, she was born on December 25th, 1908. So I put her a little sprig of holly leaves in there. <laughs> and she died November 18th, 2010. Okay, when she came from St. Francisville, she had, see I have all, let's, let's, let's drop that part yeah, now. Okay. Yeah, we can drop that. Then I put all her children. When she came to Mount Bayou, she had one son already. His name was Joseph, so that was her firstborn. Then she married my grandfather, whose wife had died, and she became the stepmother of these seven children, Luvenia, Willie Scott, Woodrow, that's my father, Effie, Robert, Stafford Jr., and Paul. Okay, and then, Wilt Stafford, she had three more children, Elsa, James, and Violet. Effie's son, Effie died when her children were, when her children were young, she had two. Grandma Alice took in one. Not a formal adoption, so I just put reared by her. Okay, so those were her 11 children. Now, let me digress to say, my mother told me that my daddy wanted me named after two of his sisters. And instead of J. Janice today, you would have been looking at Effie Mae Louvenia Coleman. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then I put um, the production information put from Grandma Alice's scraps and the date. Let's turn this back over and look at some of these patterns. Okay. First of all, can you catch that group over there? Yes, Go there. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. So on each, so you see three straps here. You see three straps here. And on each one of these straps are 34 buttons. One, to represent every year of her life. There are some antique buttons here, and then there are some contemporary buttons here. Okay, now the patterns. i just point out a couple. I put a pinwheel on everything. You know, ever since I read uh, and studied Eudora Welch is a worn path, and you all know that story. Um, you know, Phoenix buys a grandson the pinwheel, and to me that, that, that's to encourage him to keep on turning, to keep on moving, no matter what happens. So I said for nearly 102 years, Grandma Alice kept on moving. Through the bad times, through the good times, she kept on turning. So there is one pinwheel on here to represent each 10 years of her life. So there are 10 on here. There, there are six in this row, they are turned different ways. Here's one, here's one, there are 10 on here. Let me mention another pattern before I go to the next quilt. This pattern right here. This is called Rob Peter to Pay Paul. And uh, I was thinking, Grandma, she was by no means a wealthy woman. So there must have been times, when she, many times, when she had to rob Peter to pay Paul. You all know what that means. Okay, I tell my students, it's like you have money for the football game, but then you need to buy a book. And so you take your money for the football game and you go buy your book, which I don't think they were agreeing with. I think for them it's the other way around. <laughs> but anyway, so this is the Rob Peter to pay Paul. And conventional wisdom has it that as long as you are robbing Peter to pay Paul, Paul will always be your friend. Okay, and there are some other patterns in here, but I'm going to leave this one alone and move on. I like these fabrics though, because some of them reminds me of, some of them remind me of the Louisiana swamps and things like that, like the, uh, the aquatic prints here and all of that. Okay? All right, let's, let's get this BB. You gonna stay? Sure, I'll stay. Okay. <laughs> We're going to move now to, to the BB King set. 
Yes. Okay, now it's right on the back, so we have to make sure that doesn't get on the ground. Okay. I started on this set. The day B.B. King died. What day was that? It's on here. May 14th, 2015. I wasn't a B.B. King fan, but I had been going to the B.B. King Museum in Indianola and taking students there and learning things about him. So it's like what we were talking about yesterday, that place, that sameness of place. I thought I will pay tribute to a fellow Mississippi Delta artist. So I went through my box of fabric scraps, boxes of fabric scraps, and I got out all the blue fabrics, and I started piecing this sack together. I already knew. Come back, man. Okay. <laughs> there were going to be some Maybe pinwheels. You see this pinwheel here? And there are three of them. Here's one here, and here's one here. Pinwheel, the pin. Button in the middle. Okay? Uh, B.B. had some good times, but he had some rough times too. But he kept on turning. So I thought the pinwheel was a good one to use for him. Now, the other patterns here, they are, they, they were pieced as nine patches. Let me see a good nine patch. Usually you have uh, three patterns in a row. Oh, this is a good one right here. That's the top cut. Right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. B.B. King was almost 90 when he died. So the nine patch, what worked for him, okay? I say you could tell the story of B.B. King with the nine patch. You put him in the center or you come up with something significant from in, uh, the log cabin patch. That's the one, there are three of them, and each one has this orange piece in the middle. Now, it's, it, it's, it's a modified nine patch pattern. Uh, you start with the fire, and you put the logs around it, okay? But it's not a traditional log cabin, it's my log cabin. Now, let's, let's turn this over. All right, turn it over. We have some narrative on the back. Okay, so you see here, the, it's called the B.B. King Blues Cotton Sack. So the Blues Cotton Sack in honor of B.B. King, then I have his birthday, his death day, and the title of his signature song, The Thrill is Gone. Okay, I also have the type of house that B.B. King might have lived in when he was a young boy a log cabin. So that's why it's pieced and patched. And I had to include Lucille. <laughs> okay, you all know about Lucille? Yes. Okay, and then I put here uh, what, what President Obama said when B.B. King died. He said the blues has lost okay. <laughs> the blues has lost its king and America has lost a legend. That's President Barack Obama. Okay. We don't want the white part on the ground. Okay. All right. We just we, we have one more piece of the card. Right. Just mm -hmm. on here. Yeah. This last part. Okay. This is just the production information. Made in Mississippi. Mound Bayou and Vicksburg by J. Janice Coleman, 2015. And then here I am in my blues <laughs> J-Fro. See, many people think I wear, they'll say, I like your afro, and I have to correct them and say, an afro is what people were wearing in the 60s and 70s. This is a J-Fro. It's named after me. Okay? And I, I think that's about it. Okay. Now, now we're not going to... Place, reimagining of a cotton sack. I imagine, now Barbie, she might have been in New York on Fifth Avenue, but if she had ever moved to the Delta, 
Barbie would have had a cotton sack. So I have two Barbies here, and each one has, she has a cotton, you know, Barbie, Barbie is materialistic and she always has a lot of stuff. So she has a quilt with a bee on it. And um, I made her feel, feel dressed. You can come up and look at this later if you have time. Her feel wear, her headgear, okay? And the same in brown, okay? I made one, I think I made this one in 2016 and this one in 2017. Barbie has been to the Delta though, though, and she says, I love the Mississippi Delta. <laughs> and Barbie also comes with her politics because she's kind of like her creator. She says, cotton pickers' lives matter. <laughs> okay? Uh, I'm, I'm getting to the big sack in a moment. I'm trying okay. to delay though. Okay. This is the, the smallest sacks that I've made these little miniature sacks. Uh, where is a, I'm, this, this young man. Mr. Floyd, Floyd's council. Mm -hmm. he, he said he knew something about going to the field. Do you know what this is right here? This is a test. Do you know what this is? Is that the, the, the lunch bell? No. I can't see it. It's a weight. Oh, it's a weight. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you put it on the scale and you slide it down. Yes. Mine was always on that lower end, 20 pounds. Uh. <laughs> okay, now, let's talk about, let's see how I'm going on time here. Yeah. Talk about this you just tell me what to do. Uh, well, I don't, I don't think we have anything to do here because this sack is, uh, as I've said to some of you all, if you're going to make a cotton sack, cut the thing off at seven feet or nine feet. Don't try to make a 20 foot long cotton sack. It's uh, not photogenic. Uh, I don't have one picture of this sack in one piece. Okay. Um, now I made this in the summer of 2017. I had started on it before, just piecing a few pieces together. And then B.B. King died and his sack jumped in front of this one. And then in January of 2017, I got back to it. Okay, but I really spent that whole summer on it. I was taking apart jeans, every part of the jeans, um, and other blue pants, but mostly, mostly my jeans that had gotten too, too, too small or whatever. This, uh, I think the back of this sack, from what I remember, I think it has about almost 30 pockets on it. Imagine that. The cotton sack we imagine, 30 pockets. And um, I just wanted the sack to be in, um, in fall colors because people pick cotton in the fall. Uh, I learned, I didn't know at first, that a bale of cotton is I think 480 pounds. Am I right? Any, does anyone know where the bale of cotton weighs? I think it's 480 pounds. This sack can hold 480 pounds, if not more. Okay. Um, it also weighs almost 25 pounds. And that's another reason that you don't want to make a sack this big. Okay. It doesn't travel much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the end, though, I decided to dedicate this sack to my mother. Uh, so I said this sack is dedicated to the memory of Bertha M. Bradley Coleman. I have her birthday, the day she died. And I called her the original seamstress because for me, she was. And, and her eight children. So these are my fellow cotton pickers, my sisters and brothers, okay? And then the manufacturing information, made in Mississippi, Mount Bayou, and Vicksburg, and here I am again with my J-Club. Okay, and some of those dazzling blue buttons again, okay? Uh, I was going to say something else, but I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, I had some pictures here that were um, 
just representative of things in the Delta. Um, here I am, outstanding in my field. This field here would have been directly behind our house. And uh, Po Monkey, uh, that business was in Marigold. Well, actually, it wasn't too far from my house in Mount, out in the rural part of Mount Bayou. I didn't know where it was until the day he died. And a friend of mine got me to go to the funeral with her. And so I went to the house and uh, took the picture and so I, and got it framed and included his obituary there. Um, but I will say this about these, about these cotton sacks. People give me a lot of scraps and I say, I'm going to stop accepting them. But I get curious about what the fabrics look like, so I take some more in. I thought, after I finished this uh, 20 foot long sack, because a sack, a quilt, it is a place to store fabrics. My stashes looked exactly the same. <laughs> it didn't look like anything. I wasn't missing anything. So, um, and, not only can you store scrap fabrics in quilts and sacks and things, but you can store those uh, family stories or whatever stories that you want to tell. I could tell many more stories about these sacks, but um, I'm going to stop it here and see if any of you all have any questions. Yes. Every time we get together, so that's what we talk about. I ask this question because parents, everybody has those experiences. And I did because I was a North and South kid, so in Delta and then in Chicago for the summer. But I went to Chicago once. And honestly, I didn't know. I went out there. Oh, you, was, you were so and deprived. I was fired with the 14 of the summer. <laughs> because they call it chopping cotton, but you're really I chopping the weeds. I was part of the 14. in the field was not an unpleasant experience, but that might be because we were, in, we were on our own land. There was nobody really holding us accountable except my dad, uh, but he wasn't in the field with us. He would just say something like, how many rows did you chop today? Or something <laughs> like that. But yesterday, um, I talked about um, my high school classmate whom I had not seen in many years, and I saw her at a funeral uh, about a, co a couple of years ago. And uh, I said, Renee, the last time I saw you, I think we were in the cotton fields together. And she said, girl, we had fun in those fields, in those cotton fields. And she said, and in the cucumber fields too. I said, I don't know about that one now. <laughs> but, but the cotton field was the social scene. If you weren't out there, where were you? You just got left out. And uh, my brother, whom I talked to, while I was trying to get set up here. Um, we always tease him because he would sometimes get us in trouble. He would pick enough cotton to make him a pillow and then go to sleep in the field. So, you know, and when my, we would see my dad coming, we were trying to, you know, trying to wake him up. But anyway, my uh, sisters and brothers, and my extended family members who all grew up out in the country with us, every time we get together, there's a conversation about the cotton field. Mm -hmm. I have one friend, uh, I had interviewed some women about their experiences in the cotton field, including Miss Virginia, but one woman in my own bayou, she said, girl, you're taking, me, you're taking me back too far now. You're taking me back too far. You know, we would talk about the meals. We ate in the fields. Now, we didn't eat in the fields that much. The crackers and 
Um, it's a little peak cookie thing. Ginger. That's what it was. We didn't get a lot of that because our fields were so near our house we could just go home and eat. But, you know, that's what a lot of other people ate. So, but yeah, there are always stories when we get together. Yes. Okay. Are you uh, teaching your students or are y'all carrying on this tradition or are others learning how to make the cotton sacks? Is that? Unfortunately, I am not. No particular reason, right? But I'm just not. I mean, and, and sometimes, uh, and especially in my, when I was close in that first minute, they talk about. I would tell them about some of my cotton field experiences, and they would say, "Dr. Colby, you know you haven't gone to any people. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and that's probably something that I should do. I do talk to them about it sometimes, but like I said, they are not convinced that I ever went to the field. Uh, I, I will share one more story. I think I'm about out of time. I had a student in my class from Indianola uh, two or three years ago. And on the first day of class, I was asking each student, you know, I know Mississippi pretty much from teaching and where everybody is from. I said, where are you from? And the young lady said she was from Indianola. And in front of everybody else in the class, I said, Indianola. I said, is that the little dusty town up in the Delta? And I just threw her. She didn't know what to say. We still laughed about it. We laughed about this last week at homecoming. Uh, we still, I, I, said, I said, Victoria, I knew you weren't, you weren't swift the first day. Because when I said that to you, you didn't even say, well, Dr. Coleman, where are you from? <laughs> we still laugh about that. And when I was talking, would talk to her about the fields, or talk to the class, I remember saying to her, I said, Victoria, I had my students interviewing each other, doing a biographical interview. I said, Victoria, I, without even talking to you, I could write your whole life story. And I said, one of the main things that I would say about you is this, that you saw a cotton field, as I said yesterday, you saw a cotton field at one stage of development every day of your life until you came to college. And she said that is true. But the young lady sitting next to her from Chicago said, really? <laughs> I told Victoria, I said, you know she went home and told her mama she was sitting next to a slave, a former slave, because they just think slaves pick cotton. So, but yeah. Are there any other questions? Yes. No. No, just just conf and this is not nearly all of the exhibit, but it's just a small part of it. But um, no, I just haven't gotten to that. I just have that that online museum that's uh, on the sheet there. But and it's it's supposed to be a work in progress. I just haven't gotten back to it to add anything or to write about these works. Um, in that online museum, the Mississippi Delta Shotgun Sewn Arts Museum. Okay. There are no other questions. I will move this. All right. And, uh, well, thank, thank you so you. much, Dr. Coleman. Let's give Dr. Coleman another round of applause. Thank you so much for coming to Carson for such an insightful and entertaining presentation. Festival, the 29th annual Mississippi Delta Tennessee Williams Festival. Today, our next speaker is going to be Mr. Gilroy Chow. We're thrilled to have him here today. I'm going to read his bio for a minute, and then I'm going to tell a little bit about a relationship I have with Gilroy and Sally. So, Mr. Gilroy Chow, president of the Mississippi Delta Chinese Heritage Museum, is a former industrial engineer. He worked for NASA in the late 60s and early 70s, and then worked as the engineering manager for Metso Industries for 39 years. Gilroy has spoken all over the country about the hardships of the Chinese that settled in the Mississippi Delta before the turn of the last century. He is an ambassador for Chinese heritage and culture 
and will share many insights about the Chinese, including some of their pastimes, oral histories, and cooking traditions. So, my little side story that I wanted to share is back in 1997, when I was a cub reporter for the Clarksdale Press Register here in Clarksdale, I went to Washington to the uh, Mississippi, I mean to the uh, Smithsonian Folklife Festival that they put on every year, every summer, and it's, it's so much fun. So I was looking and I found my article that I wrote for the Press Register back in 1997, and it tells a little bit about Gilroy and Sally and what they did at the festival this year, that year. So I thought it'd be neat just to share a little bit of that, you know, history. So each year our nation's capital attracts hundreds of thousands of people for its fantastic 4th of July celebration set at the National Mall. Americans as well as visitors from around the world are entertained with heartwarming music, festive parades, and incredible fireworks. This year, a large portion of that tremendous crowd was infatuated and enlightened by a powerful region we all know as the Mississippi Delta. With help from 16 Clarksdale representatives, the Smithsonian's 31st Annual Festival of American Folklife featured the Mississippi Delta and its rich Southern heritage. Held June 24th through July 6th, the museum pro uh, program since it was first established in 1967. So I go on to tell about each representative that came. And then I began to tell about our very own Chow family. The last Clarksdale family participating in the festival was directly involved in the home area. Sally and Gilroy Chow and their two children, Lisa and Bradley, were asked to share Chinese culture in the Delta as well as their famed culinary skills. Gilroy Chow, head of the family, is the manager of engineering at Stevens SA in Clarksdale. Born in Bolivar County and raised in New York City, Gilroy told how his grandfather came to America in 1912 from the Hoi Pin village in Canton, China. My family came to the United States seeking opportunity in pleasant weather, he explained. <laughs> And there are several common values between the Southern cultures and Chinese cultures that have reinforced our decision to stay in the Delta, such as the importance of family and the enjoyment of food. Sally Chow, a celebrity of the family, <laughs> is a school teacher, a church organist, and a well-known cake decorator. Her grandfather also came to America around the turn of the century. He worked as a baker and became a, and became a midwife in a sense as he delivered all 10 of his children. I began cake decorating when I was pregnant with Bradley 22 years ago, but I've always cooked for my family, Sally explained. I was taught that the family that eats together stays together. Sally, who has been compared to Betty Crocker, was featured on the Today Show with Willard Scott and in the Washington Post during the festival. The Chow family's fascinating culture and culinary abilities were also revealed in an article in the May 1997 issue of Southern Living Magazine. Throughout the festival, the Chows hosted a display booth that exhibited a variety of objects related to Mississippi and their, chi their Chinese culture and their individual family. They also participated on the narrative stage demonstrating the ch traditional Chinese game of Mahjong and discussing cultural diversity in the Delta in a program called Passing It On. At their specific times, Gilroy and Sally both demonstrated their individual cooking techniques in the Delta. Gilroy shared his expertise in cooking Chinese food, and Sally revealed some of her secrets. Anyway, y'all enjoy today's uh, talk by Gilroy Chow. Thank you, Jen. And that concludes our presentation. <laughs> she has told it all. But uh, thank you for that. Uh, it was interesting when uh, Dr. Foss and Jen said, uh, would you uh, speak to us at the uh, Tennessee Williams Festival? And so um, I said, sure, but what am I going to talk about? And uh, they wanted to talk about diversity and inclusion in the Mississippi Delta. And uh, we never think about it that way, but the Delta is a diverse place. So um, what does an engineer have to uh, contribute. I'm neither um, artsy, literate, or literary. <laughs> and uh, the 
things, but uh, as Jen said, uh, I've been blessed to do many things over the years. Um, so, uh, question. Tom Williams grew up in Clarksdale before he became Tennessee. What was the population of Clarksdale in 1920? Anyone? Anyone around then? <laughs> no, uh, 7,558. 7,558. We're uh, getting close to that now <laughs> as our population diminishes, but uh, no, uh, over 20,000. Uh, this comes later anyway. Uh, you know, um, what was the community like when uh, he visited his grandfather in Clarksdale during those days? And his writings include uh, diversity and uh, include that. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. And uh, in his, uh, the settings of the characters in his play. So the characters came from inclusive backgrounds across the community. And so uh, the question was asked, were there Chinese in Clarksdale then? Well, in the Grange Cemetery, where uh, it is the setting for some of his plays, uh, there is a tombstone with the name Pang on it, and no dates. But uh, if he was in the Grange Cemetery, you know it was a long time ago. So the Chinese have been a part of uh, the Mississippi Delta for years. We know that uh, Sally's grandfather came uh, at the turn of the century and it helped found the town of Marx. And uh, it, uh, so we, we know the Chinese have been here. Uh, it was interesting when uh, we talked about Tennessee Williams, uh, he came in 1917. Uh, my father came to the Mississippi Delta in 1916. We have evidence of that when we uh, visited the Amistad Center down in uh, Tulane University, and that has uh, where he attended school. And uh, I tell uh, my family that he was a good student because he was present every day because there was a little P in each day of each week where he attended the Chinese Presbyterian School in Metairie, Louisiana in 1960. And then uh, they must have liked him well enough because there's another notation that Joe T. M visited with Joe Singh in 1922. And uh, the question I have is, I don't know how he traveled from New Orleans to Cleveland or back again in 1922, because uh, what transportation was available? Not Greyhounds, not buses. So perhaps he caught the boat up to Mississippi or uh, perhaps the railroad. But that's a question I, that I did not ask and, uh, and has my curiosity. Uh, you know, Delta, de typical Delta town demographics now include uh, whites, blacks, of course, Italians, the Jewish, the Lebanese, the Chinese, Irish, Scots, Europeans, Hispanics, and other in, in varying percentages. But the uh, question was asked last night. You know, how did Tom Williams, Tennessee Williams, interact as a young boy going to school uh, in, uh, in Clarksdale, Mississippi? And uh, so uh, he's observant, he's intelligent, and he sees life going on around him. So he was exposed to all these. So uh, just uh, the fact that we know this, um, so, we're talking about the Chinese in particular. Uh, we have the Mississippi Delta Chinese Heritage Museum down in Cleveland. We've partnered with Delta State and the city of Cleveland to uh, preserve the heritage. Because uh, if you look around now, uh, there are a few Chinese, but uh, not nearly as many as there were maybe 30 years ago when there were 2,500 Chinese across the Mississippi Delta. At one time, there were 25 Chinese grocery stores in Clarksdale, 50 in Greenville, um, perhaps 35 in Cleveland, several in Marks. And now, if you go across those towns, if you see the buildings, the signs might be up, but there are very few Chinese grocery stores or businesses. So our demographics are changing, just as it was changing back in, in uh, Young Tom's day. But we're trying to preserve that heritage at the Chinese uh, Heritage Museum. Um, what happened in 1882? 1882, they had finished the Transcontinental Railroad. 
there were Chinese in large numbers in uh, San Francisco, LA, California, and even on the East Coast. These were taking the jobs of people and they said, we don't need any Chinese here. They said, well, we're not gonna be that mean. We'll allow 105 from the entire country of China to come to the United States. And so they passed the 1882 Exclusion Act that no Chinese could come in unless they felt, felt fit certain categories. They needed to be merchants or scholars, uh, or, uh, but they could not be any of the students were not allowed in, uh, they were Chinese, and no women. Uh, so this, uh, the legislation banned Chinese women. So uh, it was not until 1943 that this was uh, repealed. And the regrets uh, of the exclusion where a single ethnic group was excluded um, was issued in 2014. Um, and so uh, that should not, and, and now immigration has become an issue again for different reasons, but uh, nevertheless, immigration has always been a thought. So at the uh, museum, we sponsor events and activities, um, and it was dedicated uh, a little over 10 years ago, and uh, we uh, thank uh, Delft State and the City of Cleveland for partnering with us. Uh, yesterday, um, Levi Fraser mentioned that uh, they hosted in Memphis uh, an arts group. Uh, so the H.T. Chen group in this picture here, uh, a dance company from New York came to uh, Mississippi and they were inspired to uh, write this, uh, a dance recital uh, called South of Gold Mountain. And that talks tells the story of immigrants coming uh, to the United States and settling in the Delta. Uh, so the museum has done different activities. Uh, this is Martin Gold signing copies of his book uh, about the uh, Regrets Act. Um, back in the 30s, in certain communities, Chinese were not permitted to go to school uh, in the school system. And so the uh, Chinese mission school was started in 1937. Um, how long did that mission school last, anybody? Until Cle uh, Cleveland integrated in 1952. I know some of us around then. Uh, Chinese could not go to school even in, in Cleveland until the 1952. Um, my cousin uh, faults uh, the education system letting him down and, and he, uh, was not a good English student. He faults the education system at the day. Uh, the building was torn down uh, in the 60s. A, uh, the state highway marker was uh, dedicated to that. And uh, in the picture are some of the students. So you see some of them are not that old. Some of them are quite elderly. Uh, I snapped this picture of two uh, graduates of the Chinese Mission School. Uh, one of them is uh, two different Wongs. Uh, one uh, tells the story of he helping uh, the other uh, from uh, bullies because it was a boarding school. But uh, the one right here um, to your left is uh, Kellogg Wong. Uh, he has uh, been a notable architect and he's done things like Lincoln Center, the Louvre in Paris. He is a graduate of the Chinese Mission School in Cleveland, and his friend there is Dr. Paul Wong. Uh, he helped put up some of the first satellites that we uh, know so well uh, after it finished at Berkeley. But he is also a graduate of the Chinese Mission School. But there are others that have gone on to successes uh, in other places. If you're really interested in uh, what the Chinese have done, there have been a number of books uh, written, Chat Six in the Land of Cotton, The Mississippi Delta Between Black and the White by James Lowen. Uh, he is a professor down at Tugaloo and passed away recently. Uh, I attended school with him at Mississippi State in 1958. Um, Doris Ling and Paul uh, gathered journey stories. 
uh, Water Tossing Boulders by Adrian Berard. Um, this book uh, I was talking to John about um, is a book that was written about the landmark case, uh, Gong Lam versus Rice. Uh, some of the, uh, the Rice uh, is uh, Judge Greek Rice. Uh, Lum was, uh, was uh, Mrs. Lum from Rosedale and her two children were going to school in Rosedale. And then uh, when they got to uh, about third or fourth grade, uh, somebody decided that it was wrong for them to go to school with whites and they could not go to school. And they fought the case and it went to the Mississippi court and then uh, it was decided and then uh, it, she appealed it, their mom appealed it uh, to the, all the way to the uh, Mississippi Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court. And uh, they hired a Clarksdale lawyer, uh, Earl Brewer. And uh, somehow, uh, and I, I don't quite remember the circumstance, he did not try the case. He did not appear on the, on the court case date. And uh, so he had a subordinate do it, and they lost the case. And uh, there you have the Supreme Court saying that the law of the land says that schools that are separate but equal is okay in the 1930s. And uh, it became the law of the land, and that's why you had school segregation approved by everyone because the Supreme Court said so and was not overturned until 1952, Brown versus the Board of Education, but wasn't completely repealed until the 60s. And so uh, we're still dealing with uh, those decisions today. Grocery stories. In every town and hamlet had grocery stores filling a need for a local source of food, sundries, medicine, meat, vegetables, fruit, as well as pots, pans, washboards, and money. Why were so uh, many of the Chinese close to their clientele? Because they loaned them money, they gave them credit. And uh, so some people will say that the Chinese grocery stores the grocers took advantage of the clients, but at the same time, uh, the, the, uh, the clients and the customers were taking care of the businesses. It was a synergistic process where it was good for everyone. So they were a source of everyday life in so many communities. So uh, in 1960, we talked about 1,200. In the um, 70s, perhaps 2,500. In, in uh, 2017, we had a reunion and had over 350 people attend and come to Delft State. People came from all over the country and uh, some from even uh, further than that. Uh, and uh, just as we were talking about uh, what times in the cotton fields, uh, people talked about their times in the grocery stores, but they've gone to others. I have to digress for a second and talk about the cotton fields. My son uh, has a cotton field story. When he was uh, finishing high school, um, he had an opportunity to chop cotton. Chop cotton? You don't chop cotton, you chop the weeds. But he learned that from, um, I forgot, uh, his, his uh, instructor. Um, so he, he chopped cotton uh, north of Lyon, and he says that first day, the, uh, I think it was Joe that showed him how to sharpen a hoe, how to take it, and you get a row, and you chop two rows. And he said he chopped, and 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 chopped two more. And pretty soon he got to the end of the row. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he, he learned that uh, he did not want to do that the rest of his life, so he became a much better student. And that's Bradley's cotton chopping story. He did it for two summers and, uh, and he uh, learned a lot. Uh, we talked about uh, Gong Lum versus Rice. Um, Mississippi Delta Chinese in World War II. Um, Gwen Gong, Dr. Gwen Gong, came back from Hong Kong in, in, uh, at, in the year 2000 and uh, she uh, met a veteran and uh, 
she was thinking that her dad had served in the Navy and she did not know anything about his service. And she and her husband, Dr. John Powers, and their daughter, uh, Devereaux, uh, started to gather information. And they uh, actually compiled the book, uh, The Mississippi Chinese uh, Veterans. Uh, she found almost 197 names. And uh, through that effort, uh, a movie was made, Honor and Duty. And uh, so, Found out that Uncle Pat, Uncle Billy, Jack Chow served in World War II across many different theaters. So you saw Uncle Pat was in the Navy. Well, when he turned 100, he was honored as a hometown hero. So in his Navy, uniform was projected on the screen at the at the Ole Miss Vanderbilt football game. And there was a senator, Dad Cochran, at the game, and he was inspired in 2018 to legislate to sponsor the legislation to create the Congressional Gold Medal for World War II veterans. And so Dad Cochran, uh, even though he passed several years ago, was honored last week uh, at the Congressional Gold Medal Ceremony and Sally accepted the medal for Dad Cochran and uh, we will present that to his family uh, when she becomes available. But uh, that's how things happen. Thank you, thank you. Uh, that uh, the circumstance of Gwen Dr. Gwen Gong uh, going from Texas A&M to Hong Kong and then coming back and meeting a veteran and writing the book and then Uncle Pat being honored uh, at Ole Miss when he turned 100. Uncle Pat lived to 105, so he didn't get to see the gold medal, but uh, certainly uh, he'll be remembered uh, for that. Chinese uh, have served in, in other conflicts. Uh, we have found evidence of war, Civil War, World War II, World War I, World War II. Uh, my brother served uh, Korea, another family. Uh, we know that there are Vietnam, Bosnia, and uh, Desert Storm, and Afghanistan serving from the Mississippi Delta. You heard the uh, Folk Life Festival story, so from, uh, from uh, but uh, the beginning of that of that uh, of um, Jen's story was that uh, Worth Long got off a Greyhound bus in Clarksdale and he said um, we're gonna find some people and tell them uh, tell their stories and Sally uh, asked me and, and uh, what's our story what is our story and we said we go to work uh, she teaches school uh, we're raising a family. Uh, who's worried about that story? <laughs> and uh, but you, in, in retrospect, here in our later and retirement years, that it is important to tell your story. Uh, recently featured uh, a couple of years ago in a New York Times photo essay, talking about farming in Mississippi, um, and so we see where people are interested in what's happening in Mississippi. Uh, what do Chinese do? Uh, they, they played sports uh, back in the 30s, uh, the 50s and 60s. Uh, most recently, uh, we're so proud of our niece. Uh, her grandmother grew up in March, Mississippi. Uh, Dana Matheson uh, is the number one uh, wheelchair player in the United States and number eight in the world. Uh, eight in the world that's she says that's terrible it is terrible <laughs> because number one through seven gets an, uh, an invitation to each uh, open the French the Wimbledon and that number eight is a guest of the host country so if you're unless you're top seven you have to uh, play your way in but she has played her way in and she's played uh, all the opens except Australia so she is still working hard. 
Back in Pace in 1939, Ellen Lum was on that basketball team. And in 39, uh, Jack was on the men's basketball team. Uh, picture of this house is where I was born. So when I say I'm a country boy, <laughs> I was born three and a half miles outside of Cleveland. There are my six siblings, uh, six siblings, including myself. Uh, there are three of us now, and uh, my brother, oldest brother passed away last year at 90, but we're, four of us were born in that farmhouse, and two were born, uh, as, uh, as Emily Jones likes to say, on Virgin Alley, Virgin Alley behind Sharp Avenue in Cleveland, because uh, they were born in the warehouse behind the store. So there's my dad uh, in the 30s uh, with Jack and his brother. The other side of the family, there's Sally with her siblings and our families. So the Arthur and King Chow family. Uh, so people ask the story, uh, how did you and Sally meet? And uh, if she's with me, I'll tell them that we were matched. But uh, truth of the matter is our families uh, go back a long way and they were friends. Um, so what do people do in Clarksdale? You can teach school, you can be an organist, you can be a cake maker. Uh, and of course, some of y'all recognize some of these. Uh, Sam, Sally, Audric, and Dean. Uh, another family that um, spoke with us one time with the FBI down in Jackson was the Charlie Sang family. Uh, Charlie is notable because he and my, my older brother share a birthday, but uh, these four kids, uh, what do Chinese do? Uh, one's a NASA scientist, uh, he had learned to speak Russian so he could uh, communicate with the uh, Russian cosmonauts. Um, Pediatric cardiologist uh, Charlie Jr. is uh, in North Carolina. Uh, Gabrielle is an attorney uh, down in, in in Rosedale in Cleveland. And then Alan is a is a uh, IT guy with the Gaming Commission. Uh, here's Sally's mother, the oldest of ten. Uh, four served in World War II. That's Sally's family in 1922 in Marx. So uh, did uh, he know young Tom, or did young Tom ever go to uh, King's Grocery in Clarksdale in, 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 in Marx? He traveled a long way, 19 miles to Marx. And in 1925, 72. Um, talk about people being interested in Mississippi. Uh, Andrew Zerman, Zimmern uh, traveled the Blues Trail from Memphis to Jackson and he had a stop in Oxford and in Clarksdale. He's at the home of uh, Audrey and Alice there uh, enjoying, uh, what was it, black eyed peas and pigtails, <laughs> uh, fish, uh, and so we cooked for him and uh, the only thing he carried with him was some of Alice's dessert. Uh, Fanny was responsible for most of block visiting uh, in Clarksdale. Uh, in YouTube, uh, AJ Plus uh, tells the story of the Mississippi Delta Chinese. Uh, there had five million hits in it, uh, so that, that story is still available. So if you don't like my version, you can see the uh, YouTube version. Uh, MOCA, the Chinese uh, Museum of Chinese in America. Uh, you ought to recognize uh, two out of the four people there. Uh, the other lady is Maya Lin, a uh, designer of the uh, Vietnam uh, Veterans Memorial in Washington and a noted architect across the country. Uh, she was with us uh, at the MOCA when we were honored as uh, 33 notable chefs. Uh, we were the home cooks. Interesting story, uh, Sean Caleb's uh, out of CNN uh, came to uh, Mississippi and he visited with uh, the um, Joe family, Stephen Joe Dennis up in, in uh, Senatobia. Um, 
So uh, we have a friend uh, that was visiting in Beijing, and he hears a familiar southern voice, and it was uh, Lucille Joe, uh, as she was in being interviewed by Sean, because it was a show made for the people in China, and uh, it was uh, talking about the Mississippi Delta Chinese. So we find that uh, there are people in China that are interested in that there are Chinese in the Mississippi Delta. So we, we've been here all our lives, <laughs> but people in the other parts of the country don't know. So we have these visitors, uh, PBS, uh, MOCA, CGTN, China News. Uh, what do uh, Mississippi Chinese do? Uh, we had a NASA reunion and uh, there were six of us uh, that worked Apollo that we got to talk about the Apollo days and we had the deputy director uh, said from uh, Stennis Space Center uh, where they say that uh, you can't get to the moon without going through Mississippi. All the rocket engines are tested uh, live fired in Mississippi and so uh, he said that uh, if uh, a couple of the guys that he knew from the program we're going to be there. He had to be there, so uh, Randy Galloway came uh, to celebrate with us. Um, people like to talk about Apollo, and um, in recent years, uh, I get to talk about that a little bit and, and uh, talk about the good old days. Again, you might recognize some of the people. Uh, that's Tom Hanks uh, 10 years from now. <laughs> Jim Lovell uh, is who Tom Hanks played, and then uh, Buzz Aldrin is playing himself there and I'm, uh, with them. But more importantly, uh, out of Apollo, 50 years later, uh, you uh, make lifelong relationships and friends. Uh, so there's two guys that uh, we were in each other's weddings uh, and shared those times uh, then and now. Uh, so go through life, uh, think about the people you deal with. So what do Chinese do in uh, 2021? Uh, they're grocers, they're doctors, they're lawyers, they're in government, they're business people, they're engineers, they're artists. So I denied uh, being an artist, but uh, there are people that are in the arts. Uh, there are several notable artists. Uh, Virginia Wing has been a Broadway uh, movies. Um, yesterday, uh, at uh, Dr. Ralph Voss, who was honored as being one of the uh, people here, and uh, his widow uh, came up to me and said, uh, "Where is Gay Chow?" Gay Chow was an English professor out of Cleveland, Mississippi. Alice's brother. And they were students together on their doctoral programs. And she said that Dr. Voss, uh, Gay, was one of his favorite students. And so uh, it's a small world, especially if you're from the Delta. You know, um, we uh, talk about six degrees of separation, but if you're from the Delta, it's more like three. You're going to know somebody that knows somebody. Um, farmers, pharmacists, educators, dentists, accountants, managers, restaurants, and many others. So some of fir first generation, but uh, at the uh, 150th anniversary of the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, my granddaughter Smith realized that she was fifth generation Chinese. And uh, so uh, even her story was uh, written uh, by a lady in, in, in the fact that she was there and that she was uh, taking notes because she had to do a show and tell because she was missing a day or two of school of where she was and uh, she uh, wrote down in Morse code, did uh, uh, at D-O-N-E, that was the code that, and the message that was sent when the Transcontinental Railroad was finished. And uh, my niece uh, called uh, several years ago and said that we need to sign up and go to the uh, railroad reunion it's, and uh, so I talked to my brother and uh, he said our grandfather was a railroad worker and I said our grandfather that was 150 years ago how was our grandfather but he must have started his family late in life 
as did my father. Uh, and, and so our grandfather was a railroad worker. And all I could think of when I was there, when I saw some of the rail ties and some of the stories of laying uh, railroads ties, that he must have been some kind of buff <laughs> to move all that iron every day, weeks on end, with these uh, these drivers. Uh, I had picked up one of the hammers, and it was a prop, so it was kind of light. But uh, you know, to dri drive that, because uh, John Henry was a uh, steel driving man, and so uh, so I, I'm imagining my grandfather as being very strong, but. Uh, to get the ties back to the Mississippi Delta, I don't know of any of the Chinese that can attribute their roots to being in the, in the cotton fields. Uh, I was born on a farm, and uh, people ask about my name, Gilroy. How Chinese is that? But uh, it's not because uh, the fellow that helped my dad buy his farm in the 30s was Gilroy McKnight, so I only got part of the name, so I don't have to explain uh, my middle name because I don't have one. But uh, Gilroy was Gilroy McKnight, uh, the McKnight family down in Cleveland, and uh, he helped them get started in farming. So, uh, you know, how do people uh, survive? How do they exist? Uh, he came over as a young man. I found the record in, in, in New Orleans and made his way to Cleveland. And I don't uh, know who specifically, but I do remember hearing stories of just uh, sleeping in the back of the store, just not, not even a bed. Uh, and I can't imagine of him coming over with anything more than uh, a sack. We didn't have suitcases in the day, and and uh, you didn't you didn't need a, a billfold because uh, you didn't have any money. <laughs> But uh, he came over and uh, he, he made his way. And uh, so the rest of that story is um, our cousin, uh, as part of the GI Bill, went to school at LSU. And there he met some delegates from China. And uh, they talked about uh, starting trade with China. And with that and the contacts he had made in the community, he um, started an import-export business. And uh, the, the other uh, story about my name is uh, I'm Gilroy Chow, Chow being the uh, Chinese character or, or the Chinese family name, Joe, J-O-E. Um, so he, he got off the boat as, as this young man and said, uh, what is your name? And so he said, what? <laughs> I'm sure he didn't have ESL in China before he came. So, uh, Joe Tong Yim, you know, somebody said, tell him your name. So, uh, somebody anglicized that as Joe T M I M, and And the only M I see now are Koreans, but uh, so export oil to China, oil for the lamps of China. So I guess he was in, com uh, in competition with uh, Rockefeller because that was Exxon. <laughs> but, uh, and you know who won that one? <laughs> but uh, he had the shortest name in the tallest building in the world because uh, he was in the Empire State Building. And so uh, his name on the directory was M, I am. The shortest name in the tallest building in the world at the time. So, uh, you know, what do, did the Chinese from the Mississippi Delta do? They went and opened companies and went to New York. Uh, let's see, uh, I skipped over, I skipped over uh, this book, uh, Making Friends with Billy Wong. Uh, Augusta Gattergood, I don't know if any of you know her, she taught down in Cleveland. She wrote a book about being a Chinese person Growing up, she said it in Arkansas, but it was really Cleveland, Mississippi. And uh, so, again, another book. So, uh, again, when I saw this poster, Jen said, What do you need that poster for? I said, I have to tell. 
If it's Tennessee Williams, I have to tell my Marlon Brando story. <laughs> How many people here have met Marlon Brando? Oh. Uh, I was a ticket agent for American Airlines in 1965, uh, working my way through school. And so I was at Kennedy International, and uh, I was a ramp service agent and a ticket agent. So I was working the gate, and we had three non-stops to LA, flight one, three, and seven. And uh, so this group comes up, and it's Marlon Brando and his friend, Tarita. So uh, you had tickets back handwritten back in the day. No printers, no, uh, they, were, you, they were handwritten and we validated them with a stamp. And if you had a credit card, you, you had to put it in a little machine to uh, move it. And so uh, he had a ticket, but Tarita did not have a ticket. So I got to sell him a ticket. So of course, she didn't speak any English. She just smiled. And she was pretty, she was beautiful. <laughs> and um, so uh, I said, uh, could you spell that for me, please? So he goes, and so this is where you find out that you think he's acting, but he's always in character. T A R. <laughs> And he looks at her and he comes back, I, and then uh, T-A. And he's satisfied with himself. I said, that's $365, please. You think he'd pull out an ATC credit card. He pulls out a wad of money. It looks like he's been at a poker game or something. And he starts counting it out quite dramatically. I should have saved that, that, that money or if he had written a check. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I have met Marlon Brando uh, and others uh, at, working at uh, Kennedy, Space, uh, Kennedy International Airport, Idlewild then, uh, and the Eastside Airline Terminal in New York. But um, that's the Marlon Brando story. Yeah. So again, uh, so Sally has become uh, famous recently for the Vivian Howard uh, dumpling episode. Uh, we had these producers come and visit us and they said, we want somebody to make dumplings. And we talked to um, a friend, uh, uh, one of the grandmothers, and uh, she said, oh yeah, it sounds like, because she, she makes wonderful dumplings and the kids and grandkids love her dumplings. And then came time to do it, she said, I don't think so. So then uh, a friend uh, said, well, she would try. But uh, anyway, uh, we said, we don't do dumplings. We go to the restaurant. Uh, Asian Palace in Memphis makes wonderful dumplings. And you get such a variety. And it's just easy. And uh, we, we do that. And, they, and so we took them to the restaurant and had two tables full of dumplings for them, but they didn't want to do the restaurant, so they came to uh, our house, and, and uh, cousin Carol made uh, her father's, her, no, her mother's dumplings in her father's homemade pan, and that became the dumpling episode with uh, Vivian Howard on PBS. So the thing that spun out of that, I had somebody that I had not seen in 60 years up in New York saying, was that you? <laughs> I don't know how he found me. And then Sally had a classmate of hers, a high school classmate, call her from Florida to say, I loved the dumpling episode. <laughs> and so uh, that has happened. So uh, in more recent days, uh, Andrew Bourdain's uh, crew uh, is doing uh, with uh, Carlton McCoy. Car Carlton McCoy is a master sommelier. There are only 23 master sommeliers in the uh, in the country, um, and uh, he came to Clarksdale and visited with them, and we cooked for them. Uh, CBS is doing an episode on uh, Mississippi Delta Chinese, and then uh, just this week HBO is doing a special 
on uh, multi-ethnic children, so we are uh, looking for and recruiting uh, some children. And they said even elders that are multi-ethnic, uh, they're going to do a special. So we never know what's going to come out of these questions, but uh, they are occurring and, and they do happen. And um, uh, We had somebody from Stanford called and talked and talked and talked and um, they said, we're going to do something else. I don't think we were controversial enough for them. But so, so not every story uh, just happens, but these things happen. So, <clears throat> concluding, family histories and stories. I've related some of our family histories here, but I have many regrets, and I shared some of them with you about not having asked questions when I had the opportunity. So I'm asking you, what's your personal history? What questions do you have that might be answered by somebody that you might know? Family, neighbors, friends, uh, don't wait. Ask. So Tennessee was an enterprising young man and he saw things and visualized things and uh, we're not gonna be as eloquent or speak it as well as he, but uh, certainly we have stories to tell and we can share them. And uh, I've shared a few of them with you today. And so uh, at this point, I would take questions, but ask. <laughs> One from the back. Thank you for that plug. But it's a work in progress. And, and I don't know, but I will inquire because I have a classmate from State in 1958, Edmund Moy, that lives there today. Uh, he he uh, has done a number of things, and I will certainly ask that question because uh, he, uh, and there was another family there, the Lum family was in Benoit, but Edmund had the uh, boat landing, he had a grocery store, and uh, he raised uh, pedigree dogs. But he's there today, and, and he's got to be in his early 80s also. The movie was on 1956. Oh, yeah, I, I, I know the movie well. But, uh, yeah. Sure, that's that, the that, only that, time that, I've seen the Chinese from the Delta in a movie. And, uh, well, there you go. You've answered the question that we started out with. Is Tennessee Williams uh, part of a diverse neighborhood? So there he included it in that movie to be authentic, to have a Chinese family there. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Thank you. You've been uh, wonderful to put up with me and the weather. Thank you so much, Mr. Chow, for sharing these stories. It was just incredible not only to, to, to hear the stories of your family, but also uh, of Clarksdale and the Delta overall. Uh, because of the wind and, and, and for your comfort, at four o'clock, we'll be watching the first part of the porch plays inside. These are the student winners of this morning's competition before you head out into the neighborhood for the in-person performances. Uh, the addresses are in your program, but uh, it'll just take me just a little while to get uh, equipment switched over and we'll go inside just for your comfort so we don't have to fight the wind or the sun. And uh, we'll just keep improvising together. And uh, it's, we're so grateful if we don't get a chance to say thank you, uh, because I'll be working here while you go out to the, the porch place, thank you so much for your generosity, patience, and grace, uh, particularly over the past two years as we've navigated uh, 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 a very difficult time to continue uh, the important legacy of the Mississippi Delta Tennessee Williams Festival. Uh, uh, thank you to the hard work from Penny Mayfield, to Jen Waller, and our sponsors, Mississippi Arts Council, Mississippi Humanities, uh, visit Clarksdale, visit Mississippi, uh, and, and the support and the generosity of, of the people of Tahoma County, Tahoma Community College, uh, and Clarksdale. Thank you so much. We hope to see you in just a few short minutes.
Well, that concludes this year's festival. We know for the past two years things have not felt exactly normal. We know that it's been a difficult time. And we hope that this finds you well and that this time next year we'll be gathering here in person for the 30th annual Mississippi Delta Tennessee Williams Festival. A special thanks to our sponsors of the Mississippi Arts Council, the Mississippi Humanities Council, Visit Mississippi and Visit Clarksdale, and Cahoma Community College. Special thanks to Jen Waller here at the Contrera Mansion, Penny Mayfield, uh, Colby Coleman, and this festival is dedicated to Dr. Ralph Voss. We hope you've enjoyed this programming. We hope that you'll make Clarksdale a part of your plans next October. Thank you to all our presenters, scholars, artists, and especially the students who've sent us their work and allowed us to celebrate their immense talent and the future of the American theater. It's been our pleasure. Until next year, we'll see you soon.